Here is a 10 to 15 minute guide for every single DPS hero in Overwatch. That's right, all 17 of them. This is updated with the recent Cassidy and May changes too, and more, and if you like these guides and decide to get coaching afterwards, join my Discord and shoot me a DM. Without further ado, I hope you enjoy. This is the best way to play Ash in Overwatch 2. Sightlines and angles are key to your character. Most of the time, you'll be taking longer sightlines, but against snipers, that's where you want to stay out of their LOS and look for shorter sightlined angles onto their team. Look to dynamite squishies from off angles and timed for when your team can push, bob enemy backlines, and use your coach gun for mobility. Ash's weapon, the B Tech Peacekeeper, makes Ash fire semi automatic shots, dealing 75 damage per shot with a fall off range starting at 30 meters alongside a 25% movement penalty. Ash can also unscope to fire quick shots, dealing 40 damage, and your first two shots have perfect accuracy. Starting off with Ash's unscoped shots, and there's two main uses. Firstly, use this in close quarter combat to maximize survivability and DPS. Your movement speed isn't reduced, and you don't care about the added spread in close range, and you actually have around 35 more DPS. The only thing to be cautious about is your ammo management, since it depletes very quickly when just spamming shots, hence why you reload when you have downtime and you try to mainly use your unscoped shots in close range. But there's also a secondary use, and that's as a finisher, thanks to the much faster fire rates. As soon as you headshot someone, you can quickly follow up with two unscoped shots. This can be in both close and longer ranges to finish off a low target. I say long range because keep in mind that your first two shots are completely accurate, so you can quickly fire off two shots to finish off a target who's 1 HP from very afar. However, with your unscoped fire, make sure you don't waste your ammo with it. More specifically, don't waste it spamming away at a Winston Bubble, a Rita Fortify, Diva Matrix, Sigma Shield, etc. A key fundamental with Ash is timing your angled pressure on the enemy team for when your team pushes in. For instance, on Junkertown first point attack, you could take the high ground surrounding your team or push left side. Another thing to mention is to maintain longer sightlines to fit the range of your gun, hence why you aren't pushing right sides. The problem is, is that we're putting up pressure in a location, in a proximity, that's not favorable for us against a composition like a Reinhardt Zarya and against a McCree. In addition, this makes no sense when you have a better, safer high ground angle like this that we literally just leveraged and won the fight with the previous fight. And now we're sitting on the floor. This is so much safer and more aggressive up here. Other heroes wish they could wall climb up here and utilize this, and yet you're, you're here. And, you're, and now you're there, and now you're in spawn. However, range has nuance. If you're playing up against a Widowmaker who's greatly favoured at longer ranges, you either want to start playing shorter sightlines to then duel the Widow and to eliminate any fall off, or playing angles to where Widow doesn't have any LOS onto you and has to swing wide and play more aggressive. Here's another example on Dorado first point defence. If Widow plays far back, you can utilise the high ground around you, forcing the Widow to take a duel. Same thing on Dorado seconds. You play a bit back off the high ground, forcing the enemy Widowmaker to grapple up, whilst you can pummel the enemy team from relative safety. However, eventually, you're probably gonna have to take a duel with the Widowmaker at some point, and some of it will come down to mechanics, but there are some advantages you can have to swing the duel in your favour. The biggest thing is to understand corner matchups. In short, the person who is closest to the corner has the advantage of choosing when to duel the enemy, but the person furthest away from the corner has the advantage in the actual duel. Take this example on Havana first point attack, and you as Ash are playing the corner. Look at how many different positions you have to face check into the enemy Widowmaker, and how many different positions the enemy Widow could be playing. But all the enemy Widow has to do is place a crosshair in the exact same corner and wait for you to peek. However, your advantage playing close to the corner is that you could completely ignore the Widowmaker and not attack the duel. You don't have to fight here. Instead, you could flank left or use your team and then flank to the right. The same concept also applies to FPS shooters like Rainbow Six Siege. It's why, as a defender, you don't hold angles right next to windows or doorways, but rather, you play from afar and play the myriad of different angles you could take on that window or doorway. It means that, as an attacker, you have to face all kinds of different angles that the defenders could be playing, whereas the defender just has to place his crosshair in one spot. This isn't to say that playing around corners aren't important, in fact, they very much are. But in one-shot sniper duels, playing right next to a corner and not repositioning as I'll just get onto can lead to easy crosshair placement for the enemy sniper. Now onto the repositional advantage, just meaning that you reposition against the enemy sniper, ideally timed for when your tanks are baiting attention. Take this example in Junkertown first. The Widowmaker gets jumped by a Wrecking Ball, or the Widow is distracted main. You can utilise this to flank around and land some damage onto the Widowmaker while she's occupied. 
There's also other advantages like Pika's advantage, Infosight advantage, Pocket advantage, and a myriad of others. Not to mention, if you play a lot of snipers, struggle to win your duels, and would like yours truly to help coach you, feel free to join my Discord down below and to check my rates. Moving on to some mechanical play, here's Spala going over some fundamental crosshair placements, which can be carried over to other snipers. You're putting the crosshair off of where you need it to be. I'm not sure why. Like I can understand that the height, maybe, because you're still going to headshot her from this height. Why is it off to the side? Why is it not directly on the corner? I mean, you just, you just, your crosshair placement, it wasn't even a flick there. You just put your crosshair off of the position where it needed to be. You had all the time in the world to line up your shot and you still miss. Lastly, as Ash reloads bullet by bullet instead of via a magazine, make sure that in between fights you constantly reload in order to have as much ammo possible during the team fights. Ash's first ability, Pyrocynical Stolen Dynamite. And then. Oh fuck! Oh fuck! Okay! Makes Ash throw some explosive dynamite, dealing up to 50 damage on explosion with a 5 meter radius, with 100 burn damage over 5 seconds, alongside a 12 second cooldown. The fundamental use behind Ash's dynamite is to both set it in a position where it hits as many enemies as possible, and to time it for when your frontline can make use of it, as Barlow explains here. So the positioning of the dynamite is poor. It's directly in front of the Rhine shield when you're about to reposition yourself to where you can land a bigger, fatter dynamite in the back one. Just dynamite as many people as you can, or dynamite somebody in a good position. That's it. If the Ryans are swinging and you land a big dynamite, a little bit more valuable, right? So you kind of have to find a balance of I'm going to spam dynamite off of cooldown versus I'm going to use dynamites in the best opportunity. And right now, you could probably wait like literally two seconds and get a better dynamite because you'd be in a better position and you do it at a time where the Ryans are actually swinging on each other. Can you imagine if he had dynamite here? You might lose this fight because this McCree or Ana don't die and you look back and go, oh, that was unlucky. You know, my team just died really fast. No, if you'd had dynamite here, this McCree or Ana dies instantly. And so you get two kills where you would have only gotten one. Spilo briefly mentioned dynamiting someone in a good position, which linking back to the idea of forcing an advantageous duel can be used to give you an edge. For example, on Nabani first point defense, you can detonate your dynamite from high ground to the corner without having to peek, which is the important part, landing in some early damage to allow you to go past your one shot brick points. Dynamite should also be used 10 to 12 seconds before the team fight begins to gain some early ult charge. Make sure that it is 10 to 12 seconds since you want dynamite for when the fight actually begins. Again, please avoid lazy dynamites. I know people like Iostocks encourage to use dynamite off cooldown as much as possible, but you need to find that balance as Spilo said. It's not an Arisa Javelin on a 6 second cooldown. Lazy. There is nothing wrong with doing nothing with the cooldown. If you think that the pressure from it is not going to be because this isn't like this isn't like a Rissa Javelin on a six second cooldown, you know, where okay, sometimes you're gonna get a punish for spamming it, but mostly it's gonna be available pretty soon. This is a twelve second cooldown. Let me tell you right now, who should you be dynamiting? Right now. The Reaper. Maybe, maybe you just shoot maybe the, reaper. the Reaper. Maybe you just maybe shoot the reaper, reaper, right? Okay, but let's let's keep watching. Who could you be dynamiting right now? Their backline or yeah. the Reaper. You could be peeking or, or right or the Reaper. Or, you know, maybe okay, the wood is a problem. Okay, just throw the dynamite right here, hit the Reaper. That would be really, really annoying. Ash's second ability, the B set grappling hook, makes Ash blast enemies in front of her, shooting 15 pellets, dealing up to 90 damage, propelling herself up to 9.4 meters away with a 10 second cooldown. The fundamental use to Ash's coach gun is for mobility. For instance, on King's second point attack, you could coach gun up to the high ground to give you another angle of damage to put more pressure on the enemy team. There's also using it to escape a dive obviously. You can very quickly create some distance between you and a Genji who has just dashed onto you, or also maybe landing some damage. Speaking of damage, that's the secondary use of your coach gun. Not only do the pellets deal damage themselves, but they can also detonate your dynamite quite consistently as soon as you throw it. Of course, you might cause some self damage, but you take half the dynamite damage the enemy flanker takes, and if you have a mercy pocket or a brick repair pack, this downside is mitigated. Ash's ultimate, the butler bot, makes Ash summon her Omnic sidekick with 1000 HP, charging at his enemies dealing 120 damage on impact and dealing 112 DPS afterwards. As soon as Bob starts shooting, his duration is 10 seconds. Bob is one of the simplest ultimates to use, as you almost always want to put Bob on a greedy off angle, ideally on the enemy backline, as the legendary buff heart attack explains here. Essentially, you should be trying to shoot the enemy team from as many different angles as possible to deny them cover. We're being shot at from here! We're being shot at from here! We're being shot at from here! If you're the enemy team, where do you hide? How do you deal with that? To get that sort of chaos installed into the enemy team, you should almost always, without exception, place Bob on a flank, or even better, on the back line. 
Where are they gonna hide from your team, your gun, and Bob at the same time? <laughs> Nowhere. A visual example of this would be on Numbani's second point attack, where you send Bob into the back line, where he has a nice juicy off angle onto the enemy back line. One additional thing to mention is to time your Bob for when either team engages, so that your Bob doesn't get destroyed before the team fight begins. This also using Bob to stall objectives. Considering Overwatch is 5v5 and not 6v6, this can be really useful to prevent C9s or to buy time for you and your team to take angles and make plays. Now moving on to the positioning, playstyle and compositional part of this guide. In terms of general positioning, there are four key principles which I'll showcase on Oasis City Center. The first is to have cover, really important to stop taking damage at any moment. The second is to have line of sight, important to deal damage on the enemy team whilst also having your team to help. The third is to have good distance from angles, so that the enemy flankers don't sneak up on you. And the fourth, and arguably most important guideline, is to have aggressive and defensive rotational options. This is where you're going to get your angles and ash to land those juicy dynamites. You can either rotate left side, coach gun straight onto the left or front high ground, or rotate all the way right sides. Now finishing off with ash playing up against sprawly, pokey or divey compositions. Essentially, against comps that have high sustain, range, or mobility, or somewhere in between. Against your typical poke ball stuff, so your Reinhardt, Remarcher, Arisa, those kind of things, you often need to be playing range, angles, and fishing for those juicy dynamites on the enemy backline. For instance, on Legion Control Center, you should split coast side in order to gain an aggressive, long ranged angle that the enemy team can't contest, or you can play a bit closer on point, coach gunning onto the high ground if you get pressured. In full on poke compositions, like the double sniper Sigma ones that you often see on Havana, Sucker Royale and Joker Town, the concept of taking advantageous duels and utilising shorter sightlines are really going to matter. Try and get a mercy pocket if you can, so you're able to one-tap Widow. Against Dive, the key thing is to find the balance between splitting off and taking angles whilst also not stacking on your team. For example, here on Ilios Ruins, this position coast side completely isolates you from your team, making you an easy dive target. Whereas this position here means you're stacking directly on your backline, meaning it's very easy for the enemy dive team to surround you. Instead, think of it like a Goldilocks happy medium between the two. These two positions here ensure that you're able to dish out pressure on the enemy dive crew, whilst also ensuring that you're within range to get support from your team. When aggressing in dive, you'd be doing the exact same kind of stuff you'd normally do. When your tank aggresses, you have to be aggressing. You could even coach gun aggressively as Io Stock springs up here. It can also be used aggressively to chase opponents when your team has tempo. If you have a significant numbers advantage and you see your tank dive in to finish the job, you can do a 180 and use your coach gun to chase after opponents and start a snowball. Well that's it for the Ash Guide. Uh, guys we gotta come up with another plan. They got a tank. This is the best way to play Bastion in Overwatch 2. Bastion has two main playstyles, a Brawl Buster or Flanker. Both playstyles are centered around the cycles of your turret form. The Brawl Buster focuses on burning down the enemy tank, utilizing the sustain from your ironclad and armor in turret form, and the Flanker playstyle looks to find short to medium range angles to blitz down enemy squishies, timed for when your team engages. Use your sticky grenade for lethality or mobility, use your ultimate to secure kills or to zone space, and be aggressive with your turret form. Bastion's primary, the worst set scan primary, makes Bastion fire a submachine gun dealing 25 damage per shot at 300 rounds per minute with 25 shots in one clip. All your shots are pinpoint accurate. For reference, Bastion's DPS and recon mode is 125, whereas Soldier's is 162. Thankfully, there's quite a strict dichotomy with your recon mode and turret mode in terms of your aggression. Typically, the sightlines you want to play with your recon mode are medium to longish, and you'll be playing quite passive most of the time unless you're moving to a shorter sightlined, more aggressive position with the turret modes. For example, on the Paul Sanctum, you might be chilling down main in your recon mode, but as soon as you and your team start to push in, that's your opening to look for an angle on the enemy backline with your turret modes. Speaking of your turret modes, Bastion's first ability, the Bronze Player Nightmare, makes Bastion transform into a mobile powerhouse firing a Gatling gun at 1800 RPM with a total DPS of 360 paired with infinite ammo. This mode has a 6 second duration and is on a 12 second cooldown. Your movement speed is also decreased by 35%. 
Starting off with a bit of tech. While slightly niche, you can use your sticky nade in combination with your turret mode to access high ground and quickly pop out to different angles with your Gatling gun, as Tusco explains here. Simply shoot your sticky onto the ground as normal, then immediately initiate your transformation just before jumping off the bomb as it explodes. This is the optimal way to execute the combo as you're overlapping the downtime of your transformation and waiting for the sticky to explode. And you're also giving yourself a huge burst of movement speed while transformed, which the enemies just won't expect. Building on this a bit more, this is most useful when you want to try and get to high ground whilst also being in your tart mode. All push maps actually have pretty decent use cases where this could be useful, which isn't too surprising actually, considering that defenders have more high ground the further the attackers push. It's important to make sure that you do these kind of plays with caution. Don't do this if your team are busy doing nothing, since you won't have turret form available for when you actually need it during the teamfights. It's also vital to utilize cover and corners when you're in either mode to hide your gigantic hitbox. Don't swing wide unless you need to. Please use cover. I see so many Bastions that are like, I'm turret form and invincible and they roll out in the middle of nowhere. But remember, obviously, like you're a very fat and squishy target. So even with your tank passive, you really need to respect cover. Moving on to the broader concepts, the most important thing you have to keep in mind with the turret form is the time at which you use it. Your DPS is by far the highest in the game when in turret form. 360 DPS is more than double the DPS of most hitscan heroes, and you can outdamage Transcendence with it. As with every other hero in the game, you need to time your turret mode with when either team engages. Tusco has some pretty good gameplay examples in the background, so I'll play a clip of him briefly explaining this. Timing the activation of Assault Form is key. If you activate it too early, the enemies are just going to wait you out and leave you powerless during the team fight. But if you activate it too late, the enemies are already going to be on top of you and you're going to get shut down. The key is to use Assault Form right when you see the enemies have left cover and are too far out to make it back to safety before you can melt them down. Now, timing can be more complex than that, but I'll refer back to the timing concept at the playstyle section of the video when it comes to your flanking playstyle. A mistake that I see less experienced Sebastian players make is that they often overstay their welcome when taking a greedy angle. Yes, you do have mobility now compared to what you had in Overwatch 1, but be wary that as soon as you start shooting the enemy team, they're gonna be shooting you. And you don't have any self field that you had in Overwatch 1. The higher the rank you are, the smaller and more precise your flank windows become as it takes less time for the enemy team to respond. If you end up overextending with the turret form, or you just use it at the wrong time, don't be afraid to cancel and exit back to your recon mode. Building on this further, your target priority during this window of burst impact comes down to two main things. To prioritize the most dangerous targets, and to prioritize who's the easiest to kill, as Spilo indirectly goes over here. Target priority is very important too. So when you're in turret form right now, who should this Bastion be shooting? We talked about you chunking Orisa, right? Well, what's the problem with that right now? Is she fortifying? Yep. So there's really no pressure that you can, not enough pressure you can get here for sure. But yeah, absolutely, Soldier Ash. Because remember, they're out in the open and then they're not utilizing cover. You can murder them right here. Bang. You do try to get them, but it's too late. In that case, the Orisa was not the correct target because she wasn't easy to kill. And that's due to her Fortify. If she had rather overstayed our welcome and had used both her Spear Spin and Fortify, then she'd likely become the target. Bastion's second ability, Cassidy's Flashbang without lock-on, <laughs> makes Bastion fire a bouncy, sticky grenade that deals 115 damage in total with an 8 second cooldown. In principle, your grenade is actually quite easy to use, either for mobility or for lethality. I've already mentioned sticky jumping by proxy with this hurt form, but here's Tusco explaining exactly how to do a sticky jump perfectly. Aim it a little bit in front of you, walk forward onto it, and then jump at the same time the bomb explodes. A common mistake that a lot of people are making is jumping way too early and letting the bomb hit the midair. This ledge in the training range is about the highest you can get consistently with a sticky jump. So look for these spots in game to get a massive positioning advantage. Now onto lethality. Landing your grenade can be a great source of burst damage to enter a duel with. You fire a nade, enter turret form, and by the time your cast animation is done, they're already half HP and get shredded immediately. Your burst damage from Bastion, aside from one shots, is basically unparalleled. If you struggle hitting the nade directly in a duel, firing it at the floor for splash damage isn't a bad idea. In fact, I urge you to fire the nade at the feet, since if you hit the nade, you get the full damage, but if you miss, you get a bit of splash damage. The best of both worlds. Bastion's ultimate, they got a tank makes Bastion become an artillery tank, firing 3 artillery shots that take 1.33 seconds each to land, with fall of damage scaling from the epicenter of every shot. Your ultima is actually quite simple to use. Either use it to secure kill early on or in the mid fight, or use it to zone space. Let's talk about the former of the two options. 
To get kill pressure out of your ultimates, you need to be focusing on using all three bombs on a single or grouped up set of a mobile targets, like a Zen, Ana, or Woodenmaker when she's scoped in. And there's no point bombing a Genji or a Tracer who can dash or blink out. And you can either do this pre-fight or in the mid-fight. I recommend doing this in the mid-fight against better enemies because it's a lot more hectic and there's stuff going on, and you can also utilise the downtime after you use your turret modes. But, if you can consistently secure a pick before the teamfight begins, then I see no reason to not use it otherwise. Now with zoning space. You'll likely do this against more mobile compositions, because it's harder to exert kill pressure on them. Now, what space do you zone? Well, that's pretty easy. Typically, you want to be zoning off angles or high grounds that the enemy teams are controlling. For example, on Basan Downtown, if there's a Woodermaker holding high ground from 50 miles away, you can completely cover the high ground with artillery. But the real important thing is the timing of your artillery. Imagine if you bombed the high ground while your Woodermaker grappled up, and then killed the enemy Woodermaker while she was distracted by your artillery. That is how you properly use it to zone space. Your team has to play aggressively off your artillery. Same thing here on King's Row. You fire one or two shots on each high ground, then your team push in aggressively and take that high ground for free. If timed correctly, your ultimate can do wonders. Now onto the positional, playstyle, and compositional part of the guides. There's four key positional guidelines that I'll quickly cover with Havana seconds. Firstly, have cover. Simple enough. Secondly, have LOS or line of sight onto the enemy team. Again, quite simple. Thirdly, have good distance from angles so that the enemy flanker doesn't sneak up on you. And finally, have rotational options, both aggressive and defensive, to push up in your turret form as talked about before. Moving on to the two predominant playstyles that Bastion has, which is either to be a brawl buster or a flanker, as Spalo explains here. Ball buster, where you have the very traditional, I'm playing with a shield, I just clunk into turret form and just mow them down, or flanker, where you go funny, funny angles, funny flanks, and time it really, really, really well. Thing, the thing with Bastion is two things. You need to be unpredictable, because shields just aren't long, don't live long enough for you to be able to just kind of turn your brain off and just mow them down, and your timing needs to be immaculate. Because you're talking about a hero that has an immense spike in value when they don't know you're there, but as soon as you know they know where you are or they've, they've spotted you, your value just goes down to the pooper. I quickly want to elaborate more on how important timing is for your flanks. You see, timing isn't just timing your engages with your tanks. It's actually a bit deeper than that. Here's my thing, is the timing needs to be with your tanks, but I would say half a second after your tanks. If I'm playing Tracer and Dive and I'm trying to one clip that Zen, I'm gonna go in right as my Winston's landing, half a second, and then now I'm going, because now that Zenyatta is fully focused on annihilating and beating up that Winston. He's not thinking about anything else. What's a good analogy here? Okay, you're a pickpocket, right? Can you imagine how effective a pickpocket would be at like a fireworks show? There's a big firework, boom, right? And that's when you reach in. They're not thinking at all what's going on behind them. If you wait just a little after the big ugly tanks do something really visually or threatening or baiting, and then you go in, you're gonna get, find way more hacks, way more picks, way more pressure. So in attempt to distill this down to three guidelines, this timing nuance is dependent upon, firstly, how greedy your angle is. Essentially, if you're on a deeper, more dangerous flank, timing your engages half a second later become even more important. The second factor is how greedy or dangerous your own hero is. A Winston, for example, doesn't deal as much damage as a Tracer or Bastion can do, so it's kind of pointless for Winston players to abide by this rule. And lastly, the third factor is their squishiness. Again, Winston isn't a very squishy hero compared to Tracer or Bastion, meaning this timing rule matters even more. Now I'll be applying the Brawl Buster and Flanker playstyles to each of the three comps, being Poke Brawl, Poke, and Dive comps. In Poke Brawl, meaning against Reinhardt, Ramatra, Orisa, Zarya, Junker Queen, most of the tanks in Overwatch 2, with regards to your Brawl Buster playstyle, you'll likely be positioned on small off angles with short to medium sightlines where the enemy team can't easily rush you down. For example, on the Paul Shrine, you can play either side of the central pillar, zoning anyone down main or by elephant, and then you might look to rotate to elephant, referring back to that rotational rule mentioned earlier. In Pug Brawl, with the flanking playstyle, there's honestly not too much specific to say to your hero here. Time your flanks well, keep the same distance sightlines, and sync your aggression with your team. In Poke, with the Brawl Buster playstyle, you kind of need to be playing full rush if you want to run down the enemy team. Like on Socket Royale, you need to clear and control the high ground the best you can, pushing off the enemy snipers and limiting their sightlines. But you can 
can only really do that with a Lucio and a Reinhardt or a different Brawly tank. In Poke with a flanker player style, this is probably what you have to do if you're keen on playing Bastion on long range maps and you can't just rush down the enemy tank. Looking for cheeky nade jumps on poke heavy maps like Junkertown to quickly flank and assassinate the enemy team is probably your best bet. In Dive with a flanker play style, you probably want to be playing slightly split but not completely isolated, hence hard flanking shouldn't really work. I'll couple in the Brawlbuster playstyle here, since you can't and shouldn't be hard flanking against Dive, period. I gave a positional example in my Ash Guide on Ilios Ruins about how you don't want to position directly on top of your backline, but you also don't want to position in Narnia. You want to find a happy medium between the two, and the same also applies to you as Bastion. Well that's it for the guides. This is the best way to play Cassidy in Overwatch 2. Cassidy is great at holding medium range sightlines with his Peacekeeper, using his flashbang to threaten flankers like Genji or Tracer from getting on top of him, as well as having a role he can use defensively. Against highly static comps with a ton of poke damage, don't be afraid to hard flank, but you should always be looking for soft flanks and angles you can take throughout the fight to surprise the enemy team. The worst thing you can do is sit main with your Peacekeeper. Cassidy's weapon, the 6 shooter, makes Cassidy shoot bullets, dealing 70 damage every half a second with fall off starting at 25 meters. You can also fan the hammer to unload the remaining bullets in your clip very quickly, but these bullets only deal 50 damage. I'll quickly cover fan the hammer before going on to your main firing mode. Fan the hammer is pretty much useless now in Overwatch 2, since you often used it to finish off a target in close range after you flashbang them. But now, since your flashbang is, well, no longer a flashbang, you'll only be fanning the hammer in niche situations when an immobile target is right up close to you. Like, maybe a Winston after he uses jump and is chasing you for example. That's it. Moving on to your primary fire, the biggest thing to keep note of is the sight lines you choose to play. As of recording, Cassidy recently received a, on paper, slight range buff, which in game actually translates to a 20% or more time to kill decrease. A very common thing I see lower level Cassidy players do is that once they have a nice sight line or angle, they will walk forward to whatever they're shooting instead of using the cover they once had and jiggle peek from it. You're dealing the same damage whilst being much safer. Now as Cassidy, you will outrange most heroes and compositions, so the most important thing to do is to maximize your range and safety, even at the expense of a little bit of fall off. If you're going to take this angle here, why are you pressing W? Why did you go from nice corner, nice angle here to I'm on top of point? Maintain the sight line and that's all you need to do. You outrange this comp heavily outside of Zenyatta and random Faro rockets. There is no reason for you to go, I'm going to close the distance against these guys whatsoever especially with the diva on the field you're, you're playing your mccree like you're trying to get it up in the face of your enemies at least that's how it looked like on the far and that's how it looked like in the diva you do not need to do that you can do that against widowmaker comms hanzo comms now likewise the heroes like ash there are times where you need to be playing a shorter range and no surprise that's up against sniper comps a visual example of this would be on junkertown first point attack where you can play shorter sight lines in the room with the mega while still having an off angle to split focus you may even want to two tap the widowmaker while she's scoped in on Soccer Royale, this could also be taking an angle underneath the high ground, or rotating to it and directly contesting the high ground. Also, as obvious as it is, it is really important that you time all the angles you take with when your core pushes. I'll mention more about angles and flanking on Cassidy in the last section of the guides. Cassidy's first ability, the Rick Roll, makes Cassidy perform a combat role in the direction you're walking in with a 6 second cooldown and a 50% damage reduction whilst rolling. The main usage of roll is for defensive purposes, to maintain an angle and to defend yourself from any threats, as Spalo explains here. Hi guys. I'm going to make your midget guide. Really, roll and flash are both used when your off angle is being contested. In other words, you can you can either utilize roll flash aggressively on your off angle, but most of the time you want to find a good off angle that makes you really, really dangerous, that makes people want to come after you, and then you can use roll and flash to defend yourself. That's the goal. That's the goal. Very rarely will you aggressively be looking for roll and flash opportunities. Oftentimes you'll just take a position that makes the enemy team do something to stop you and that's where roll and flash are really useful. Now of course there will be times when you aggressively roll to an angle to save time when you try and get to an angle. Maybe you're doing a late or a long flank and you need to hustle and move so you get to that flank in time. 
This also using roll to peek a corner fast and to throw off the enemy. I go over open space and corner theory in my ash guide so I don't want to repeat it here but in short, the person playing the corner has the advantage in choosing when the duel occurs and the person in open space or playing away from the corner has the advantage in the actual duel. This is because the person in open space only has to put their crosshair on the corner whereas the person on the corner doesn't have that luxury. However, if you're the person on the corner, you can use your roll aggressively to throw off the crosshair placement of the enemy whilst also utilising that 50% damage reduction. Speaking of that damage reduction, whilst niche, it can actually be quite helpful. Take this example here whilst I'm dueling the enemy Cassidy. Even though I roll aggressively whilst I'm low HP, I know that if he shoots me, the bullet will deal half damage whilst I finish him off with my full damage bullets. Unfortunately for him, he rolls a bit too far so he doesn't get the shot off anyways, but the point still stands. It's also using roll to mitigate against ultimates like Pulse Bomb. You get stuck, no worries, just roll and you'll survive. Make sure to not roll into your team though. Cassidy's second ability, a homing missile, makes Cassidy throw a magnetic grenade that deals 10 stick damage and 70 explosion damage. When the nade sticks onto a target, it disables all moving abilities for just over 1.2 seconds and it slows their movement by 30%. Despite the rework, the ability has two major uses. Defensive and aggressive. Defensive uses involve using the ability reactively if someone takes you off angle. A nade plus two shots will kill any squishy hero in the game. But I see this here and I'm a crappy Cassidy, but what should you do literally right now, immediately? Probably go for it and stick Bam. you. Roll sticky, right now. She needs to have her head needs to be, like this is so stupid of her. She's playing literally at this range with no charge with you with roll and sticky. Holy crap, mate. Get in there. Just like that clip, there will be times where you'll see someone take an off angle by themselves and you can just completely deny that. If, on Route 66 for example, a soldier decides to take the lorry, you can completely deny that with one or two body shots, coupled with your mag grenade that does the rest of the work for you. That soldier either needs his other support or has to play a lot more carefully just because of your nades. Cassidy's ultimate, buggy as hell, makes Cassidy charge up a shot for every enemy in his LOS. The damage scales exponentially and are broken into two zones of 130 and 260 DPS gained for when the high noon is locked onto a target. You also gain a 40% damage reduction whilst high nooning. Starting off with a bit of micro and after doing a bit of math, Cassidy will be able to one shot a 200 HP squishy after 1.54 seconds of holding your high noon up. This is actually a slight nerf of 0.1 seconds since my previous Cassidy guide from two years ago. Thankfully, to make things simple, there's three main uses of High Noon, all of which are relatively easy to remember. The first and safest use of High Noon is the zone space. I've already talked about using some other ultimates like Bap's Window or Bastion's Artillery to zone space so your team can push up and you can do the exact same thing on Cassidy. Here's Nata giving a great example of that that still applies today, way back in 6v6. But if Oni got High Noons, that forces enemy team to back up. That forces these guys to like, you know, back up. It forces these guys to sort of like back up in an essence, right? So there's less pressure on dance, which then means, guess what? Hey, there's less pressure on dance. Okay, cool. As you know, Diva, Lucio, Bap, even May to some extent, you don't need to be stacked on the Ryan right now. You can do something else. And what's it something you can do? You know that the enemy team is abusing these high grounds, right? Like this high ground over here, this high ground over here. You can send a little kill squad to go push that. You'll see the Diva, you'll see the Lucio, and the BAP all together as a little high ground little kill squad. They're, they're ready to fight, right? And they'll push that high ground and they'll catch Valentine there who's trying to go for an off angle. You can use ultimates like McCree ult or even square to force pressure off your Reinhardt and then have your little kill squad go pressure people on the sides. Here's another great example on Hollywood Seconds. There's a ton of high ground that you can zone and any teammates you have with vertical mobility, like a Genji for example, can take that high ground. Not to mention, if a Watermaker decides to dome you with a fully charged headshot from afar, you'll still be alive thanks to the 40% damage reduction. The second use of High Noon is to use it late and on a flank during the mid fight, similar to something like the Reaper's Death Blossom. This is because the enemy team will have already used a bunch of cooldowns that lowers the lethality of your High Noon or straight up stun it, like Diva Matrix, Zaya Bubble, Ana Sleep, and others, hence your High Noon is more likely to land kills. You also do it on a flank since your team will be baiting attention on the front line to allow you to get away with these aggressive flanks. 
A visual example of this could be on Dorado's second point attack, where your team clears and takes high ground, but you split to the opposite side and catch the enemy team when they retreat. Another use of high noon linked to this is to proactively high noon early. This would be a hyper aggressive play to catch the enemy team off guard, but your team needs to match this aggression as Sparlo explains here. It should be this, speedily punches from hotel, Reiner can pin or aggressively take space on main, ultraviolet can, can window back, and OG and false need to be on statue, peeling this off right here, helping this guy. This is a train wreck. Look at Reiner, he's just shielding. They're shielding AFK back here. And Wub is just going in. This is a serious disconnect. This kind of play is obviously hyper aggressive and could be considered a feed, but it would work if it got proper support. It's not getting proper support right now. So, especially in team environments, if you're ever planning to do this, it needs to be said beforehand. And the last use of high noon is to counter or neutralize aggression from the enemy team. Most commonly, that will be a Surgeon Overclock, a Genji Blade, a Sigma Flux, etc. Moving on to the positioning, playstyle, and composition section of the guides. If you're a regular viewer of mine, you'll know about the four key positional guidelines that I keep hammering on about. So let's be quick, and I'll use this example on Junkertown first point defense. Firstly, have cover or a corner to prolong your pressure, as Balo explains here. It's general survivability. Now, if we chain yeah. off of that, you being able to survive and being able to survive longer because you have cover, what does that mean for the enemy team? How long are you able to hold an angle when you have cover? Longer, like can, exactly. Yeah. And that's important because especially in higher ranks, when people are actually paying attention to what's going on around them, there's a psychological pressure. There's distraction of, oh, somebody is on an angle, somebody's on a flank. So like I can, if you can maintain pressure there longer because you're using cover and jiggle peeking, it's like a Widowmaker. You know there's a Widowmaker in your backline or a hog in your backline and, and it's, 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 torture <laughs> like if they if they, if you can't see them and they're just jiggle peeking and then they grab a health pack and you're like ah it's really unsettling secondly have line of sight onto the enemy team obviously you want to see the enemies so you can shoot them thirdly have good distance from angles so that the enemy ball or tracer or any flanker for that matter doesn't sneak up on you and lastly have rotation options both aggressive and defensive this can provide you with another angle for when your team engages and you can push up or a route of retreat if you've lost the fight. Thankfully, on this example, there's a soft flank or an off angle up to the high ground that you can take, or a hard flank all the way around the left sides. Now here's where it gets a bit complicated. Which rotation or option do you take? Do you take the off angle or do you take the full flank? Well, before I answer that question, we need to cover the basics. No matter whether you go for the biggest non your flank in existence, or you take a small off angle, it needs to be synchronized with your team, as I give an example of here, where my Cassidy and Reinhardt are desynced. You see here, soon as Ocean's flank gets bubbled, where's the angle? McCree should be here. Where, where's McCree? Completely desynced. Completely desynced. And if McCree was here, look how much attention the Reinhardt is baiting. All six players are looking at the Reinhardt right now. If Reinhardt goes in, cross strikes. Again, where's the angle? Now, now Ocean stand backs out, and now Korea may push in. Desynced. And now, um, May and Creed disengage, and now Reinhardt goes in. Now talking about hard flanking. Hard flanking is best against poke brawl comps, or in other words, compositions that lack both mobility and range. Think against the Reinhardt comps as a good example, and Ramatra and Arisa will also fall under that category to a lesser extent. The reason why it's important to clarify this in the brawl mirror, one of the limitations of brawl is if it's very slow. Even with Lucio, if I see McCree like up here, like who on Brawl can really stop that? Bat can shoot it a little bit. Their McCree can shoot a little bit, but nobody can like reach it and stop it or deny the angle. There's no ball, there's no tracer, there's no diva, there's no monkey. There's not even a sniper that can deny that long angle. So for you, I'm not necessarily recommending that you do that, but I am giving you that option that it does work. But the thing is, is you have to time them very well. Your team has to be in a position to push because even if you don't kill anybody, you want to get value out of the attention that you buy. And if you do it by yourself, you're just gonna get you're just gonna feed or you're gonna eat a ton of damage and then you're gonna have to run back to your team and you'll have accomplished nothing it's a legitimate play style it's a little meany and there's ways of countering it but you're not gonna find teams that are gonna be consistent at countering this until you get to overwatch league and even then not even really against comps that do have some vertical mobility but not too much you can still hard flank but just do it later into the team fight where there's more distractions and more cooldowns are being used now what about dive well, I don't recommend you hard flank since if you're isolated, you're gonna get split and dove. Instead, find a good balance between stacking on your backline and completely isolating yourself, or in other words, utilize off angles. You don't want to position on top of the team because it allows the enemy team to be able to dive you without taking damage because there's only one LOS where you're actually putting damage. Like we could draw a straight line 
of where this damage is coming from, and it's here. They can hide from this damage in here. They can hide from the damage here. They can hide from the damage here. They can hide from the damage here. Whereas if you position just slightly here, not too much, where you can still be harmony orb, armor pack, you can poke this pre-jump, this pre-jump, this pre-jump, this no longer has cover, this no longer has cover, this has significantly less cover, this has significantly less cover, and you can even peek down this hallway a little bit easier. Dive wants to corral you. Stacking against dive is not the answer. It is being in positions where you can peel for each other, but you can poke out dive before the fight happens. So you don't want to be isolated, but you don't want to be stacked. Other things to mention is that you and your backline should rotate when your dive crew engages. Since you don't have a shield and dive, you should rotate once your Winston, Doomfist or Wrecking Ball dive in, as they'll be basing attention on the front line to allow you to rotate. A visual example of this could be on Route CT6, where your dive tank dives the gas station, and whilst that happens, you peak the angle on the high ground. This way, you have good positioning, and good timing with your team. If you're playing a bit closer, you could even stand on carts, and then get onto the gas station, and then peak whilst your tank engages. Now lastly, onto poke. The most important aspect here is not only to play shorter sightlines, but to also ensure you have an angle as well. A visual example of this would be on Blizzard World First, where even though you have a short sightline, you don't have an angle. In this case, you should soft flank right side to where you have both a short sightline alongside an off angle. A Brigitte can also come with you in order to increase the duration and lethality of your off angle. Hard flanking is also more viable here due to the lack of mobility, but some poke teams will like running Tracer for this very reason. It's why, back in Overwatch 1, some if not most double shield teams ran Tracer, so do be a bit cautious. Well that's it for the guides. This is the best way to play Echo in Overwatch 2. Echo is one of the most versatile heroes in the game in terms of playstyle, because she's one of the few heroes in the game who have both range and mobility. Your 5 main playstyles are to duel, flank, dive, poke or peel, some of which can overlap. When dueling and flanking, you'll look to utilise your burst damage and mobility to get on top of a mobile, squishy heroes. When diving, you'll also be doing that, but more synchronised with your team. You poke when you can outrange the enemy team, and you can also peel against something like a ball slam with your stickies and beam. Echo's weapon, Genji Shoken's Barbetta, makes Echo fire 3 bursts of energy in a triangular pattern, with each shot dealing 17 damage with 12 ammo in one clip. Conceptually, this is the most simple part of Echo's kit, and because there's no fall off, your try shot allows you to lead into the poking playstyle, which I'll explain more in the playstyle section. The only thing worth noting is to be comfortable landing shots against aerial squishies or just squishy targets in general in order to then lean into the dueling playstyle. You should have no problem landing shots against someone like a Farah, and note that Echo is probably the best projectile counter for Farah. Before I continue, if you want to get personalised one-on-one -on -one coaching, check the link in my Discord down below. Echo's first ability, the Explodies, makes Echo fire a volley of 6 sticky bombs, dealing up to 180 damage in total with a 1 second cast time. They're also on a 6 second cooldown. Likewise to your try shot, this will mainly be used for spam before the team fight actually occurs in order to gain early ult charge. Toss these down chokes towards grouped up targets and congested areas to farm some easy ult charge. Bit obvious, but do make sure to guard your stickies, especially from range. Now in the actual fights, stickies can and should be used in response to your or the enemy team's aggression. For instance, using stickies once your ball slams, monkey jumps, doom seismics are all great times to use stickies for that extra burst of damage that can help confirm a kill. You can and also should come from unorthodox angles to time your aggressive pressure with your stickies. In other words, you can do a funny aerial assassination and blow up a target from seemingly nowhere. Flatter uses flight to position himself high above the bridge, breaking LOS with the enemy Ash to avoid her knowing of his position. He scouts Glissa's position and sees London trying to engage, dropping as close as possible to make his stickies easier to connect, following up with a deadly focusing beam. The three things Fletter did effectively were identifying and scouting his threat, breaking LOS with his target, and executing the combo. Echo's second ability, a tank's worst nightmare, makes Echo channel a 16 meter beam that deals 50 DPS to enemies above half HP and close to 200 DPS to those below half HP. The beam has a 2 second duration, a cooldown of 8 seconds, and can be cancelled. 
Your beam is just really rudimentary in terms of usage, in that if you see a target who's half HP or lower, that's just when you use it. But there's some little optimizations that you can do. For instance, when a target is roughly 60 or 70% of their HP, you can try shots, then immediately focus beam. By the time the shots land, the 50% threshold should already be reached, but of course, this relies on you hitting your shots. It's also cancelling the beam. Cancel it after you confirm a kill, or if you just mess up your thresholds. Nothing much more to it. Echo third ability, Microsoft Flight Simulator, makes Echo fly in the air at 8 meters per second with a 3 second duration paired with a 6 second cooldown. She can also glide afterwards or from high ground at a downward speed of 4 meters per second with an increased horizontal speed of 50%. Obviously, you want to use flight to gain another angle, but maintaining and deepening that angle afterwards is an often overlooked aspect. By using flight where there is no available high ground to return to will only make you slowly fall to the low ground with fewer options and angles to take. However, by ending flight on high ground, you can end up flying even higher with no more options to play passive or aggressive. In short, treat high ground like your helipads. Here and here are places that you can end. Where you have escape paths, you have cover that you can duck behind and use, etc. The next boosters you use, you get to start from higher, so you get to stay in the air for longer and you just sort of hold space and make sure you drift down over here when those run out, etc. So that's why I wanted you to, when I was saying earlier, use boosters and go left. I wanted you to go there and not here. Because here, you just kind of end up down here or you end up down here, and then your next boosters, that's not any better. Whereas here, your second cycle of boosters would have been better effectively. You'd have been able to maintain a steeper angle on them, which is great because they're not looking that high up, which puts you on their screen, great, but that means they're hard not looking at your uh, McCree who's right here and shooting at them, etc., because their screen is in this direction. Likewise to stickies, you also don't want to waste flight before the fight begins, as not only will you not be able to follow up afterwards, but you'll also be left quite vulnerable. Flight should kind of be viewed as your get out of jail free card, similar to Sojourn's power slide, where you take an aggressive angle and can shift out at any moment to safety. Uh, sometimes I look at Echo a lot like this current Sojourn playstyle, where you want to play in a way to where you're going to get your shift forced, but not in a way to where you're going to have to shift in. The diva has a really the diva has to shift you out, and but then you just go out to begin with. You always have an escape route, but you're playing so aggressively that you force them to have to shift in to clear you out. So I'd rather you sh do this and then have to shift out than for you to shift in and then you're, you get caught dead. You kind of see what I'm saying? Now onto winning Echo one v ones thanks to your flight usage, as Nata details here. The distance between both these echoes is very minimal. Let's say if Pink Echo decides to shift up in the air and go go up high, right? This echo shifts first right then this echo will go down first that's just how it works this blue echo now can shift up and will hit this top maybe when the enemy echo is maybe like over here this gives this echo a massive advantage where this echo can sort of like tower above and sort of just basically hit really easy shots if imagine if you were the echo this echo here and for some reason you know you just shift it to poke 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 right you start going down and the enemy echo shifts on top of you you're forced to look like this this is not a great look for you you have to you have to shoot the echo plus it lands stickies plus also try and beam while you're going down that's really awkward and lastly before i move on to your ultimate i'll quickly cover cancelling your flights after you reach the desired height, you can cancel your flight to gain it faster off cooldown. Since your aggression is tied to when your flight's available, any time that you can get it back to maintain your uptime, take it. Echo's ultimate, Lazy Game Design V2, makes Echo duplicate any hero in the game, barring herself, gaining full use of their abilities for 15 seconds with an increased ultimate charge rate of 6.5 times. If you duplicate a tank, your HP is capped at 300s. There's five key uses which I'll get onto now. Note that some of these uses can also overlap. The first is maintaining or threatening off-angle pressure. This is when you duplicate heroes, you can threaten angles and or can hold areas of the map for persistent amounts of time. Think of heroes like Sigma, Ramatra or Zarya, all of which have no mobility, but when placed on a dangerous piece of high ground, they can become quite threatening. On King's or Second for example, either on defense or attack, duplicating one of these tanks and pressuring from high ground can be really tough to deal with if you're the enemy team. But also note that most DPS heroes can also threaten some off-angle pressure here too. A soldier, sojourn or ash can easily farm their ultimates from this high ground and pound the enemy team. The second usage, which is kind of outdated, is for barreling aggression. Essentially, this is when you duplicate heroes who have either got high mobility or high damage, or ideally both. Think Doomfist, Reinhardt or Tracer. This is a little outdated now because of the HP cap. 
Gone are the days where you can just press W on Reinhardt and farm shatter in 2 seconds, but with some more support, or by choosing some of the more mobile options, this can still definitely work. The third usage is ultimate power, in other words, duplicating a hero because of their ultimates. Flux, Grav, Bob, even pulling off Banana Blade if you have an Ana, are all relatively reliable ways in winning a teamfight. The fourth usage is cooldown power, same as the prior use, but for cooldowns. I'm not gonna lie, Ana is probably the only hero you'll be duplicating for this reason alone. Flying to high ground, duplicating Ana, and landing a big nade whilst farming Nana Boost is often a recipe for one teamfight. Imagine you're on King's own first point defense, where you duplicate the Ana from high ground and nade the entire team. All I'm gonna say is, they better have a Kiriko. The fifth and last usage is for second life duplications. Using duplicate for a second life allows you to land more aggressive engages onto the enemy team. You can go further and deeper and don't have to worry about saving your flight to escape. Also, if you're losing a duel, duplicating can flip that around. Now onto Echo's positioning and playstyle. Again, starting off with the four rules of positioning always hammered on in my guides. Here's an example on which point Gibraltar. The first rule is to have cover or a corner. Really important in order to stop taking damage at any moment. I'm wondering even here, could you even take like this position up on pillars here, like shift up here? You avoid, avoid their spam angles with this high ground cover, but you have your own spam angle on their, on their downside. Uh, and then if you need to drop, you do land on something that's not like the floor. Where you're positioned right now is like the worst of both worlds because can soldiers in on a, a get an angle on you from here? Do you see their sight lines? Yeah, they will. But not only that, but can you see Doomfist Tracer to spam them? If you go to this pillar here, you have cover, and that allows you to close the distance on these guys without taking damage. The second rule is to have line of sight so you can see and shoot the enemy team. Third rule is distance from angles in order to spam out flankers before they get on top of you. And the last rule is rotations, allowing you to take different angles as the fight progresses. There's also some specific positioning when running Mercy and another immobile support like Arno or Zen, where you want to position to where your Mercy can also help that other support. The Echo's over here, right? Then the Mercy should be flying in a position where the Mercy can help the Echo, but also peel the Zen. But if he knows what happens, a Fox backs up here, Seiko's over there, and now they're like so far away where the Mercy can't peel the Zen. So Seiko's positioning needs to also be relative to like the people who are non-mobile so the Mercy can peel. Now onto the plethora of playstyles that you can adopt on Echo, which do depend on the type of composition you play against. I'll let Nata give his brief overview, then I'll move to my own example. Enemy team is blue, and they're over here, and they're pushing like that. Green Echo, who's sort of like mirroring you. You see the Echo, sh like go up, shift in the air. You can shift and match the Echo, take the one-on-one. -on -one. You can play with your team, and you can back up a little bit more and play with your team and sort of poke, play the high ground. You can, if you notice the enemy team going this way, like hard this way, then you can maybe like sh like push over here and look to like go for a soft flank. Or maybe you see a ball going in your back line, right? So maybe you shift back and you use sticky and beam the ball and kill the ball. So there's five main options you have on Echo, and the key thing to understand is that you're dynamically changing playstyle as the team fight progresses, and some of the playstyles can overlap. Let's start with flanking. Here, the most obvious flank is deeper into the cave to your left side. And this leads me onto the dueling and diving playstyle. You could fly and duel any squishy you want from here, blowing them up with your stickies and beam, or if you're running dive, you and your dive crew just dive at targets. Simple. There is one small thing with diving, and that's to make sure that, before you dive, you clear out your angles so you don't get countered over, as Spyro gives an example of here. You have not made the ball go away, you've not burned the Echo's cooldowns, you've not forced the tracer out, you have done nothing, you've cheated, and gone straight for backline, which means now you're going to be hard focused. Like, this is map control. The Echo has a good angle, the ball has a good angle, they got that angle because they used Trance and Mines, which forced your Zen and Sigma to back off. If your Zen and Sigma didn't back off, then and this Echo could not do what she's about to do to you because she would be killed. You cannot go in aggressive while your backline is playing passive because their angle got cleared. So what's the simple answer? Because I know a lot, I've said a lot of big words. I do not want you going in aggressively backline. You can shoot backline, you can stick backline, but you do not go aggressively backline until your team has retaken the space. Now onto poking. Poking is either done at the start of fights or done more consistently against comps that haven't got much range. In this example here, because you're playing against the Mercy, Zen, Ash, who do have more poke than you, you're going to lean more into the flanking, dueling and diving playstyle. But if you're playing against a more broadly comp, you'll lean more into the poking playstyle. You can even combine poking and flanking by flanking through the cave and then poking afterwards. However, that isn't to say that you can't or shouldn't dive someone like the Baptiste when they eventually rush in, as Spalu explains here. But the big thing is that Fleta wasn't actually able to punish the backline. So again, if we go back to when 
soul is rushing here. Here's the rush. Where is Fleta? Fleta is in Narnia, dude. Fleta is doing absolutely nothing right now. In fact, Fleta doesn't even have shift yet. So he literally is AFK. He doesn't even land a shot until two of his teammates are dead. So Fleta needed to either be packed better, something needed to happen. He cannot get bullied out as easily as he did. Remember that you're a poke dive hybrid. You have both range and immobility to both poke and dive. Now lastly, onto peeling. This is pretty niche, but if there's a dive tank on the enemy team, you do have the tools to blow them up with your sticky zen or beam. You will need a little bit of help, like having an Ana, Zen, or Cassidy can help make this playstyle more viable, but it is something to mention. So that was all a bit complex, but hopefully I've shown the multitude of different playstyles that you can take with Echo. You can flank and assassinate someone, duel someone up front whilst your tanks pay attention, dive a target if you're running a dive comp, poke from afar if you outrange the enemy team before you decide to get up close, or peel if you and your team are dedicated to blowing up the enemy tank when they engage. That's it for the guide. If there's one thing you take away from this video, it's this. Genji is a poke dive hybrid, having the flexibility to spam from off angles to farm his blade, as well as pouncing and dueling squishies with relative safety thanks to his insane burst damage and defensive cooldowns. Treat your deflect like a get out of jail free card, and ensure you have some kind of escape if you do decide to go for a duel. Ensure that you have full HP and cooldowns when you duel, dash in and engage from off angles, and time your blades well. Genji's weapon, the Sharpie Boys, makes him fire 3 shurikens in just under a second, dealing 27 damage per shuriken with 24 in one clip. He can also throw these shurikens at once in a wider spread, with a 0.68 second recovery time between each burst. In terms of basic usage, you obviously want to use your fans in close range since you'll hit all 3 shurikens immediately, giving you a higher DPS. Aside from that, shurikens are mainly used to farm blade from off angles and high grounds. Really, it's your other abilities and playstyle that's in the more complex pieces of your kit. Genji's first ability, the Speedy Boy, makes Genji dash 15 meters, dealing 50 damage to anybody he dashes through with an 8 second cooldown. Your dash resets upon getting a kill or an assist, which is very important for chaining kills with your ultimate or ensuring that you have an escape if you assassinate someone. With tech, you can fire out any firing mode of shurikens after you dash. This combo can deal up to 242 damage, including your melee. The combo is most useful when diving supports at a medium distance with decently sized hitboxes. You can also flick these fan of shurikens the frame after you exit your dash. In terms of usage, dash is quite simple to use. Either engage or escape, that's basically it. When using dash to engage, you typically use it when you're going to confirm a kill, so a target is under 50 HP for example, or that you confirm the kill after you dash with your shurikens so that your dash gets back off cooldown. This also ties into the escape part, but when you dash to engage and you don't confirm the kill, either use deflect or think of dashing to the closest wall to utilize your passive to escape, as Spalu explains here. You, you're basically saying when, when you dash in, if you don't have a guarantee of a, a kill, you need to have a wall to climb out. Yeah, you have, to, you have to position yourself immediately for the wall. He's double jumping above the Rhinoc to get headshots, but he's also not positioning himself closer to this wall. He's still standing right here in the middle. So if you would take damage, get focused, because it's super easy to focus a Genji mm -hmm. or anyone that's in, in, in the middle of your team. So it's essentially a 1v6. Then he can't escape unless he uses Deflect, but he has already used Deflect. So now he's screwed. And lastly, before I move on to the escape usage, if you're playing Genji in some kind of dive comp, you need to make sure you're timing your dashes well with your team's engagements. Here's Barlow giving an example of Super, formerly from the shock, having a well and badly timed dash. If he goes in with his monkey, not only would he be safer, but he'd be doing more damage. So it's not just always playing more aggressively, he's playing more stupidly. And meanwhile, Smurf is actually doing stuff and where, where's my Genji? Genji's out of the fight. Okay, so th th this is it. This is not hard, okay? Now, not every dive is gonna be hardcore super early like this, but like this is why, look at, look at the timing here. Ball slam, Winston land, bubble, Super dash. This also using dash to escape of course, which does tie into your engage as well, as I've just explained, but this also using it as a get out of jail free card. I've explained this same concept with Sojourn's power slide and Echo's flight in my guise of those heroes, but dash can also be the same. You initially take an aggressive position, then you dash out if you get jumped. For example, on King's or third point defense, say you hold a decently aggressive position on high ground, and the enemy diva, if she's good, should fly up and mark you. That is when you can dash out if you're really feeling the heat. Fortunately, you also have things like deflect, unlike Sojourn or Echo, meaning that you can hold this position for longer, but if you really need to leave, 
that's when dash can become really valuable. There's also a third use which is dashing for mobility, the engage and escape dichotomy does already play into that, but obviously dash out of spawn to cover the map quicker and whatnot. Genji's second ability, the Uno reverse card, makes him reflect any damage in front of him aside from beams, lasting 2 seconds alongside an 8 second cooldown. Similar to Ana's Sleep or Aresa's Fortify, Deflect is best used defensively to act as a personal shield of yours which also happens to deal damage if the enemy shoot you. Deflect should most commonly be used as a get out of jail free card after you execute a target or after you dash for some ult charge. For example, on the Barney first point attack, you could dash up to the high ground, execute a target, dash back to your team and or deflect the safety. Alternatively, you can use Deflect in the duel itself to then get your dash off cooldown. For example, on King's or first point, if you dash up to the target like a soldier or Cassidy, you could deflect their helix or mag grenade respectively in order to secure the kill, then you dash out. Generally speaking, deflecting fire strikes or moyo orbs shouldn't really be your priority due to how little value you could be getting compared to firing shurikens, and you're also putting your deflect on cooldown early. But if you can use it early and then have it back up whilst the fight begins, there's no major issue. The penultimate thing I want to mention is to make sure that before you dive a target, you actually have your deflect available to use it. Remember, your deflect is what allows you to win duels and to retreat to safety afterwards. If you don't have it up, there's a good chance you can die afterwards. So why are you worried about getting slept and naded? What are you missing when you dive her? You're missing your deflect, because you already used it on the Hanzo. There's basically only two things that you need if you want to go in and dive someone. You need to make sure that you have all of your HP, and you need to make sure that you have all of your CDs. If you don't want to dive in if you have 50 HP, you don't want to dive in without deflect. So in this case, it is not super duper smart for you to go in on the Ana. So what should we have done instead? Wait two seconds and then go for either the Ana or the Widow. Uh, exactly. Uh, very, very simple. And lastly, there's cancelling your deflect. This is for when the enemy team stops shooting at you and you need to land a burst of damage to finish them off. Particularly useful in Dragonblade for example. Genji's passive, Mirror's Edge, gives Genji the ability to wall climb and double jump. I'll cover your double jump first. In general gameplay, you'll mostly use this to try and make your hitbox more unpredictable to hit. But I will clarify, that's against projectiles, not hitscan heroes, who will just track you. Here's an example of top 500 Genji player Necros saving his double jump when using Dragon Blade to make his movement more unpredictable. You should save one jump so you can like dash and then jump in the sky. It makes even great Anna's like MO7 like Mr. Sleep because it's just unpredictable. Like you don't know if Genji's gonna fall in a straight line or if he's gonna jump. Now onto your wall climb. Again, the usage is pretty rudimentary, using it to gain high ground, either to get another angle, or as a form of defense to escape danger. I'll get more onto positional stuff throughout. Genji's ultimate, Infinity Blade, makes Genji unleash his katana for 6 seconds, dealing 110 damage per slash at a 5 meter maximum range. You also gain a 30% speed buff, and your dash is relieved off cooldown. Just to get this out of the way, too many of you Genji players ask for Nano Boost or rely on it too heavily. Nano Blade is still a very powerful win condition and can and should still be used to secure teamfights, but stop using it as a cope if your naked blades don't get any value or you scream at your team to pick Ana. It's cringe to be frank. I'll start off by talking about the workshop code J90ZF that you can use to practice the mechanics of your blades either with Nano Boost or not. For those who don't know, a slash and dash in a blade is an insta kill with Nano, giving you an immediate dash reset to then go chase another target. So there's three main parts to your blades, the positioning from which you use it, the time at which you blade, and the cooldowns or mechanics used in the actual blade itself. I'll quickly cover the cooldown side since it's pretty simple. Just ensure you're at full HP and you have deflect before you blade. This is super important when dry or naked blading because you need to have deflect to stop those big bursts of damage like a Widow Shot, Hanzo Storm Arrow, Casty Nade, Sojourn Railgun, Soldier Helix, as well as things like Sleep Dart in order to not insta die the second you sheath blades. But this also leads me nicely onto the timing part of your blades. If you're going for a greedy blade, try not to use it at the beginning of the fight because the entire enemy team will have every single cooldown to stop you. Instead, let your tank tank some of the cooldowns first, draw some attention away from the front line, and then blade afterwards. I thought you were going to dash through, deflect, and tuck underneath, right? And then kind of wait for your Ramatra to get here, and then go with blade. But no, you went in by yourself. Like, the greedier the play, the later it needs to be. A naked dragon blade is a very greedy play. It's a fight winner, it's a 4k or a 5k, unless you go first, then it's a 0k. 
if you allow your Amatra to go in, if you just even go for just a dry neutral engage, like we saw there, dash through, that's gonna force Sojourn E, might force Suzu, will force GA, then we go from there. And lastly, covering the positioning part of your blades. This is really simple, but just blade in or dash in from an off angle, since the enemy team won't expect it. They're not expecting you. It throws them off, it scares them. And obviously your entry is safe too, because Everybody's seen the meme of Genji's getting rocked and swung and booped and flashbanged and all that and all that jazz, right? But look at Super's blade entry here. No damage. No damage. No damage. No damage. Bang. Here's another example on Dorado's second point attack. Instead of dashing up in the air, blading, and then dashing in, you instead dash up from underneath, blade, and do your thing. The last thing I want to cover is actually knowing when to disengage with your blades. So many Genji players are bloodthirsty and will int in with their blades, even if the enemy team use ultimates like Sound Barrier, Blizzard, Rally, etc. Listen, if you're naked blading into beat, you're not killing shit. So instead of swinging like a monkey in open space, dash out, save your life, and save your ego. Onto the final section of the guides, positioning and playstyle. I've always hammered on the four fundamental rules for almost every hero at this point, but for Genji, there's a few differences this time in the example that I'll give on the burning seconds. First rule is to have cover or a corner. You don't want to get your dash or deflect forced early because you swung wide. Secondly, have line of sight onto the enemy team so you can see and scout what you might be diving, as well as having things to shoot in the meantime. The third rule is to have rotation options. Rotation options just mean different flanks or angles that you can take in order to stage a dive or to simply poke and farm your blades. And the last rule is to have escape routes. I've already talked about using your dash and deflect to escape, so say you dash to the high ground to dive in Ash Mercy. You could retreat off the high ground and to the mini, or you can retreat to the stairs and then down to the mini, or you could dash out and deflect all the way to the coast. If you're a bit ballsy, you could also retreat to the mini on the side of the third points. This is where I think we get just a little too sloppy. So right here, you need to know where your escape route is. So you dash it's there, you right click, and then you- It's not right, here. It's not here, right? It's You just go a little too far, and so you disengage, your out is cut out. It's like you have to be so clean about in, out, in, out, in, out, min-maxing every single rotation that you take, every single engage that you take, because this is what kills you. Now onto Genji's playstyle. Likewise to Echo, you as Genji are a poke dive hero. That means against comps you outrange, you utilize your poke damage at the beginning of fights before you transition into your dive playstyle, where you utilize your very high burst damage to quickly assassinate a target and dip out. Say you're on King Zo playing against some kind of brawly comp like an Arisa Casti Bap. You could flank all the way around the high ground, poking in the meantime, to then drop behind and quickly assassinate the Baptiste. In a different scenario, if you're playing up against a more pokey comp like a Widow, Ash Mercy, that's where you have to go full assassin. Play shorter sightline angles with cover, looking to dash in from off angles and landing the kill on your target before escaping. So as a summary, play off angles to spam, and if you see an opportunity to dive and duel a vulnerable squishy, which you likely will, take it. Well that's it for the guides. This is the best way to play Hanzo in Overwatch 2. Hanzo is one of the few heroes in the game that can play both short and long ranges. His Storm Arrow allows him to take surgical, short to medium ranged angles, with the Sonic Arrow allowing him to scout the angle he takes. Use his ultimate to zone space, look to take aggressive angles with your lunge or wall climb to get the most out of your Storm Arrows, and play your appropriate ranges. Hanzo's weapon, Robin Hood's, makes Hanzo fire an arrow dealing up to 125 damage on full charge, taking 3 quarters of a second to fully charge, and reducing your movement speed by 30%. Starting off with some hitbox manipulation, particularly against enemy hit scans that you're dueling, you can look up and to the right to block your head hitbox to potentially bait out a widow shot, or against pinpoint projectiles like an enemy Hanzo, you can turn to one side and look down to further stray your head hitbox to one side. Note that this is most applicable to PC due to flicks. Apologies fellow console players. Another bit of micro is to charge your arrow in between your jump and your wall climb so that you don't have to spend as much time charging your arrow after your wall climb. As with any DPS hero in the game, on Hanzo, you need to pressure from an angle and time it during the teamfights. For instance, on Oasis University, you could take the high ground surrounding your team and wait until the enemy backline push through. I should mention that you ought to have an arrow charged when you take and peak this angle to immediately land that burst of damage instead of having to spend time charging up the arrow when you're on the angle. Of course, as Hanzo, you'll mostly be playing longer sightlines against most heroes. Unfortunately, you just straight up lose to heroes like Cassidy in close quarters, and if you are looking to play short to medium sightlines, you need to have your Storm Arrows available. The problem is, 
is that we're putting up pressure in a location, in a proximity that's not favorable for us against a composition like a Reinhardt Zarya and against a McCree. In addition, this makes no sense when you have a better, safer high ground angle like this that we literally just leveraged and won the fight with the previous fight. And now we're sitting on the floor. A key nuance to this would be playing up against the Widow, who's greatly favored at longer ranges as she's hit scan and you have inconsistent projectiles. Referring back to Junker Town, if the enemy team are on Widow, you can take this shorter sightline flank to the right where you have the dual advantage. Speaking about advantageous duels, I've spoken about this extensively in my Ash Guide, covering basic corner theory as well as a few advantages, but here I'll play a clip of Iostock stating a plethora of advantages that you can take in the sniper duel. You never want to take a fair fight, right? You always want to have an advantage when you go for 1v1. For example, you get the jump on someone, right? You get the first shot without them noticing you. The advantage could be positional. So for example, if you have high ground, that's a positional advantage. You can you have your ultimate, that's an advantage. You can have someone pocketing you, that's an advantage, right? There's also a peaker's advantage, because obviously you know when you peak, but the enemy doesn't know when you peak, which means that you're gonna have an advantage in terms of reaction time. An advantage that Stocks mentions is the unscouted advantage where you fire the first shot without the enemy noticing you. Here's Ottergate and Spilo providing and elaborating, respectively, on a visual example of that here. Here the Anna is unaware, feels safe, and stuck me to jump. And you're on the angle. You notice how the directional movement is this direction? The reason why unaware is big is because it makes their movement very predictable, which whether you're playing hit scan or projectile makes it easier to aim your shots. The Mercy is unaware and feels safe behind- Like I always pride myself on not spamming jump on a lot of the heroes I main, but a lot of times I will just jump when I'm just like chilling, right? And that's where you catch that. Just to build off on Arge's initial video, it doesn't directly tell you how to achieve those unaware positions. Generally speaking, you achieve them by timing your splits for when your tanks are baiting attention, as mentioned prior with the Junker Town example. However, as I'll mention later on, Hanzo's Sonic Arrow is quite vital in determining where and how you can flank. Another advantage that Stocks mentions is the use of high ground. However, Stocks argues that high ground can actually be a disadvantage in duels for pinpoint projectile heroes like Hanzo specifically. His Stocks and Spilo evaluating the idea. But there's also one big downside. It makes it significantly more difficult to land shots. Because yeah. if you look at this angle, the Anna, for example, she can move around in two dimensions. Down, left, up, right. But if you're horizontal with her, she can't move down and up. Drop down, uh, lunge towards these boxes, and then peek shoot around these boxes. And I think depending on the severity of the angle, a lot of high grounds, it's not that much harder. And sometimes the high ground angle, because you're on high ground, you're able to get to a better angle in the first place. And remember what we saw on third point Route 66 on the last file that we reviewed over, how the Hanzo being on high ground and missing most of his shots still did more than he would have, even on a more conservative angle, because it made everybody look up and away and it scared them away. That's the value right there. Hanzo's first ability the spam bow makes Hanzo fire several arrows instantly, each dealing 65 damage with a 10 second cooldown. Hanzo's overall DPS in Storm Arrows is 270, which, for reference, is one of the highest DPSs in the game, and Hanzo has 5 of these arrows. The fundamental use to Hanzo's Storm Bow is to use it to aid your flank pressure. While some renowned Hanzo mains like Arge have argued in the past that you should use your Storm Arrows for spam, so you sh shouldn't really use rapid fire for more than just spamming down a tank or spamming down a shield since it's so loud as well. This is bad advice. To be fair to Arge, that clip is over 3 years old, and we are in a new game. And he does have a point that Storm Arrows do kind of suck. We're currently in a state where you have to land 4 out of your 5 arrows just to kill a squishy. But the much higher DPS and the removal of your movement speed makes it much more forgiving to use rather than just firing your normal arrows. So, as a result, Storm Arrows should be used to win key flanks and therefore help you gain map control. For example, on Rook 66 third point attack, if you get into a duel against the enemy Cassidy for example, it'll be significantly easier for him to land shots and a sticky nade due to your movement penalty if you were to just fire your normal arrows. As a result, keep a distance of 10 to 15 meters and try to land your arrows. Now of course, there is a time and a place to use Storm Arrows against tanks and that's when they're jumping or diving directly onto you. A Winston, Doomfist, a Ramatra or Reinhardt going balls deep into you and your backline will need to have their aggression checked and 300 damage worth of Storm Arrows can certainly help with that. Before I move on, I'll touch on the fact that your arrows can bounce. In edge case scenarios, if someone is hiding behind a wall, you can try and bounce your arrows to hit them behind cover, almost akin to a drunk rat shooting and bouncing his nades off walls. 
Hanzo's second ability, B-Tech Warhacks, makes Hanzo fire an arrow carrying a sonar tracking device, allowing you to see enemies within a 9 meter radius of the arrow for 6 seconds. The arrow is also on a 12 second cooldown. Starting off with a bit of micro, before the team fights, you can often sonic in the air to provide you with early scouting information, and by the time the arrow lands, your sonic should be roughly 5 seconds off cooldown, effectively giving you 12 seconds of sonic uptime. There's two predominant uses to Hanzo's sonic arrow. The first is to use it aggressively to clear and scout a flank before taking it. If you sonic arrow a flank and you see a Cassidy or a flanker about to peek you, you should charge and line up a shot as soon as they peek. However, if there isn't anyone on that flank, you can then take it with safety. We sonic all the way like back here. Bad sonic bow. So we don't really know who's here or what's here. So that means that when we flank here, oh, we have to play a little bit more conservatively because we don't have any information on what's here. If we scout Mercy here, we can go click, click, click. If you scout nothing here, still good, because this means that you can peek this here. So I'm gonna pretend that you go, oh shoot, I don't have scouting information here. I might get flash fanned, that Genji might dash me, and there might be a high charge sorry here, I have no idea. And so you jump away from the angle and then right into graph. You didn't Sonic on the angle that you wanted to control, and then you walk into the angle, you get scared and you run back to your team. And by running back to your team, ironically, that was the most dangerous place for you to be. The other use of Sonic Arrow is to use it defensively once you're on your flank. For example, on Gibraltar first point attack, you could Sonic your right side flank to check whether a flex support or flanker tries to rotate and pick you off guard. Another defensive but slightly more niche use of your Sonic Arrow is a Sonic for your backline. We all know peeling is a rarity nowadays in Overwatch 2, so any information that you and your backline could get on where the enemy flankers might be can certainly be of use. Like on Blizzard World for example, just using Sonic Arrow to your left to check if a Sombra, Ball, Tracer, or any flanker for that matter might be going for a hard flank onto you can be really useful. And lastly, there's using Sonic Arrow just to help with your mechanics and lining up your shots. If you're already on an angle, sonicking a corner or a general area as to where squishy targets are moving in, you can line up and land some easy headshots. For example, on Midtown first point defense, you can sonic the choke, wait for enemy squishies to push, and then land your free headshots. You could also sonic down the train for those defensive reasons mentioned with the Watchpoint Gibraltar example. Hanzo's third ability, the B-Tech double jump, makes Hanzo leap 8 meters forward on a 4 second cooldown. I'll also bundle in his wall climb, which does what it says on the tin. With the wall climb, it's really just as simple as using it to gain high ground for good spam angles. Other heroes wish they could get to positions that you can get to, with maps like Numbani and Pareso being perfect examples to where your passive comes in handy. With your lunge, just treat it like Cassidy's role. In other words, use it to reach angles faster and or to escape danger quickly. Hanzo's ultimate, the B-Tech Dragon Blade, makes Hanzo summon a Spirit Dragon, dealing 150 DPS per dragon, with the DPS decreasing at the edges, combined to deal 300 DPS at the center. There's three bits of micro with Dragon Strike. The first is to try and use your lunge during the cast animation. This just makes your movement less predictable since you won't be standing still. The second bit of micro is to hold down your left click to fully charge an arrow before you ult. This will make you fire an arrow that looks like it's on 0% charge after you release your dragon strike but should actually be fully charged. The third bit of micro is just to dragon strike into walls if you're scared that it's gonna get eaten against the diva. In terms of usage, you'll mostly be using dragon strike to force the enemy team to split, zoning some areas of the map and allowing for easy cleanup. Here's an example of such on King's own second point defense. If you dragon strike whilst the enemy team pushes forward, the entire enemy team have to make a decision at once. Either everyone awkwardly pushes through the dragon strike, or more likely, the back line and front line will be split. As a result, this can allow you and your team to push in aggressively. Now onto the positioning, playstyle, and compositional section of this guide. Let's just breeze through the four rules of positioning with an example on Iconworld. Firstly, have a corner or some cover, and be sure to not swing wide or expose your hitbox unnecessarily, as Spalu explains here. Why the heck do you peek this wide? The second you peek this here, the Zenyatta is already visible. You don't need to go anymore, because the reason cover is good is it doesn't stop you from being shot. It stops you from being killed. Because if I'm shot here, I can go, oh, I need to move over. But because it's an extra quarter of a second to move over, and then I will receive a second shot, potentially, and die. Whereas if I get shot here, the only thing that can kill me are one-shots. Secondly, have line of sight onto the enemy team so you can actually shoot them. Thirdly, 
have good distance from angles so that the enemy ball or flanker doesn't sneak up on you, and the last guideline is to have good options to rotate. This is just taking different angles in the mid fight, and taking these positions will give you good opportunities to land kills with the Storm Arrow. Now onto your playstyle. There isn't anything too specific with Hanzo honestly, the main thing I'd say is ensuring that the sightlines you play are in accordance with your abilities and against the enemy team. Against the typical Pokeball composition, you generally want to take harder splits from range with medium range sightlines. For instance, on King's Row first point attack, you can split and wall climb to the high ground right side whilst your call pushes in. You could push in Hotel with your Storm Arrows, it's dependent on what the enemy team are running. If they're running something like Cassidy Junkrat, I'd think otherwise, but if it's against the Soldier Ash, then that could be an option. You could also go on very hard and long splits from your core, since there isn't much mobility to hunt you down. For instance, on Basan Mecha Base Retake, you can split from your team and control the high ground from range, and since the enemy team don't have any mobility, they can't really mark you. Now when playing against Dive, the opposite is true. Likewise to many DPS heroes with little mobility, you typically don't hard flank since you'll just become the dive target. I gave an example of this in my Ash Guide on Elios, so go check that out for more details. In full on poke comps that you'll typically come across on long ranged maps like Junker Town, Havana or Soko Royale, the key is short sightlines utilising your Storm Arrows. Most of the time, you just don't win the Widow Jewel from afar. Either Sonic the Widow and line up your arrows, or Sonic the Widow and take angles around her where she's not looking. Well that's it for the video. This is the best way to play John Krat in Overwatch 2. Gone are the days of spamming down chokes as John Krat. Now, more often than not, you heavily lean into the dueling or flanking playstyle, engaging from quirky off angles to one shot someone with your nade and mine combo. Alternatively, you can look to spam and control tight, narrow, short sight lined, and enclosed areas of the map. Think about the timing of your tire threatening enemies in close range with a one-shot combo, as well as avoiding the sightlines of heroes that just outrange you. Drunkrat's weapon, RNG, <laughs> makes Drunkrat launch nades that deal up to 120 damage on direct hits, firing 3 shots every 2 seconds with 5 nades in a single clip. A key thing behind Junkrat's grenade launcher is that his sightlines are to be kept short despite the fact that he's got quite a bit of poke damage. The reason for this is because his DPS is just unreliable from afar due to the slow projectile speed and arc of his nades. It's why Junkrat also loves to hold tight, narrow, and typically enclosed spaces like Temporal gives a good example of here. Or get yourself over here where you can control the power position. This is actually the part of this map that matters a lot, and you as Junkrat are really good at going, hey, I have a mind for this. Hey, I can bounce nades in here and it's absolutely brutal for them to push up into, etc. You controlling this is the best thing that you can do for your team. And if you're sitting on two mines, you can mine yourself up here whenever you want and go, hey, I'll do this, blah, blah, blah. As they start to pay attention to you, if you're not getting the support you want, you just drop. Your second mines are generating again and you're still controlling this, which is incredibly valuable to your team. If they, if you literally see that all six of them push this way, all six of them, so that you go, okay, they're not coming through here, you just turn over over here and go okay i'll mine from here and you're still good you still have cover options you still get to rain nades down that's where you want to be working from that concept is probably the most important one in the video because it's applicable to almost every map there's the old but gold example on kings or hotel where if anyone dares to walk into a hotel they insta die to your one shot and you can threaten the one shot onto enemy squishies playing an archway here's another example on rialto third point where either flank to your left or right is relatively enclosed giving you a safe spam angle and a place to threaten one shots now this isn't to say that other angles are necessarily bad for Junkrat, and you should still take them when you can, like on Dorado's second high ground, but do note that these longer, open sightlines make you as Junkrat more prone to longer ranged hitscan heroes. Now, before I end off this section, I'll quickly cover blind spamming. Junkrat's mines bounce quite a bit to where you can land damage or even kills into areas that you don't even see yourself. Here's Jake explaining how to min-max your blind spamming so that it isn't predictable. Whenever you're blind spamming, you really want to subtly change the angles. You know the Doomfist in the room, right? So you want to spam him. Don't keep shooting the same exact spot. Just even if you're going to go like, like shoot one here, then shoot one at the ceiling, then shoot one over to the right as you walk, like shooting like this, all of these are going to have the exact same trajectory. So from the enemy team's perspective, as soon as you see one, then you see like the next bomb and it's on the same trajectory. It's like really easy. Like obviously, you know, you just like don't stand there. That's the one spot that I need to not stand. But if you're shooting like one here, one here, one here, one here, then it's like all bouncing around the room and it becomes like it's even good players will like walk into one of the bombs. Drunkrat's first ability, Zofia's Concussion Mine, <laughs> makes Drunkrat trigger one of his homemade mines, dealing up to 100 damage in a three meter radius with two charges, with each one being on an eight second cooldown. The mines do have fall off damage from the center. 
Starting off with the most generic, bronze level tip in the world, just jump after you mine to gain extra momentum. Also, use a mine just before you tire, so that after your tire finishes, you effectively get 3 mines. Same thing when rolling out at the start of attacking rounds. Now the most common and important piece of tech is of course the one shot combo, which is simply done by shooting a grenade then mining afterwards. There's a reason why this combo was nerfed going into season 3. I've already touched upon using the combo defensively to threaten anyone who jumps you, so I'll elaborate on this a bit more. Here's an example of top 500 Junkrat main Aquamarine trying to do this combo in Esperanza. He sees the ash coming towards him, and he knows that either corner from which the ash peaks is a prime opportunity to one-shot the ash. Unfortunately, he misses, but the theory is still there. The defensive one-shot combo relies upon corners and extreme close ranges to pull this off. It's exactly why peaking Junkrat can be very scary. There's also the proactive or aggressive one-shot combo, where you use one of your mines to engage to get into close range first, then you pull off the one-shot combo. Here's an example of Meta 1 doing this pretty much to a T. A key thing to note here is that since you won't have a concussion mine to escape, you need to have an escape planned, which will typically be using cover of some sorts. In this example, Meta just uses the cover towards the left side of point to stay safe, but in other instances, like when you're mining up to high grounds, you need to be ready to drop. I don't mind this play, like jumping up I guess, but if it were me, I would like jump right into the window, try to get a one shot and instantly run away. You like keep running in and it's like, whoa, this is crazy, right? Like you're 100% gonna die. And it's like, I don't know, 50-50 if you get the kill. So you, if you're gonna push in like this, you wanna like push in, attempt the one shot kill and then immediately run away. Referring back to the Antarctica example, I also want to bring attention to the timing. Note that the one shot combo is timed for when the team fight begins, and you can see this because the Ryan drops the point to touch, meaning he engages, giving John Crack the perfect opportunity to assassinate the Baptiste. Now there's also a third general use of Concussion Mine, which is to just use it when dueling at short to medium range. For example, on Route 66 third points, you can try and one shot an enemy who tries to duel you. If you miss your grenade, you can also throw your second mine to make this more forgiving. Once you've won this flank, you also have a short to medium range sightline to land your combo once again, or just to spam from high grounds. Speaking more in general terms, Concussion Mine can also be used for mobility in order to gain high grounds, so you can lay in damage from places where the enemy team can't easily hide from. For instance, on Gibraltar first point defense, concussing up to blue box will not only allow you to control it, but to also lay in damage from above. Junkrat's second ability, Jason's Trap, makes Junkrat toss out a trap, dealing 100 damage with 100 HP, locking the entrapped enemy for 2.5 seconds. The trap is also on a 10 second cooldown, and I'll also group in his passive, which makes Junkrat drop 300 damage worth of nades after he dies. Fortunately, trap usage is very easy to cover. There's defensive and aggressive uses. The defensive uses arise when you want to deter flankers from contesting your angle. Referring back to the Rook CT6 example, tossing a trap by your feet, or by the stairs, can deter Genji from dashing into you, and or can give you information as to whether anyone is coming up lorry to contest you. Now the aggressive uses arise by just tossing trap into the middle of the team fights for random spam. This is quite useful for when the enemy team aren't running any flankers or just aren't jumping you, so you find it difficult to get any value out of your trap. As a result, you might as well just toss it somewhere in the enemy team. The new the new trap is actually like really long range, so just throwing it like high angle into the team fight is like pretty strong. I mean, if okay. you have like nothing better to do with it, sure. just press it. You either want to put it around corners in the back of the map where your team can like play on it and bait them in or you want to just throw it into the middle of the team fight and just like that's basically just like getting it's like it's like spamming basically it's like right. another thing the enemy has to think about drunk us ultimates the free kill Mixed Junkrat rev up a motorized tire bomb with 100 HP, dealing up to 600 damage in a 10 meter radius that has a duration for 10 seconds. A fundamental concept, which is dependent on how much value you receive, is the time rip tire when attention is being baited elsewhere, as Temporal explains here. As soon as they're committing and our team is committing back, etc., that's when we wanted to pull the tire. Because now, hey, our team is committing, their team is committing, they're in a situation where it is painful for them to turn and shoot at the tire, etc. It is painful for them to try to run away, etc. Because they're already in the fight with our team. This tire was too early on two counts. Both a, hey, they weren't really committed to it yet, so they actually had attention available to try to deal with the tire, which is why you had to settle for the Enna so quick. Not that the Enna was bad. Though the Enna was bad for the second reason of, hey, this didn't really buy you very much time. You didn't maximize the amount of time that you took off the clock with this defensive win. 
This is actually really important on Junkrats. I know a lot of Junkrat players who love to use their tires very early on just to get a pick so they make the following fight easier, but a lot of the time their tires end up getting destroyed because it's so easy to focus on tire when the other four teammates aren't pushing in. At the beginning of a team fight, they also have every cooldown known to man to throw towards your tire. Instead, if you tire when either team engages, or even later into the mid fight, your tires will be harder to deal with. It's also utilising the 10 second duration to either threaten the enemy team or to make your tire less telegraphed. Most drunk rat players know that jamming your tire against the wall produces no sound, which can be good to do at the start of your tire so the enemy team don't know when or where it's coming from. Additionally, you can also use tire for map control purposes and winning out key flanks. Using the high ground on Real 2 second point is a good example. If anyone dares come close to your tire, it's pretty much a free kill. The penultimate tip with tire is to utilise roofs wherever possible, as the tire then becomes very predictable and hard to track. A great example to do this could be on a way to city centre. And lastly, although a pretty rudimentary tip, do make sure to use Riptire in a position where you yourself aren't going to be vulnerable. Remember, the goal with Riptire is to get your free kill, not be the free kill. Moving on to the positional, playstyle, and compositional section of this guide. With positioning, there's four rules that I always mention, so let's breeze through them on Blizzard World third points. The first rule is cover, especially important on Junkrat, where you want to avoid heroes that outrange you, like Ash. The second rule is line of sights. Again, this is actually quite important on Junkrat specifically, since you want to see and look for enemies who you can one-shot. The third rule is distance from angles, useful so that heroes like Tracer don't sneak up on you. This actually doesn't really matter for Junkrat that much, since every hero is scared to fight close to you due to your one-shot combo, but it's still something worth mentioning. And the last rule is rotations. This is where you can look to take different angles to spam, or you look for certain positions to execute your one-shot combo, like if any DPS are playing the high ground for example. Now onto your playstyle. Just like in Overwatch 1, Junkrat has two predominant playstyles, one of which is spam based, and the other is more duelist oriented. Note that throughout a single team fight, you will likely be flowing between the two playstyles. The first playstyle works best against comps that just have no range, or it's just something that you'll do at the start of a team fight. It's essentially the same thing I talked about in my Echo Guide, where you soften up the enemy brawl team before a fight, and then you look to pounce on the enemy backline as the fight breaks out. And I've already used part of this example before, but here, Meta1 spams out the initial brawl team, and once they start moving and engaging, he then goes for the explosive duelist playstyle. Speaking about that latter, more explosive playstyle, it's more appropriate against the mobile compositions who can't easily punish you by taking aggressive flanks, and more often than not, they just straight up outrange you, making your spam playstyle very limited. You can flank around this way and use this angle and when you go this way what you'll do is number one is you will use it but you'll also probably kill whoever is here so you'll want to quickly explode through no pun intended to tap whoever's here or at least make them drop and then either you can continue to run away this way or you can just go back and play it to safety now it's significant to note and i think you need to be paying attention to this that they don't do not have mobility especially somebody like tracer so if you do go through this window and shoot them you can continue to move in this direction and set up a deeper angle and really nobody can go chase you down if they do they're, run they're risking their life and they're not going to be able to 1v1 you. So I've talked about playing against brawl oriented teams, playing against poke oriented teams, and somewhere in between. But what about dive teams? Fortunately for Junkrat, the playstyle is quite similar to other heroes like in my Cassidy or in my Ash Guides, looking to take soft off angles to land spam damage early on, absorbing the enemy team's dive, and then pushing up afterwards. If, for example, on Basan Downtown, you and your team get dove, you can use your Concussion Mind to either escape and or threaten your one-shot combo. You're also within range to get peeling from your supports too. Well that's it for the guys. This is the best way to play Mei in Overwatch 2. Mei is one of the best close range duelists in the game, thanks to the high utility in her wall and the high sustain in her cryo. Your wall usage is all about isolating targets and aggressing onto them. This could be as simple as walling off the enemy Ryan and walking onto him, walling off the enemy tank and walking onto the supports, or walling off enemy DPS to get into close range and duel them. Always look for those opportunities to take on the enemy squishies when possible, don't get greedy with your blizzards, and get creative with your positioning against the mobile, ranged comps. Mei's weapon, the Devil's Advocate, <coughs> makes Mei shoot out a stream of frost, dealing 70 DPS, applying a slow effect of up to 40%. Once Mei also freezes a target for a long enough period, she applies a deep chill passive, slowing the enemy up to 65% and dealing an extra 40 damage if you break the deep chill passive with an icicle. 
Unfortunately, there isn't that much complexity to Mei's weapon. Use your frost in short range, your icicles at further or longer ranges, and keep an eye on your ammo since you don't want to be freezing an enemy then be forced to reload. Really, it's a wall that's the more complex part of her kit, which I'll get onto now. Mei's first ability, Trump's Wall, Mix may generate an ice wall split into 5 pillars, each worth 250 HP, with a 5 second duration, alongside a cooldown of 12 seconds. As I've just hinted, May wall is by far the most complex piece of her kit, and if you haven't seen by the timestamps already, this is going to be a lot more than simply split enemy Ryan foreheads. Now generally speaking, there's 4 key tenants for a good wall, nicely denoted in the acronym TITS, with timing, isolation, target priority, and space. And yes, this is a corny reference to Logic's album Tits or The Incredible True Story. For clarity, this does exclude walls that are used for mobility, like walling up, and it excludes walls done for rotations, both of which are more niche uses, so I'll talk about them afterwards. As for the first principle of timing, this is the easiest one to wrap your head around. This means that you just time your walls for when your team can actually get value out of them. His Iog stocks giving an example of that general sentiment here. The wall that you use here is pretty early, and your team can't really do anything with it because the Reinhardt still has his shield. Just wait a little bit, break the shield first, and once the shield is a little bit lower, that's when you can look to wall him off because then you can just break the rest of the shield and you can freeze him and you can try to actually confirm the kill that way. Here's also another good example on King's low first point defense. Maze will commonly be playing close to points, and yet they'll try and look for a wall past the choke. Alternatively, the Maze could be playing at the choke, looking for a wall, but the rest of your team aren't holding or playing there at all. This all means that when you're aggressing, your team isn't, so the wall gets limited value. Moving on to the second and broadest principle, isolation. This means splitting or cutting off line of sight between one target and another. It could be between a tank and their supports, a DPS and their supports, or a DPS and their tank. Like right here, I see this and I'm like instantly vertical wall here, you know, okay? And then even here, right here, if you wall again vertically here, Arissa, Ash, no, I think you're high nooning, so maybe that's why you hold it. I mean, even here, right? Like, like yes, the Arissa will just use Fortify. Do I have wall? Do I have wall? I must have wall, right? I you didn't you do, it. yeah, you do. The wall, you the wall I was here. just slow. Maybe stop them from kiting? The last principle is target priority. Just because you wall off a tank doesn't necessarily mean that you have to focus them, especially if you're playing against someone like Arisa. If, for example, the enemy tank goes deep into your team and you wall them off, splitting them from their backline, you could very well turn around and focus their backline rather than the Arisa. Now this is somewhat hero dependent, but against most heroes, you win in close range here thanks to your cryo. You could do a wall here and double back and go for a backline and sneak up on yeah, it. Yeah, you know? that's Eureka. When I wall off Orisa, it's, it's a good walling of Orisa, but then what I actually did wrong was focusing on Orisa rather than everyone else behind right, this wall. Right, It's just that about like how much play. pressure yeah. you're gonna get. Like if you had your choice here as me, you could just walk in here and you would kill Ash. I mean, look at the AOE damage of your spray on this. Three squishies. Oh my yeah. gosh. It's it's over, right? It's it's j just completely over for the enemy team and you still have your ice block to play around uh, that, that the sleep dart. Now, not in all scenarios will you be able to access backline, and just pressuring the enemy tank when they're walled off is relatively fine, since you'll force out multiple cooldowns and get a good trade-off. But when you see the opportunity arise to focus down squishies, you should definitely take it. Now, the last type of wall is one used for space. When I say this, I'm referring to where you hold an off-angle, and because you're such a good close-range duelist, if anyone decides to contest you, you wall them off to control the space that you're holding. For example, on King Zhou, you could be holding Hotel, and if a Genji or Hanzo decide to jump onto you, you just wall them off and kill them. This could also be done around the statue 2 on defense, and is best done when you have shorter sightlines. You could simply hold an off angle and spam, 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 spam. Hanzo tries to take an angle, you wall him off, you freeze him, you use your ice block, and again, the same thing. Either you get the kill, or you force absolute panic from the enemy team trying to control the Hanzo. What I learned with, me, with my little time is like finding out whether I needed to be selfish with my walls. In other words, I'm going to play around punishing the enemy front line on something that my team could follow up. Um, or selfless in terms of I'm playing, um, or selfish, excuse me, for I'm playing for myself, I'm taking an angle, I'm taking it to spam to control the DPS. Now I want to delve into more niche walls. First off, his temporal explaining how you can wall defensively to buy you and your team some time if, for example, you're getting run over by a coalescence, beats, back window, etc. Say the front line has broken and the opposing team decides that they want a power play and they pop 
transcendence, covalence, sound barrier, any of them. Well, your May can respond by throwing up a wall, even an imperfect wall that they have to take a second or two to go around, and that buys you some time. You're not terribly threatened by their power play when it's down a couple people. Then once they have rounded the wall with those six people, and you've taken off a couple seconds, maybe three seconds if you're lucky, now you can answer with your own support ultimate. So maybe you match your sound barrier to their sound barrier. Well, that works out just great. Another use of wall is for verticality. Verticality is just really simple. You wall yourself up to high ground and utilize the fact that you're a great close range duelist. There's this infamous clip of Backbone doing this on Colosseo against the Atlanta Reign in the mid-season madness, and as you can see, he's probably the best May player in the world. There's also using the verticality of your wall to reposition immobile heroes in more powerful positions. What can you do with May wall here? Oh, you think you get me up on this uh, side yeah, ground on the side, right? Oh yeah, you, you got you yeah. made. Yeah, absolutely. You guys could have May walled up here like five, six seconds ago and just had your on a crouch right here. Bingo. They walk through there, massive nade. You uh, can nade, heal your yeah. team, and it's so hard for them to see you. And even if they do see you, you just drop and you go play stairs or you play corner. Easy yep. peasy. There's also another clip playing in the background of a contenders team doing the same thing, but on Havana and with High Noon. The key thing here is to be creative. Utilize the cart to get extra verticality, and if you're in a seam or in a more coordinated environment, this should definitely be something in the back of your minds. There's also using walls for rotations. For example, on Midtown Attack, you could wall here, making it safe for you and your team to rotate in the building. I can't find any examples of this in Overwatch League, but I do remember the Spitfire doing this quite a while ago. And lastly, make sure to cancel your wall if you end up blocking the LOS of your teammates, and note that you can wall Bap Slap to deactivate it. As you can see, Mace Wall is one of the most complex abilities in the game, so those are some key principles and also niche use cases where you can use May Wall. May second ability, Block. Mix may gain 50 HPS for 3 seconds, paired with a 12 second cooldown. You also restore 15 ammo per second, block all lines of sight, and become invincible in your cryo. Similar to Orisa's Fortify and Arna's Sleep, since this is a defensive cooldown, you should only use it when you need to, instead of actively looking to get value out of your cryo. It should be a fail safe or get out of jail free card for when you get pressured. The only time you'll be aggressively or proactively using Cryo is when you're trying to dodge or cleanse certain abilities in a 1v1. For instance, dodging a Widow Headshot, Honor Sleep, Ash Dynamite, etc. May's Ultimate, The Seven Deadly Sins. Mix May emit snow in a circular area with a 10 meter radius, dealing 20 DPS, lasting 4.25 seconds, taking roughly 2 seconds to freeze the targets. Note that the freeze progress is greatly increased by using your primary fire. The most applicable piece of advice is to not always look for these massive clumped up blizzards. Catching 1 or 2 enemies should be plenty to win the team fight with, especially if you've got a good wall with it. If you wall off the enemy run for example and blizzard, you can guarantee a kill there with decent certainty. It's also the placement of your blizzards. If you're trying to catch some squishies in the backline, it's important to chuck the blizzard where you think they might be moving or retreating to, because keep in mind, the 10 meter radius of blizzard isn't too big. Once you miss the wall, you still could have like chucked it. Like right now, like right here, but you gotta get it there. You wait too long so she almost has another bubble, and then you also don't throw it deep enough. The penultimate thing I'll touch on is the timing of your blizzards. Just as with most ultimates, use it in the mid fight since there'll be less cooldowns like Amp, Suzu, and Zarya bubbles to escape from your blizzards. And lastly, you can use Mayo defensively to protect yourself and your team if you get rushed on. So using your ultimate here does two things. For one, it freezes the enemy team so you can kill them. And two, it means that the enemy team can't follow up. It's not just offensive, you can also use your ultimate kind of defensively. Because the enemy team has the immortality field and you don't which means that the enemy team just like they can continue dealing damage. But because you just got your ultimate, you could use it. It forces out the Reinhardt because, you know, he can't really do anything with his shield. And even if your Genji gets picked, like with Mei ultimate, if the enemy team doesn't have transcendence, you can still win the fight 5v6 if the enemy team is in a position like this. Like the enemy team is pushed up really, really, really far. Now onto the final section, positioning and playstyle. Now for those who've watched my stuff before, you'll know there's four key guidelines taken from Coach Nasser, which I'll show on Icon Ward first. The first rule is to have cover or corner. Now cover or corners ensure that you stop taking damage at any moment, but corners can also give a nice cue in order to get a good wall off. Simply warding a target as they turn the corner can force a lot of cooldowns from the enemy team in response. The second rule is to have line of sight so you can see what and where you're shooting. The third rule is to have distance from angles so you have plenty of time to react to flankers and the last rule is rotations. Now on every map you won't be able to do this but where possible these rotations can be done either before or after you use your wall. 
remember, you're a great close range duelist, so heroes like Cassidy or Soldier will struggle fighting you. Especially Cassidy who, keep in mind, you greatly benefit from the flashbang change since you just ice pockets. Now on to play style of compositions. When playing against a hard dive comp, you want to play soft off angles. You don't want to be hard flanking and playing split, but you also don't want to be stacked on top of your backline. I recommend checking out my Ash or Cassidy guide for more details, since the same logic applies to them. Against poke heavy comps, short sightlines are key. I already touched upon it with my rotations example on Lycan World, but here's another example on King's Row. If you're playing up against Ash, Widow, Hanzo, or heroes who want to split and take angles, you could place yourself on those angles in the first place, and if they get close, you can draw them. And you can also use your wall if you'd like. Now against Brawl or Poke Brawl, there's nothing too much to say, unless you're playing against some May Brawl Mirror, which can get pretty complicated. There's things like warning first or warning seconds, playing stacked with your team or playing splits, and honestly, most of it is pretty team based. If you're one of the few people who are interested in that kind of thing, I recommend checking the May section of my old Brawl Guide from quite a while back. And that's it for the video. This is the best way to play Farah in Overwatch 2. Farah's playstyle in Overwatch 2 is actually pretty similar to Overwatch 1, in that you're either spamming around corners in the air, or you're pouncing onto enemy squishies, using your Concussion Blast to get into range. Watch your fuel management, use your Concussion Blast to set up and make your dives easier, and time your barrage in the mid-fights, since there's less cooldowns to stop you. Farah's weapon, Soldier's TF2 Rocket Launcher, makes Farah fire rockets that deal 120 damage on direct hit at a fire rate of 1 round per 0.85 seconds. Firstly, the sightlines that Farah plays are dependent upon the map and the enemy composition. For instance, on Numbani first point attack, when playing up against longer range hitscans, pathing coast side to where you have a short sightline onto their core will give you an advantage. However, up against a more flanker based composition, playing wider and longer sightlines where you can't be as easily contested would give you more value. One of the most important aspects to maximise the value from your rockets is to maintain good corner discipline as former Owl coach Hayes explains here. When playing against heroes that have kill pressure on Echo, such as hitscan DPS, use buildings and natural cover to your advantage. Peak and output damage giving yourself a fallback option if the enemy draws their attention towards you. By doing this, your movement becomes more unpredictable, making you harder to hit. It is important to note that you should not do this against heroes with one-shot potential such as Widowmaker. Let's take a look at an example. Flutter uses the rooftops as cover to spam pre-fight. Notice that when he sees the enemy McCree looking at him, he dips behind cover to safety. Notice how he's playing these angles here where it makes it so difficult for this McCree to kill on him. Because if the McCree peeks, he's peeking into the exact position where this this forest farm is coming through. So this is going to be so difficult for the McCree to, to peek this. Just because of the way he's using this natural cover, maybe he can get shot once, right? He can get shot once, but after that one shot, he's going to dip behind the cover, and then he's going to come back out when he's been healed by the Mercy. This is one of the most important concepts in the video. Being a handful of inches away from a corner can really be the difference between life and death. And if you're dying a lot on Farah, this is likely one of the key reasons. While still on the topic of cover, doing rotations from cover to cover is vital in toning your aggression and having the ability to fall back, as Spalo explains here. And the last thing is cover. Farah is very, very aggressive, but it's always from cover to cover to cover to cover. A lot like Tracer, right? Cover to cover to cover to cover to cover. It significantly increases your longevity. For instance, on Blizzard World's second point attack, there are many rotations that you can make that all have a piece of cover for you to duck behind, and the distance between each piece of cover isn't too long either. If you want to go an extra level deeper than this, do these rotations whilst your tanks are engaging, as your tanks will be baiting attention away from you, allowing you to go more and more aggressive. In terms of target priority, the biggest concept to grasp is to shoot what's easy and what's most dangerous. Too many Farah players will be busy wasting time dueling the other Farah, missing rockets with no splash damage, so unless your name is Yazan or LBDD7, focus on wearing down tanks and ground supports, as even if you miss, you should still land some splash damage. You should only really shoot the enemy pharmacy if they're playing excessively aggressive and you're confident in hitting your shots. With the broader usage of Farah's rockets, since they are tied very closely to our overall playstyle, I'll go more in depth about them in that section. Farah's first ability, TF2 Rocket Jumping, Mix Far propeller thrusters over 11 meters in the air with a cooldown of 10 seconds. She also has her cover jets, giving her a 20% movement speed buff and can propel her 4 meters in the air every second. The most fundamental aspect when flying with Farah is your fuel management. It's an old but gold clip of Jane going over 3 aspects to help you min max every last ounce of fuel. So if I press shift when my fuel is at red, by the time I stop my momentum burns off at the very top of my boost, I will have a full fuel gauge. Holding space, we don't go faster and faster and faster and faster as we hold up. We get to a maximum upwards velocity. So if I jump jet while boosting, 
I still get the same upwards, right? So the, the delta V or the change in velocity, if I'm hover jetting while I'm boosting is less than if I'm dropping and boost. Knowing this, what you wanna be doing is right before you boost, go a little bit beneath the red, go right as you hit max down, you boost back up. So if I'm tap, 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 tap. The majority of my flight time is spent with that cooldown between deactivating my hover jets and my fuel recharging. So you want really slow, methodical pulses so that you have less time spent in that cooldown phase and you can have better fuel management. Now, if you want to actively practice your fuel management on Farah whilst firing rockets, there's a workshop code called DKKKD, which forces you to learn rocket jumping, fuel management, and rocket aiming. Here's CarQ showcasing it back in Overwatch 1. You need to learn how to rocket jump properly on Farah, or else you're going to be dueling this AI at a huge height disadvantage, which is not optimal at all. Remember, in the Farah 1v1 in real matches, staying above your enemy Farah mirror will always be advantageous. So to rocket jump correctly, you need to shoot at the ground, jump, and jump jet almost simultaneously and as fast as you can for maximal height. This workshop is actually such a great training mode to not only practice your initial rocket jump tech, but it will also refine your aerial movement, fuel management, and direct hits. It's the full package. With the broader uses of Farah's jump on hover jets, there's a general rinse and repeat routine that you perform from high grounds. In short, you want to treat high ground like your helipads, or in other words, a place for you to depart and return to safely. If you've watched my echo guide, you'll be familiar with this idea, but I'll use an example on Dorado to illustrate what I mean. Here, on Dorado second, you'll initially start on high ground, and that will effectively be your helipads. Then, you can do either of your play styles, which I'll talk about, maybe diving and drooling squishies with your concussion blast, dropping on enemy squishies below you, or spamming out the enemy tank. Then, when you're low on fuel, you'll return back to the high ground and use either of your remaining abilities to help you stabilize. Farah's second ability, Zofia's Concussion, <laughs> makes Farah launch a wrist rocket that knocks back enemies by 8 meters, deals 30 direct damage, and is on a 9 second cooldown. With your Concussive Blast, there's two overarching uses of it, which is for displacement or for mobility. I'll cover displacement first, since that's the most simple. Displacement can involve booping enemies to prevent cooldowns and ultimates, like denying a res, denying follow-up from a Rhine Shatter, and can prevent someone like Remarcher from getting close with his annihilation. For displacement, there's also using Concussion Blast appeal. Some of those uses I just listed, like denying Remarcher's annihilation, is a form of peeling. But more generally speaking, if a Doomfist, Winston, or Wrecking Ball, or any dive hero for that matter, is diving your backline, a simple Concussion Blast can help quite a bit. There's also displacing people off the map, or in other words, getting environmental kills. Ilios is probably the best example where you can do this. And lastly, there's booping or displacing an enemy into your team to help aggress onto them. For example, on kings or defense, if the enemy Reinhardt is low or is playing a bit too aggressive, tossing your concussion behind him can buy your team enough time to aggress onto the enemy Ryan. Now onto concussions associated with mobility. This is mostly for setting up a dive or a duel onto a squishy target, as Spyro explains here. Blast over here. Set up your dive faster. Set up your angle faster. Or just fly over here. Normally, press a blast directly over the Hanzo and shoot him. Or use your concussive blast while you shoot at the Hanzo to try and boop him into the pit, force him to use his lunge, and force him to focus on staying alive. That allows you to dive him even easier. With blast, you have to be really careful. Similarly to your echo stickies, it feels a little bit like you're just kind of using the cooldown, but actually you have a really, really important use for the cooldown, and we're not going to have it. Here's yet another example given by Coach Hayes, with Yazan doing exactly that. So that, that was a really nice maneuver. He repositioned himself closer to the ash, again where he's going to have a favorable duel versus this ash. If he stays at range from here and tries to shoot the ash, this is not going to work out for him. Obviously, he has a projectile. He's playing to engage close to the ash here and take a close 2v2 where he's going to have a, a favored fight. Since this heavily ties into the broader playstyle of Farah being a surgical duelist, more on this will be featured later on. Farah's ultimate, World War III, Mixfire release a barrage of mini rockets that can deal up to 3000 damage in 2.5 seconds. In terms of tech, here's Jane going over a few animation cancels and their usage. You can animation cancel rocket with barrage. Drop! Did you see? My ammo's at 5. I used an extra rocket. Floor concussion into boost onto barraging the high ground. So the tech from barraging from high to low or through doorways or areas is boost up, drop silently so you surprise people. The other way that you surprise people on Pharaoh, you're seeing a theme here. You look at the ground, you boost up, boom. Right? An example of that latter tech 
could be on kings or third point attack, where you clear and eliminate any DPS on the high ground before they can even react. Make sure you time this just after your tanks engage, so that all attention from the enemy team is onto your tanks, allowing you to surprise the enemy team. With timing of barrages, here's Spyro going over that here. Barrage is great mid fight. Devolve fights fewer cooldowns. It's a lot like Death Blossom. It has the opportunity to kill six, so it has the opportunity to kill you instantly. So it has to be set up, has to be supported, has to be communicated, and has to be timed well. It's not just an initiation ultimate. Likewise, the High Noon and Death Blossom, Barrage thrives when the enemy team don't have many cooldowns or stuns to stop your ultimates, which is typically in the mid fights. Lastly, a niche but still useful use of Barrage is to win duels with it on flanks. For instance, on Route 66 third point attack, you could concuss into Barrage when dueling a hitscan who wants to use the high grounds. Since you are stationary and vulnerable to burst damage like a soldier helix, I recommend doing this when those kind of abilities have already been used, or when you have a multi pocket, Diva DM, or Zarya bubble. Moving on to the positional, playstyle, and compositional section of the guides. In terms of general positioning, there's four key guidelines which I'll showcase on Lijan Control Center. The first is to have cover, which I've already covered, no pun intended, but here, the small piece of high grounds not only gives you cover, but can also act as your helipad, as discussed prior. The second guideline is to have LOS onto the enemy team. In this example, you have really nice and tight sightlines onto any squishies who may rotate into white room. The third guideline is to have good distance from angles, so that an enemy flanker can't sneak up on you, whilst also being close enough, so that you can quickly dive or pressure a hitscan up close. The fourth guideline is to have aggressive rotational options. This is what allows you to go in for those aggressive assassinations with that concussion blast, as I'll talk about now. With the overall playstyle of Farah, it boils down to either spamming congested areas or taking those aggressive duels, as Bolo explains here. Farah, it's all about knowing when you want to be spamming a choke or spamming an area that's really, really, really nasty from an angle, or when you're gonna go pursuing duels. This is specifically pharmacy. If there's a really, really nasty choke that I can be punishing and, and tanks that I can be abusing and squishies and things like that, great. But as soon as there's no longer a really strong choke or there's not a lot of people in the choke, you need to actively be pursuing duels. Pharmacy can kill anything in the game, just about. Tracer just flanked your backline, spam choke. There's a Zenyatta on an angle, spam choke, spam shield. You're a very mobile hero, especially considering the speed changes with her, the conk changes with her. You have so much more flexibility with what and where you can be. Like I said, just look at Yazin, look at how he plays Farah. Not just a spam hero, he's actually playing a duelist slash flanker style. That's how Farah has to be played. Applying this to Brawl, if you are really, really, really keen in playing Farah with the Lucio Bap or Lucio Moira, your input will have to be very surgical and akin to the flanker or duelist playstyle, because you're not going to get any healing, to be frank. This means that every engage you take has to be well-timed, and you cannot afford to take any chip damage, making things like corner discipline even more important. When playing against Brawl, without a Lucio Bap or Lucio Moira, spamming those congested areas from angles is likely the best play. For instance, on Oasis City Center, using the central piece of cover on point to spam from afar and soften up the enemy Brawl team, then diving once the enemy backline becomes vulnerable is likely the best play. Notice how both player styles there are intertwined. In Poke, playing for duels is likely your move. For instance, on Blizzard World first point attack, you could concuss yourself over the Hay rooftop and assassinate the enemy hitscan. Now, when playing a harder poke composition like a Zen Bap up against the dive comp, spamming the enemy team's core with the aid of your heal orb is vital in order to prevent their dive. You want to make sure that their Doomfist, Winston or Wrecking Ball has a tough time before they even dive in the first place. Now playing with dive, that's going to mainly revolve around your duelist playstyle. You need to be getting on top of those squishy heroes and two-tapping them, using cover and concussion blast to help you do so. One thing I haven't really talked about is your synergy with Mercy, who can really help you not only spam out a group of enemies, but make you one of the most lethal duelists in the game. If you have a Mercy and you have some communication, try and tell your Mercy to get them to tell you when they stop pocketing. This is to help tone your aggression as you may not want to do a certain play without a pocket and vice versa. If you can't communicate for some reason, then just try your best to keep track of when your Mercy leaves you. Well that's it for the guys. This is the best way to play Reaper in Overwatch 2. Just like in Overwatch 1, Reaper has two main playstyles, a frontline tanker buster or a backline flanker. As the teamfight progresses, you'll have to make decisions on which playstyle to go for and they could swap on a whim. Your cooldown cycles are also quite basic, either walking or teleporting in, pressuring with your shotguns, then wraithing out. Look for short sightline flanks and rotations to make, flank and pressure from where your team are fighting from, and the greedier your blossom is, the later it has to be timed. Reaper's gun, I don't even reload Lamau. Makes Reaper dual wield shotguns dealing 108 damage per shot, with fall off starting at 10 meters, allowing Reaper to deal up to 216 DPS in the perfect circumstances. 
A big concept with Reaper's shotguns is range and target priority. Regardless of which playstyle you're doing, which is either frontlining against the enemy tanks or flanking and assassinating squishies, you don't need to be upfront taking unnecessary damage, and in fact, you ought to be playing a little bit of distance to prevent any damage from getting onto you. But the biggest concept is the fact that because you're further away, you don't take melee damage, and you can like play corners more, you can play more with your tanks a bit behind, so you take less poke and melee damage, which means, guess what, your rate is forced less. And because your rate is forced less, you can stay in fights longer, hence you can do more damage. In terms of target priority, just like with any hero, it depends upon how easy they are to kill and how dangerous they are. This does tie a lot into your playstyle, because if you want to flank and their backline aren't really easy to kill, you're not going to really be targeting backline a lot. But as the fight progresses, your target priority can and should switch, as I'll talk about later on. The penultimate piece of advice is trigger discipline. I like to Hog and Tracer, who also focus on landing their shots in close range, taking the extra half a second or so to realign your crosshair will help you land more meaningful damage. Not to mention, if you're flanking behind the enemy team and you're unscouted, landing the first shot is critical as it's basically free damage that you're missing out on if you end up missing your shots. The last thing to mention is the corner abuser's reaper, especially when holding short sightlines. Too many reapers tunnel on the target they're shooting and do the platinum habit of walking forwards and abandoning cover. Keep in mind, you can still land respectable damage from a few meters away, whilst conserving your HP with smart cover usage. Reaper's first ability, the Devil's Advocate V2, makes Reaper become an invincible shadow for 3 seconds, moving 50% faster, paired with an 8 second cooldown. All status effects are cleansed, and your guns are reloaded. The general rhythm or cooldown cycle of Reaper is very simple. Just like Arisa and Mei, you're reliant on your cooldowns to be aggressive. In Reaper's case, you either walk forward or flank behind, apply pressure with your shotguns, and use Wraith to escape back to your team. And from there on, you just rinse and repeat. All meaning that the main use of your Wraith is going to be defensive. You really don't want to use your Wraith loosely, being careless about where you end up with your Wraith. Use corners and tone your aggression when your Wraith is forced. I can live with your Wraith being forced, but you better not finish your Wraith where you started, which is exactly what you did. If you felt the need to Wraith, your positioning was such that you're taking damage. You can't just go, I'm Wraithing for invulnerability and to get healed a little bit. You've got to go, okay, I'm going to end up over here, where I've got a little bit or a better cover, a little bit more work to do. Or you could potentially go, hey, I'm going to try to end up here and just delete this in and then enforce this. Like, these are all options. I don't want you just Wraithing and ending up right where you started. Like, you're, you're Wraithing is a changing of your aggression level. And if your Wraith is getting forced and you feel the need of, no, I'm in a plenty safe spot, well, you weren't in an aggressive enough spot to start then when you had Wraith. The penultimate thing to mention is to know when to cancel your Wraith. You may want to cancel it slightly earlier in the duel, either to dodge stuns, reload your clip, or to catch the enemy off guard. Just be intentional with using it in this manner, making sure it's not too risky to do. You might also want to think about where you finish your Wraith, instead of always Wraithing back to your team. For instance, on King's Row first point defense, you might duel a squishy by the statue, and then use Wraith to escape back to the Mega, and set up an off-angle engage. In this example, you're still toning your aggression with your Wraith, because you're playing more passive to get your HP back. But in this scenario, you end up re-engaging from the angle to make your cycles more effective. I will say though that this advice can be dangerous when doing this against mobile comps like D.Va, Tracer, Lucio. If you don't wait back to your team against that kind of comp, you'll just get mocked down and hunted when you're isolated like this. So I only really recommend doing this against comps with less mobility. Reaper's second ability, the Spooky Boy, makes Reaper disappear and reappear at a location of up to 35 meters in distance, with a cast time of 1.5 seconds and a cooldown of 10 seconds. It can also be used in the air, reducing Reaper's full speed. Since Reaper's teleport is very synonymous with flanking, which is one of his two main playstyles which I'll talk about at the end of the video, I'll introduce the more basic concepts here. The most key aspect of Reaper's teleport is timing. The most common mistake is teleporting too early, which means the enemy team forces you out for free, effectively making the team fight a 4v5. His temporal giving an example of that here, where the positioning of the teleport was actually good, but it's completely mistimed. You teleported in when you were down two. Of course they saw you teleport in, and they had resources to come chase you out because they were up to. Then you're using your wraith to get out. Your wraith doesn't actually get you far enough out because of the depth that you're in. And then you're missing both of your cooldowns when they actually 
actually make their play. You staggered yourself, you dragged your team into basically a team wipe when your team was going to get out cleanly. This is this is not okay. Additionally, a very obvious tip is to not teleport in front of enemies, or at least teleporting when they're not focused on you. I believe there's a few frames at the end of your teleport animation where someone like a Widow or a Hanzo can still headshot you, so if you're going to do a greedy or aggressive teleport, they have to be timed later into the team fight when attention is elsewhere, and they have to be in positions ideally with cover. Reaper's ultimate, the B-Tech Beyblade, <laughs> makes Reaper empty both of his shotguns at breakneck speed, dealing 170 DPS in an 8 meter radius for 3 seconds. Your shotguns are also automatically reloaded. The first bit of important tech is the shotgun animation cancel before you blossom in order to gain that extra bit of burst damage, just like how on Farah, you shoot a rocket just before you barrage. The most important aspect to your Blossom, which will determine how much value you get from it, is your timing. The matter of a few seconds can decide whether your Blossom gets a 4k, or you get caught in 4k, feeding your brains out. The greedier, more dangerous, and more aggressive your Blossom, the later it needs to be timed. The timing of your ultimate is so incredibly crucial. I don't like opening with Reaper ult, I like waiting until things get a little messy. Reaper ult is so easy to counter with cooldowns, but is so hard to counter without them. Like, you can go down the list, Winston bubble, Matrix, Zarya bubble. Every hero, like, in the game has a cooldown to deal with Reaper ult. In mid-fight, when some of those cooldowns are abused, Reaper ult is just oppressive, man. Like, how many times have you guys been like, oh, the fight's won, and the Reaper just goes, die, die, and you're like, I, I guess I die. And that's because it's this mid-fight when an engagement is happening, not ahead of the team, but mid-fight, it is an oppressive ult. I also want to quickly cover using Wraith in conjunction with your Blossom to dodge those key cooldowns that can stop your Blossom. So say you're on Rook 66 third point attack, and you're fighting over Loi, probably the most important piece of map control on this section of the map. If you're fighting a Cassidy Mercy, and that Cassidy throws his nade onto you, you could Wraith, then Blossom straight after, catching both the Mercy and Cassidy. By blossoming two targets, you also get that passive regen health too. The same thing could be applied if you're fighting an Honor, where you use your Wraith form to dodge a sleep and or nade, and then you blossom afterwards. Now onto the positioning, playstyle, and composition section. Normally in these guides, I cover positioning first, then the playstyle, but because Reaper is a very simple character to understand in terms of what he can do, I'll start off with the playstyle first. As mentioned throughout, there are two main playstyles, flanking or frontlining. Here's Sparlo doing a brief overview of those two concepts. Do I play frontline? Do I, can I just put out spam damage? I don't need to worry about it. Or should I be playing flanker to bait more attention towards me? With Reaper, the big thing is like the play style stuff. Like you play Reaper where you can flank with short sight lines to put out a lot of pressure and obviously time it really well. It's very similar to Tracer. He's just a little less flexible with how he does it. Now, Spoiler mentioned taking short sight line flanks in that clip, which is something I'll bring up again with the positioning stuff. So try and remember that bit for now. Anyways, let's start with the four rules of positioning that I always state in these guides. First rule is cover or corner. You don't want to get your Wraith Force start for being sloppy and lazy with your corner discipline. Second rule is line of sight. For Reaper, this is useful as it gives you information on whether you should flank, who you should flank if you decide to, and when you should flank in relation to where your team are playing. Third rule is distance from angles, so you don't get snuck upon by a flanker. And the last and arguably most important rule is rotations. This is what allows you to go for those flanks in the first place, and maybe it's just taking a short sight and off angle, or maybe it's going for a deep teleport in the back line. And whether you frontline or not can change as the fight progresses. Is it better to go with your Reinhardt here, or is it better to flank here? I don't know, because this flank is not particularly short range. Do you see this? So you would be praying mm -hmm. that nobody peeks this corner and forces your rate. So I think what you do here is fine, but this is an example of where you have to make that split second decision over and over and over and over and over again. But then like right here, what's better? To play this corner? Is it better to TP up to top and to go from behind? You see what I'm saying? Sometimes the answer's not so clear. So I wanted to interject here when Spalo says the answer isn't so clear, because I think it is. Now I've mentioned throughout that the more aggressive or greedy a play is, the later it needs to be timed, and flanking on the high ground is a greedy play. And since in this example, we're pretty late into the team fight as our Ryan's about to die, it's a lot more valuable going for that flank now, because nobody's going to be expecting it when all the attention is on the Ryan. You could even teleport on the back piece of the high ground and completely catch them off guard. So I think a general rule of thumb, especially against those comps you can't really flank against, is the front line initially, and then when the fight starts to devolve and attention is being split, you flank afterwards. Now the last thing I want to touch on is the compositional matchups, and again, they always refer back to the front line versus flanker dichotomy. If the enemy backline is killable, immobile, and easy to get on top of, then the flanker playstyle is more appropriate. Think of playing against Bap Zen or Zen Mercy. But if the enemy backline is more mobile, and they can often speed past or completely ignore your flank, then pressuring the enemy tank up close with short sightlines then becomes the play. 
Think of doing this against like a Lucio Kiriko. Would you say it's better to like TP straight into the back with like, like a bubble and just try and assassinate <sighs> their support and then go up with Wraith or like... Very simple answer. TP. Look at their backline. Is the bubble Reaper going to wreck a Batiste? Yeah. Uh, force out yeah, 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 you're, you're going to cause issues, okay? They're on Kiriko, Lucio, Reaper Tracer. Are you going to wreck their backline then? No, so then all of a sudden your playstyle changes. Are they squishy, immobile heroes? Then then yes, you should be TPing and, and hiding and flanking and doing like cheese reaper strats. If they don't, if they're just like highly mobile, a lot of defensive cooldowns, then it comes down to like, you saw the Reaper Sojourn comp with the Winston and, and Overwatch League Grand Finals, right? So then it just was coming down to like which team can take better cooldown trades. And the better cooldown trade for you is going to be shooting the enemy Reaper, forcing his cooldowns, forcing the enemy Zarya's cooldowns, then it will be just shooting the back because it's too easy to deal with the Reaper flank. Now, what if you're playing Reaper against a comp that you hate frontlining and flanking into? What if you're playing Reaper into Orisa or Diva, Cass and Torb, and any mixture of Brig, Ana or Lucio? Well, my initial instinct is to obviously tell you to swap off, but if you're really keen on playing into that comp, the advice I gave prior about frontlining first, then flanking later, would be applicable here. Maybe you begin the fight pressuring the enemy Torb and Casti from short off angles, and then later into the fight, you could look to teleport into a support or utilize a flank. Maybe in the mid fight, the Brick decides to push with the Cassidy, giving you an opportunity to go in the enemy honor. But for the most part, your life would be easier if you just swapped. And that's it for the guides. No intro since I don't want to waste your time, straight onto the guides. If there's one thing you take away from this video, it's this fundamental concept of Sojourn. Explosive angled pressure. Utilize your power slide to quickly enter flanks and abuse your vertical mobility as much as possible to end up on high grounds, alongside utilizing your disruptor shot and roll gun and jewels. In the wise words of Spylo, assistant coach for Overwatch League Team London Spitfire, Sojourn's major advantage over our counterparts, such as Soldier, is her rail gun and vertical mobility. Speaking of Spylo, I have I've sent him an early version of the Sojourn Guide so that I can make some early changes so you guys get the best possible Sojourn Guide that will trump other YouTubers. Anyways, on to the weapon. Sojourn's weapon, the Realme Gun, make Sojourn fire projectile bullets that give the gun energy and allow Sojourn to fire a rail gun that deals 130 damage on body shot with full charge. Each bullet that you land on the body will give you 5 energy, giving you 10 energy if you land headshots. Let's start off with breakpoints. As shown by the swanky graphics by Stylosa in the background, you only need to charge up to 65 energy to be able to one shot body shot a 200 HP squishy hero. This means that by doing some math, Sojourn's weapon does roughly 9 bullet points of damage and by the power of editing and looking through frames, Sojourn's fire rate is 800 RPM. This means that Sojourn deals 120 DPS. For comparison, Soldier has a slower fire rate but higher damage, dealing 180 DPS, 50% higher than Sojourn. Sombra has a faster fire rate but lower damage, dealing 160 DPS. This might seem low for Sojourn, but in reality, when combined with your railgun shot which is burst damage, alongside your other abilities, this tends to balance out her weaker primary fire. A key tenant with Sojourn's weapon is to decide what sight lines to play, which depends upon the composition you're running and what the enemy team are running. Generally speaking, even up against your hitscan counterparts, such as Soldier, you typically want to maintain mid-range sightlines, maybe slightly shorter, in order to land your projectile shots, and especially up against snipers who will completely outrange you. Here's assistant coach for the San Francisco Shock, Kazores, going into more detail about Soldier and sightlines. To make it easier to hit, just make sure you're playing in those medium to close ranges on her. Playing in these close ranges will make it so much easier to beam down your targets. She's good at dueling flankers and taking these small off angles, so don't be afraid to go quite close to the enemy, but make sure you have a way to back out. But if you play in those close ranges, her left click will feel infinitely better. To add more depth, I'll give another visual instance on a different map. For example, on Havana first point attack, trying to play indoor areas where the sniper has no sightline, or using power side to path and get closer to the enemy sniper, which I'll get onto later, will be the most optimal way to get value out of your weapon. Alternatively, because you have no fall off, against compositions that you outrange, look to maintain slightly longer sightlines, as Spalo explains here with the example of Cassidy. If you're going to take this angle here, why are you pressing W? Why did you go from nice corner, nice angle here, to I'm on top of point? Maintain the sightline and that's all you need to do. You outrange this comp heavily outside of Zenyatta and random Faro rockets. There is no reason for you to go, I'm going to close the distance against these guys. 
whatsoever, especially with the Diva on the field. I'll go more in depth on Sojourn's overall playstyle in the latter sections of the video. With your secondary fire railgun, think of it as a buffed version of Soldier's Helix Rocket. You deal more damage, it's hit scan, there's no cooldown aside from shooting to charge it, and it can headshot. As a result, think about charging your railgun by shooting tanks or shields, then looking to force a duel onto a DPS player, making them 70 HP before the duel even begins, or even straight up one shotting them. A key thing Spyro mentioned to me was that railgun was very important in taking duels, which makes sense considering your primary fire is in greats. For example, on Route 66 third point attack, charge your railgun when you're busy closing distance, then take the flank by the lorry, looking to beam someone with your railgun from high ground, or if someone is already there, you would beam them obviously. As a result, you win this area of the map, giving your team map control, simply allowing you to continue to shoot from high ground on a different angle to your team. Please abuse how easy railgun is to charge and how much damage it deals before it likely gets nerfed. It seems to be a very powerful dual tool if you can aim, so abusing this use of railgun, as with the example I just described, will give you immense value. Before I end off this section, Hiskasaur is giving similar advice alongside some visual examples in the background. Make sure you try to charge this by hitting tanks, and if you charge it up all the way and you go in the enemy backline, you can try to one shot a squishy DPS or a healer. So make sure you're sitting back, shooting a tank, and then with Sojourn's good mobility, get in there and try to find the one shot. Once you get the hang of it, it can be extremely strong. Just to clarify and develop Kasora's ideas, just be careful of power sliding straight into backline squishies unless your comp is built for inting, such as Brawl Dive or Talon Dive, which I will elaborate on in the composition section. But generally speaking, the risk, especially at higher ranks, just isn't worth the reward of getting that kill as you'll be left with no mobility tool, the entire enemy team will be looking at you, you might not have cover, and you might not even hit the shot in the first place. Soldier's first ability, slide in into your DMs. Mix Soldier perform a ground slide that can be cancelled into a decently high vertical jump with a 7 second cooldown. Power slide is key to the fundamental of Soldier applying rapid, explosive pressure in the mid fight. Power slide essentially gives Soldier comparable mobility of a flanker such as Genji with his dash or Winston with his leap, but unlike those flankers, Soldier can play longer ranges comparable to a soldier, which is probably why Spyro says that Soldier is just a different soldier, a more aggressive burst one at that. However, unlike Soldier, a key fundamental to Soldier is the vertical mobility behind a power slide, allowing you to reach places Soldier can't, or even if he can reach them, it'll take him a year to do so. So, what are some good examples of flanks Soldier can use power slide for? Well, the best flank often allow Sojourn to reach high ground or at least a good angle with cover at the end. For example, on Route 66 first point attack, you could slide through the cave and finish off with a vertical jump onto gas station. From here, you could have to pressure their team by the corner if they're holding close, even using the stop the shots, or more likely, you'll look to pressure the supports. Whilst obvious to state, please time this flank with when either team engages, considering that plays like these are very aggressive to make and it's very easy to feed. I'll blitz through a handful more examples because this concept is super important and fundamental to how Sojourn is played. On Jonkatan first point defense, you slide through the room with the mega and jump onto the back high ground, pincering the enemy team from behind. Again, make sure the timing is on point. On King's Row first point defense, slide through hotel when the enemy team pushes, finishing by the statue or cancelling your slide early to use the hotel as cover. On Ilios ruins, you can slide and jump across the catwalk or quickly rotate to coast. The choice is yours. And hopefully by now, you're seeing how Soldier's burst mobility allows her to take lethal angles more quickly than a soldier can. The last example I'll use will be on Havana third point attack or defense. You can look to power slide up onto the high ground and again, take an angle that a hero like Soldier just can't do in the same amount of time. For defensive uses to power slide, I initially theorized that you won't need it as much in Overwatch 2 considering there's less players on the field to contest your angles. But Spolo mentioned to me that a slide cooldown feels longer than it actually is and how you need it more defensively than you think. He mentioned that he liked using it aggressively to take an angle, and then using it defensively wherever possible, since shifting forward only works if your team is baiting aggressive attention, or you have a pocket, or if the enemy team simply can't reach that high ground. Soldier's second ability, Citron's EMP from Plants vs Zombies, is a burst of energy that snares and deals up to 200 damage if stood in the roughly 3.5 second duration of that ability. It also has a sizable 15 second cooldown. Because of how versatile the swap the shot is, I've managed to distill it down into the acronym DUCKS, which I'll go through with visual examples. Spyro did mention that the DUCKS acronym was too long, but I've decided to keep it in because DUCKS, you know but I have shortened the less important sections. The D stands for dueling. Due to the damage and slow of the swap the shot, in conjunction with your burst mobility in your power slide and your burst damage,
damage on your railgun, the Sop the Shot can be a powerful tool for winning duels on key flanks. Referring back to that Vuk 66 example by the lorry, power sliding first whilst you're shooting, then jumping up to fire your Sop the Shot can help make tracking your shots easier, and also landing that railgun damage as follow up. If you're wondering about whether to use power slide first or use your Sop the Shot first, don't worry about it too much as both of their ups and downs. For most players, I would recommend power sliding first to keep up the fluidity of your gameplay. The U stands for ultimates. Essentially, combo your Desopter shot with ultimates such as Sigma's Flux, Tracer's Pulse Bomb, or even Arisa's new Terra Lance to allow her to land that full 250 damage. The C stands for chokes, probably the most conventional case used for Desopter shot. For example, on Hanamura first point defense, firing your Desopter shot when the enemy team start to walk through the choke would be a great way for your team to capitalize and punish whoever walks through. However, referring back to the D in the acronym, if the enemy team aren't really utilising the choke and are playing a bit more split, you'd probably want to use the swap the shot on duels on flanks and areas around the choke instead, with the window on Hanamura being an example. The K stands for kiting. Essentially, if you're playing Sojourn in a more static comp that wants to play at range and is a bit more mobile, you can fire your swap the shot to kite backwards. Kiting is just a synonym for retreating. For example, on Route 66 first point defence, if your team get dove by the gas station, you fire your swap the shot to kite back. And finally, the S stands for supports. This is by far the most aggressive use of the swap the shot and will likely be one of the most common. Referring back to those power slide examples, of which I'll use Route 66 for now, they will be at the perfect angle to get a juicy to swap the shot onto their backline to deal some serious damage. Before I end off, do make sure that you properly use the swap the shot as it is on a lengthy 15 second cooldown. Sojourn's ultimate, broken as shit, make Sojourn auto charge her railgun with her shots piercing enemies this time. According to Stylosa, 7 fully charged shots deal 910 damage and 11 shots at 61 charge deal 780 damage. That's a lot of damage! Do be aware that these shots do not pierce through shields. I won't keep this long since our ultimate is pretty simple, but think of it as a buffed primary fire used in the same way Soldier will use Tactical Visor. Use it to enhance the lethality of your flanks, of which I've shown multiple options prior, but unlike Tactical Visor, Soldier's ultimate actually requires mechanics to use and there is the possibility that you do end up missing the majority of your shots. In order to resolve this, have trigger discipline. Don't spam your shots as soon as they gain a decent amount of charge. Take half a second to readjust your crosshair when firing your normal primary fire to then land that railgun shot. Better players won't have to do this, but it is a surefire way in at least guaranteeing some value out of your ultimate if your aim isn't great. As a side note, don't bother sitting main trying to pierce the enemy team. It's likely that they will have a shield, and even if they don't, sitting main praying that you land some pierce shots just means that you're shooting from one angle with your team, it's just not worth it. Now moving on to positioning with Sojourn. Anyone who's been a long time viewer of mine would know about the four rules I've often put in my guides, taken from Coach Nata. Cover, lines of sights or LOS, distance from angles, and aggressive or defensive rotational options. To explain this, I will again refer to some of the power side angles I've mentioned before, and since I've used this map a lot already, let's go back to that Route 66 example. You have the gas station sign as cover, or the high ground itself. With LOS, you have plenty of it, being able to see the enemy supports or anyone past the first corner. With distance from angles, this just means how far you are away from being flanked or attacked, and as it seems, you have a decent amount of distance to escape from danger. With rotational options, you're essentially looking for any route that can make you play more aggressive, or any route that can make you play more defensively. In this case, you can drop off the high ground and still hold an aggressive angle on the gas station, or you can drop off and retreat back to the cave, or grab the mega underneath the gas station. Finally, to round off this video, compositions and playstyles. As a precursor, I know that compositions, such as Double Shield, are now dead in Overwatch 2, but the general playstyle of playing from distance, utilising ranged poke, with heroes like Zen, Mercy, Ash, Hanzo, Widow and Sigma, still does exist. With that being said, let's start off with Sojourn in more poker based comps. As mentioned prior, with the Swap the Shot, use it to kite from close range encounters, especially against dive compositions. Speaking of going against dive compositions, with Sojourn, similar to our more static DPS counterparts, you want to balance between stacking main and having no angle at all, and fully isolating yourself on a hard off angle, as Spalo explains here, with a clip on Basan I've used about a thousand times. You don't want to position on top of the team because it allows the enemy team to be able to dive you without taking damage because there's only one LOS where you're actually putting damage. They can hide from this damage in here, they can hide from the damage here, they can hide from the damage here, they can hide from the damage here. Whereas if you position just slightly here, not too much, where you can still be harmony orb, armor pack, you can poke 
this pre-jump, this pre-jump, this pre-jump, this no longer has cover, this no longer has cover, this has significantly less cover, this has significantly less cover, and you can even peek down this hallway a little bit easier. Dive wants to corral you. Stacking against dive is not the answer. It is being in positions where you can peel for each other, but you can poke out dive before the fight happens. So you don't want to be isolated, but you don't want to be stacked. Note that you can be more aggressive than how the Cassidy was playing, due to your increased mobility, and that in Overwatch 2, there will be less heroes to contest your angles. Referring back to Sojourn's high burst mobility in her slide, you can straight away play more aggressively after that dive has happened. When playing with dive or poke dive compositions, look to get a good angle onto where your one tank will be engaging onto. This area is typically called a kill box. For example, on Temple of Anubis second point defense, you might see a lot of teams try and rotate into cave, which is where your kill box will be. Say you're playing a dive tank, such as Ball, Doomfist or Winston, who will try and engage onto that kill box. That is when you want to follow up. You could power slide through main and fire your railgun and disrupt the swap -to shot onto that kill box, potentially landing a kill. When playing with brawl or brawl dive compositions, you'll want to rotate as a team to close the distance to allow a rush onto the enemy team or just force the objective to then close the distance. His Temporal, a professional Overwatch coach, detailing how the composition works on Ilios Lighthouse, explaining Sojourn's role in the comp. We'll take cover to minimize poke because our only real source of poke tool ourselves would be Sojourn. Sojourn has a hit scan weapon with some range to it, the railgun. She's gonna have some poke. No one else has meaningful poke. It's still gonna be extra important to go, hey, let's use natural cover to force the opponents to rotate in such a way that they can threaten angles on us, that they can shoot around the cover those sorts of things and let's use objective pressure to make them spread out in such a way where hey they want to go like this to get angles and now you've given us someone we can run over being the sigma in this example and what you're looking at for this dive is some pretty good tools your sojourn can do her power slide to go in and then pop up and shoot some shots and there's not going to be a winston bubble like there historically would have been in the mirror for her to go for some of those nice headshots for her to throw down a slow that would slow the mirror or slow whoever you're trying to pounce on well that's it for the video Yo. This is the best way to play Soldier in Overwatch 2. Soldier is played for sprint and consistent output and damage thanks to its biotic field. I've always described Soldier as a hybrid between the traditional static hit scans like Cassidy and Ash and the flankers like Tracer and Sombra. Your sprint gives you the mobility to take deeper angles that heroes like Cassidy just can't take, with your biotic field allowing you to stay on that angle for longer. Keep your range against heroes like Soldier and Cassidy, be disciplined with your corner usage, and track to the best of your ability. Soldier's weapon, the slowest firing hit scan gun. Make Soldier fire his rifle at 540 rounds per minute, dealing 18 damage per shot with 30 ammo and a bit of recoil. Your DPS is also decently high at 162, compared to Sojourn whose DPS is 126, Ash's DPS at 150, and Cassidy's DPS at 140. The most fundamental concept with Soldier is to typically maintain longer sightlines against most heroes. The reason for this is that your contemporaries often have big, consistent bursts of damage up close that you really just don't have. At close range, you lose to Cassidy due to his magnate, and you also lose to a Sojourn sliding at you with a fully charged drill gun for similar reasons. Hence why you need to be keeping a distance of at least 20 meters against those kind of heroes. Not to mention, Soldier got a notable recall buff recently, allowing him to fight at longer ranges compared to Sojourn, who got a spread enough to a railgun, limiting her range options. Here's a good example of what I mean on Pareso. If you aggress to try and get a deeper angle, your sightline is just too short that a Cassidy can just roll in with his magnate and kill you. Heroes like Soldier and Echo also have burst mobility options to escape these kind of scenarios too, but your sprint on Soldier isn't burst mobility unfortunately. Now against snipers, you want to maintain shorter sightlines, typically paired along with surgical angles, as I myself explained here from about two years ago. Especially against Widowmaker, he just has to play shorter sightlines and play like a flanker. And because you've got sprint, that's what's going to happen. But even, even if you stack down main, this is still a relatively long sightline for Widow to play. This is still relatively relatively long sightlines for Widowmaker to play over here. And also, because you're not playing hard angles like this over here, you're going to be doing less damage. What sightlines do you have here? What damage are you putting onto core? You'd be putting more damage by playing in this uh, talk turquoise building over here than you would be with a matrix sucking down main. Here's another example on a Barney third point attack, where instead of playing long sight lines down main, you can flank around either to the left or right side, beaming down the enemy sniper. In my clip on Ivana, I did mention to play like Tracer 76, and I'll build on this more flanky playstyle in the latter section of the guides. On a mechanical level, trigger discipline, especially from longer ranges with the recoil change, is vital in terms of landing your shots and killing a squishy target in one clip, as Jane gives an example of here. Your trigger discipline. So you're, you're firing and you're not on target here. 
And then you kind of get on target, but then you fall off target and you keep firing. And you're kind of pulling a Texas sharpshooter. You're drawing his outline, more or less. Spraying for as long as you can, but as soon as your crosshair falls off the target, stop firing until you can get it back on. In order to help with tracking, trigger discipline, and recoil management, I highly recommend IO Stockton's aim trainer, JPYHG, of which I definitely do not have a cameo in whatsoever. Soldier's first ability, a basic human function, Make soldier move 50% faster. Thank you Overwatch devs, very creative. Starting off with a basic animation cancel, after firing a clip and needing to reload, soldier can cancel the latter end of his reload animation by sprinting as soon as the ammo gets loaded into his gun. With sprint usage on a broader level, you should mainly use sprint to rotate into more aggressive positions quickly as Jane details here. And you've got sprint, so you can actually do this. So there's this uh, tower itself and then the enemy after having traded and then your Reinhardt fed. So they're going here and then you were over here and then your team is moving in to meet them here. But if you, instead of kind of like meeting their attack here, push in behind them and like play a ring around the rosy, you pincer them. Their resources are going to be primarily focused in this direction and they are going to use this corner right here for their protection. The Zarya is going to use that to ping pong with her bubbles. Everyone else is going to be using this as cover. But if you remove this cover from the opponent by pincering them from behind, shit tons of damage, a burst damage, easy helix onto a support or something like that, they're dead. And if they turn around to try and push you, you've got sprint once again to reposition back to your team. Note that you should time these sprints just after your team engages. This is because the enemy team will be fully focused on your team's core, allowing you to get away with these surgical flanks as Jane just showed on Icon Walled. If you do these flanks too early, your angle's gonna get cleared and you'll likely die because, again, you haven't got any burst mobility, CC, consistent close range damage, or increased HP, all of which someone like a Cassidy has compared to you. With more straightforward uses, sprint should also be used to quickly kite from danger if you've lost the teamfight. However, one area of discussion is whether you should sprint away or stand your ground when you're getting dove. If you're getting jumped on by multiple heroes, it's typically better to sprint away as early as possible. However, if you're dueling heroes who you think you can out mechanic and or force their cooldowns, like against an Echo or a Tracer, that's when standing your ground with your biotic field can be a better alternative. A few shots or a helix onto a Tracer, Echo or Genji can seriously put a dent in how aggressive they can be. And on top of that, if you're getting help from a Lucio, Brig or Mercy, that's even more reason to stand your grounds. Soldier's second ability, the worst rockets in the game, make Soldier fire tiny rockets that deal 120 damage on direct hit and up to 80 splash damage. They have an explosion radius of 3 meters, move at 50 meters per second, and they're on a 6 second cooldown. Fortunately, Helix is one of the simplest abilities to use. Unfortunately, Helix is now kind of a worse version of Soldier's Railgun and Cassidy's Magnades. Maybe you guys in the comments can talk about whether that's power creep or not. Regardless, there's two main uses to Helix, either as an opener or as a finisher. Generally speaking, even when you're unscouted on an angle, it's better and more reliable to save Helix to finish off a target rather than to open with it. That's mainly because from range, you're just not going to hit a direct Helix on a moving target. However, his former pro player IDDQD going over some exceptions where you'd open with Helix. Against Sigma, it's usually better to engage with Helix first instead of using it as a finishing burst because of his kinetic grasp. Open up with a Helix if possible and you will need to land a couple more shots to confirm the kill. The absolute easiest way to kill an Ana is to engage her from the side while she's scoped in and not paying attention. Just to add one onto that, you can also open with Helix onto big hitboxes like Bastion because then you're more likely to not whiff the Helix. In most other cases though, just use it as a reliable finisher with the splash damage. There's also a third niche use which is for Helix jumps. You can perform some Helix jumps by using Helix at your feet, jumping and sprinting forwards. It functions very similarly to how you do so in Bastion with your own grenades. And you can see some examples of Helix jumps on King's Or alone. So, if you're a dedicated soldier main, I recommend going through some maps and custom games to find these spots which can be useful in order to set up some unexpected angles. Soldier's third ability, the stationary heal orb, make soldier plant a biotic field dealing 35 healing per second over 5 seconds in a 4.5 meter radius paired with a 15 second cooldown. The general rule of thumb with biotic field is to use it after you finish your first peak and head back into cover as you can see here. The main reason for this is that as soon as you peak an angle on full HP, enemies aren't going to be immediately shooting you, so some healing will go to waste. Of course, if you want to hard commit on this angle with visor, but you haven't got the time to place down your field, then you'd put it down as soon as you peak. 
you also want to plot on your heal station by a corner instead of doing it out in the open. The two reasons for doing this are admittedly very micro related, but it just encourages good corner discipline by not swinging out in the open, and it also gives you a tad more healing if you do decide to retreat from your angle. With broader uses, Biotic Field can also give you a slight edge in winning a duel, helping your team win map control. For example, on Route 66 second point attack, when fighting over the high ground coast side, with good corner discipline and management of sightlines, alongside your Biotic Field, you do have the tools to put this duel in your favour. Lastly, albeit niche, you may want to use your Biotic Field to gain ult charge from your teammates in between fights. Aside from that, there isn't much else to Soldier's Healing Station, just use it to extend how long you're on an angle for, that's pretty much it. Soldier's Ultimate, Aimbot. Make Soldier gain aimbot for 6 seconds. Thank you again Overwatch devs, very creative. Starting off with some tech, here's Jane going over 3 main animation cancels that you can weave all into one tack visor. You shoot an entire clip, and then as soon as you're empty, instead of waiting for the reload, you basically press healing station and visor at the same time, and you skip two animations. You skip the reload animation, and you skip the healing station animation. And then, we can take this one step further. So I'm at one bullet, and then I use the last second to reload, so as soon as I end visor, I've got a brand new clip. The fundamental use behind tack visor is to increase the lethality of your off-angle pressure whilst maintaining safety with long sight lines. For instance, on Dorado's second point attack, if your team decides to clear and fight for high grounds, you can pop visor to catch anyone on the adjacent high grounds. You can kind of use tack visor as well for map control purposes to zone space, almost like a Walmart high noon. For instance, on King's third point attack, you can zone the high ground with your attack visor, making any enemy DPS play passive. This can allow for your more mobile teammates to access and control the high grounds. Lastly, I feel like I shouldn't have to say this, but please don't use visor and grav. You deal less damage because you can't headshot, whilst also wasting an ultimate. So I don't actually know why I see people do this in my games. However, do feel free to visor when the enemy Mercy Valks, or when the enemy Farah uses her boosters. Any aggression by an aerial hero can quickly be punished with visor. Moving on to the positional, playstyle, and compositional section of the guides. In terms of positioning, there's four key guidelines which I'll show on the Barney third point attack. Firstly, have cover, as mentioned prior. Secondly, have line of sight, so you can actually see and shoot the enemy team. Thirdly, have good distance from angles, so that enemy flankers don't sneak up on you. This allows you to land early damage in before they engage. And fourthly, have rotation options, both aggressive and defensive. This is really the meat and potatoes of Soldier because it can provide you with an additional angle for when your team engages, allowing you to push up, or it can also give you a route of retreat if your team have lost the fight. And the reason why this is so important is that this is where your sprint comes in really useful, since you can rotate and reach these flanks faster than someone like a Cassidy. In more broadly comps, or comps that don't really have much range or mobility, you may want to take hard flanks that have long sight lines. On Li Jiang Tower Garden's retake, you may want to split into the white room whilst your team fights on bridge. This long sightline makes it particularly taxing for heroes like Lucio and their other DPS to mark you, which gives you some safety. If the Reinhardt does decide to pin all the way to you, that also creates some space for your own team to cross the bridge. In Dive, likewise to almost every other DPS, you want to find a balance between playing split and playing stacked. Here's a clip from Sparrow that I also used on my Cassidy guides. You don't want to position on top of the team because it allows the enemy team to be able to dive you without taking damage because there's only one LOS where you're actually putting damage. Like we could draw a straight line of where this damage is coming from and it's here. They can hide from this damage in here, they can hide from the damage here, they can hide from the damage here, they can hide from the damage here. Whereas if you position just slightly here, not too much where you can still be harmony orb, armor pack, you can poke this pre-jump, this pre-jump, this pre-jump, this no longer has cover, this no longer has cover, this has significantly less cover, this has significantly less cover, and you can even peek down this hallway a little bit easier. Dive wants to corral you. Stacking against dive is not the answer. It is being in positions where you can peel for each other, but you can poke out dive before the fight happens. So you don't want to be isolated, but you don't want to be Stack. Now, against poke, or just against comps that haven't got much mobility, but often outrange you, you need to be hard flanking, almost like a Tracer 76, as I explain here. Play like a Tracer. Play like a Sombra. Because against their composition, no one's gonna chase you. They had ball last round, right? They had ball, and they had far, maybe heroes that could chase you down if they get close enough. But right now, 
Rhino Resort is terrible against angles, they've got full down front of control, and you're going to do absolutely nothing if you stack down main and shoot shields. As soon as you see them walking out on this, and as soon as you see, okay, they haven't got a tracer, they haven't got a hog, they haven't got anyone that can dominate my short sight lines, I will definitely be half flanking and then playing, the sight lines don't really matter, it's just the, the ability to half flank and make sure you're not spamming down shields. And also, tying your half flanks with when your core pushes in. In short, if teams aren't running heroes like Tracer, Sombra, Genji or Ball, you have a lot more freedom to hard flank and utilize that sprint to your heart's content. If you are playing against those kind of comps, keep the range and take soft off angles. And that's it for the guides. This is the best way to play Sombra and Overwatch 2. Sombra is a mid-range flanker with three key things you need to keep in mind. When are you pressuring, where are you pressuring from, and who are you pressuring? In terms of when, you need to time your pressure with your team, and in terms of where it's from, it needs to be with cover, and usually with distance if you outrange your target. But that's the thing, who is actually the target that you'll be pressuring or hacking? In short, that comes down to range. Basically, if they outrange you, like a Widow, Ana, Zen, Ash, or Hanzo, that's who you're going to be focusing. But if they're running something like a Lucio, Moira, Reaper, Tracer, then you'll likely be farming their tank or their general team from range. Sombra's weapon, Lil Uzi Vert, makes Sombra shoot her SMG at 1200 rounds per minute, dealing 7.5 damage per shot with an ammo capacity of 60 rounds. Your normal DPS is 150, and if you're shooting a hacked target, it gets closer to 190. Just as a side note, so much of Sombra comes down to your general playstyle against a variety of different heroes, so these ability specific sections should be a bit shorter. The main usage of your Uzi will actually be trying to utilize the range as much as you can. Now again, this does dip into the playstyle section, but against comps you are at range, like a Winston, Lucio, Kiriko, you can even be standing as far as 20 meters away, poking down a tank with the majority of your shots landing. What is the enemy team running? Very important here. They're running short range dive. You outrange every single hero on this comp, so you need to abuse that. So let me put it this way. Your angle as Sombra is dependent on the enemy composition. You're gonna stand right here and you're gonna hold mouse one and monkey. If you hack monkey, how much pressure are you putting out right now? If you hack Zarya or shoot Zarya or hack Brig right now, what are they gonna do? Against very spam heavy comps, then your angle is less frontline-y because if a Hanzo wall climbs up here, you don't want to just sit here and hold mouse one here. That's when you'd rotate behind. You force the squishier glass canner long range heroes to turn around. That's where Sombra needs to angle. But the funny thing is, is against those compositions, against the sniper heavy compositions, would you be playing Sombra into those? No, what hero would you be playing? Probably Tracer because she's more self-sufficient and her damage threat is better. You don't need Sombra's range. Sombra's first ability, TF2 engine is teleporter. Mix Sombra toss out a beacon in which she can return to it at any time. It has a projectile speed of 25 meters per second and a six second cooldown. The biggest and most obvious problem with Sombra's translocator is that players often don't know how or where to place it. The key thing with translocator is to put it in a position where it's safe, but also active. When I say active, I mean that once you translocate, you're not going to be out the fight for 5 plus seconds. You're still going to be actively contributing to the fight as soon as you translocate. Here's Jane giving and explaining an example of translocator placement on a poor shrine. So A, I put it kind of like on my side of the point. B, I put it on the high ground or C, I put it right on the health pack. So the thing is, if you place it on the translocator, right? So if we hack this and we place the actual translocator, and we can fight, we can fight, we can fight, we can fight. Suddenly we get attacked or something like this. If we translocate, we are out of the fight. If you place your translocator here, and you're fighting, you're fighting, you're fighting, suddenly you get married, you're out of the fight. So what you want to be doing instead is giving yourself options. So if your translocator is on a statue like this, you're fighting, 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 or you drop to the health pack if you need it. Give yourself options. Building on this idea further, here's Bono talking about how you don't want the enemies to have line of sight onto your translocator, for admittedly obvious reasons. If you're gonna throw your translocator late, is at least have the dignity to throw it up here to where it's not as easy for the Sombra or Lucy to break it. Because if you're placing it in a sight line where they can see it from me and they can break it from me, so they don't even need to send the Sombra to go break your translocator. They could just lose their sins one volley, your translocator is broken, and then you're screwed. Referring back to Jane's Nepal example, the one by the elephant could be seen, whereas the one closer to his spawn would stay out of LOS. 
so if you think you could get away with it by putting it by the elephants, it still isn't a bad idea. Here's another example on Icon Ward First with four different translocators. A, B, C and D are probably the best options because they're safe and hidden whilst also being active in that it won't take you very long to get back into the fights. Just make sure that with C, you're not placing it in the building itself, otherwise it could be seen by attackers pushing that building. With the option E though, it is an open space, meaning that it's not safe and you're very far away from the team fights. So in short, just don't toss your translocator out in the open and don't toss it too far away from the actual fights. Aside from that, there's times where you want to use translocator aggressively in order to reach high grounds or even set up your ENP. Just don't forget to set your translocator afterwards. Sombra's second ability, the BTEC Spy Cloak, makes Sombra turn invisible with a movement speed buff of 50% alongside a potentially infinite duration. The cooldown is 6 seconds and you can also hack from invis, but I'll talk about that more in the playstyle section. In terms of tech, hits Fitzy here explaining the invis cancel prior to ulting. When going for an EMP, is to use stealth, throw your translocator in, decloak, then translocate an EMP. This will get rid of the delay when you try to EMP after you translocate, and it will also play the voice line of decloaking at your original location instead of in the middle of the entire enemy line. In terms of usage, there's two main uses. The first is mobility, and the second is scouting. Dealing with the former, use the added speed buff from Invis to perform rollouts and to move into position quicker, either to farm a tank or to get behind for an assassination. With scouting, you typically want to scout heroes and the positions they're coming from. For example, on Li Jiang Night Market, you could see whether the enemy team would push high ground or whether they're pushing from somewhere underneath. Sombra's third ability, Hacker Man, Make Sombra temporarily disable all active and passive abilities from one enemy for 1.5 seconds, and she makes that target take 25% more damage from her specifically. Your hack also has a range of 15 meters, a cast time of 0.85 seconds, alongside a 4 second cooldown. I'll also couple in your passive too, which allows you to see enemies who have under 50% HP through walls. In terms of tech, similar to Mercy's Beam, there's a small grace period where your hat can extend beyond 15 meters. Nice to do if you need to keep the range. In terms of usage, there's two rudimentary uses of hack, both of which I'll elaborate on in the playstyle section. The first is the hack to farm ult charge. An example would be hacking a hog or a diva and farming them from range. They either have limited range or a lack of mobility, which makes them pretty decent ult batteries. The second type of hack is the hack for lethality. This is better suited for pouncing on a mobile and or isolated squishies. With your passive, the main way you will utilize this is by calling out enemies who are under half HP, as well as reassessing your target priority. That's basically it. Sombra's ultimate, Hackerman 2000, makes Sombra discharge electromagnetic energy in a 15 meter radius, taking 0.35 seconds to activate, lasting 5 seconds, applying the effects of hack to anyone caught in the EMP. Just like in Overwatch 1, the biggest and most important aspect of your EMP is the timing. This may look simple, but if both teams have a Sombra and they both have EMP, then, as you might guess, EMPing first can give you a large advantage and can diminish any follow-up that their counter EMP gets. Hi, I'm about to head out. Let's talk. Your job is to EMP enemies where your team can go and kill them. You were playing in a team environment, and you have managed to find a way to EMP two people in nearly inaccessible locations, instead of simply waiting for them to walk out and then EMP them. I get it, your team is like, they have EMP, we don't have B, we gotta go fast. But this is not the type of fast. If you want to hide on point and let them drop and then speed boost out from point and EMP them once they've dropped, fine. Whilst you can't eliminate basic shield HP anymore with EMP, you can still cancel things like coalescence, sound barrier or amplification matrix, so if you're being run on, EMP can quickly disable and cripple that engage. Moving on to the final section of this guide, positioning, playstyle and composition. Likewise to my reaper guide, I'll start off with the playstyle stuff first. Not because it's really simple, but for the opposite reason. I want to start off by going through an example on Oasis City Center, but don't focus on the map too much here, and focus more so on the heroes. Say you're playing Sombra against the Lucio Moira Ryan Tracer Ash. Here, you have a few options, and some are certainly better than others. And this refers back to the question I put at the start about who you target. The first option or placeholder that you have is to mirror or clear flankers. Mirroring just means matching or facing them, so here, if the tracer decides to flank onto your backline, you could clear her out by hacking her from invis. So why would you ever want to do this? 
Well, if your backline is very squishy, like an Ana Zen, you can help keep them alive. And generally speaking, an Ana Zen will get more value than a Lucio Moira due to their higher damage and utility. Not to mention, you might get Zornobs too, which can help you win out that duel against the Tracer. The second option is going for backline supports. This isn't really an option here, because both Lucio and Moira are slippery supports who, get this, don't have much range. And range is a super important factor here, because the third option is just farming down their tank from high grounds. And simply put, a Lucio and Moira just don't have the range to deal with you. You're not playing against an Ana Zen, who can discord you and mark you. In terms of range, you're in this weird middle ground, where you have more range than a Lucio and Moira, but less range than an Ana Zen or a Bap Zen. But here comes the fourth option with the Ash. Ash does have range, and if you stand on high ground farming their Ryan, the Ash does have enough range to toss a dynamite and potentially kill you, or at least force the translocate. As a result, your option here is to duel the Ash, potentially getting behind, landing a hack from Invis, and blitzing her down, which honestly is one of your best options here. So the way I'd play this out is to wait for the Ryan Lucio Moira to drop from high ground, and then to quickly assassinate the Ash, and afterwards I can just farm their Ryan from high ground. Or, if you're running a super squishy backline, you can just hunt down the enemy tracer, or whatever flanker it may be. It could even be a wrecking ball in this instance. Clearing flanks also includes people like Ash, or any other immobile hero, that for some reason decides to hard flank into you. Then, you can just pounce on them and win the duel, because obviously you win a duel up close against a hacked Ash from Invis. So, as you can see, what you do on Sombra is heavily dependent on what your team's running, and what the enemy team are running too. And it's not always going to be clear cut. But the key thing to apply to your game is to always ask yourself the question of range. Do the enemy DPS and supports outrange me to where I have to get up close and behind? Or do I outrange them to where I can just take a soft off angle and beam them from roughly 20 meters away? Of course, there's going to be exceptions to these guidelines, and there will be times where maybe you have EMP and you want to focus on that Moira who just wasted a heal orb. But these general guidelines should help you a lot. As the fight progresses, the situation changes. Enemies start exhausting their resources, your team starts finding openings against the enemy, or you might just have EMP ready. When that happens, that's when you might consider taking a more aggressive position and playing more greedily. Again, you do want to adapt your style depending on what the rest of the team is playing. If your team is playing a more brawly comp, you want to be playing almost like a dime store tracer, looking for dives with the rest of your team. But if your team's playing a more spammy comp, you want to help your team control the flanks and win duels. Try to punish anyone who is playing isolated from their team. You can still look for kills, but since your team is playing at longer ranges, you have to be more careful as it is easier for you to, to get forced out. Now, before I end things off, some quick notes on your timing and positioning, referring back to the two questions I put at the start of the guide about when you time your pressure and where you pressure from. With your positioning, you really want to make sure that you have at least some piece of cover in order to increase your uptime. In that Oasis example, the high ground there was my cover, decreasing the chances of my translocator getting forced. If I wasn't dead in the middle of the point where everyone can just shoot me in the open, where would you be then? Probably maybe further to the right in the room where I could use like the cover and then hack the Ana, kind of get out of vision. You can see the mini as well, you can use that to extend your phase as well. And lastly, your timing. When you're timing your pressure, whether it be either of those four options, it needs to be timed for when either team are engaging, so they get value off the attention that you're baiting. Timing wise, is this timing of this pressure good, would you say? Watch this again from her view of you. Yeah. Okay, perfect okay. timing. Perfect okay, timing. okay. How, how do you know? As soon as I forced them to look at me, my team was going in. Yes, and perfect. It gave it gave them room to kind of fuck with mm -hmm. whoever had to look at me, basically. Mm -hmm. Now, there will be times where I want you to go a little bit later, you to play second fiddle, you know what I'm saying? Like, maybe you can go, mm -hmm. like, let your Ryan get attention first, and then you go, go second. So maybe you were a tad early here, but the target priority and the position with which you were at was the problem, not your timing. And that's it for the guides. This is the best way to play Symmetra in Overwatch 2. Symmetra is a highly versatile Pokeball hero who, in matchups like a Reinhardt Mirror, can melt down the enemy tank by farming up her beam, whilst also having the flexibility, thanks to her teleports, to flank and split attention behind the enemy team. Depending on the comp and the map, look to either control enclosed spaces with your turrets, flank around and split focus, split focus in the mid fight with CP bombs, or set up more defensive turret traps to catch enemies off guard. Symmetra's weapon, the Microwave,
Mixometra emit a ranged beam dealing 60 DPS to 180, leveling up every 1 second. The beam decays from level 3 to level 2 in 2 seconds, and from level 2 to level 1 in 1.5. Her alternate fire makes her shoot an explosive energy ball that deals up to 90 direct damage with a 2 meter splash radius, taking 1 second to fully charge. Considering Sim doesn't do critical headshot damage, you should always be aiming for the torso or the legs, depending on where the hitbox is bigger. For most cases, that'll be the torso, but in cases like Tracer, you should try and aim for her legs, since the hitbox is bigger there. Symmetra's beam is one of those hit or miss weapons, where you'll either be able to consistently charge it to level 3, easily melting down the enemy tank, which will most commonly be done against Zion teams, or where you can charge your beam off shields, or you'll struggle getting much value at all, particularly against split compositions. However, your beam does have a limited range, so do be careful when chasing enemies who outrange you, and this is where your secondary fire can come into play. Your orbs should always be released on full charge, and they're actually quite easy to hit, as they have a much bigger hitbox than what is visually represented. Combine this with their high speed and some decent aim, and they're practically undodgeable and are really annoying to play against, especially when doing your TP bombs. Lastly, spam orbs in between fights and the start of them, since you'll charge your ultimate a decent bit from it. And who knows, maybe you might even get lucky and get a pick. Symmetra's first ability, Portal 3, makes Symmetra place a teleporter up to a 30 meter distance with 200 HP, a 10 second duration, a cast time of 1 second, paired with a 12 second cooldown. Firstly, because of just how versatile your teleporter is and how many uses there are, don't try and force yourself to follow a strict set of rules on your TP usage, just apply these following uses while you see fit in your game. Firstly, there's TPing to get our spawn quicker. Whilst there is a 10 second duration, so you can't permanently keep a spawn TP, you can and should still use TP while you see fit to skip certain pieces of map geometry, especially at the start of a game. For example, on the pool shrine, just teleport from spawn to the high ground, meaning that you and your team don't have to go all the way around. Secondly, you can TP to dive for the enemy backline, and you can optionally do so with a TP bomb. A TP bomb is just tossing turrets through your TP, typically into aggressive positions. And sometimes you can teleport through, and sometimes you don't have to. A basic TP bomb is tossing one turret on the ground, TPing, then tossing another two turrets through, but again, this is completely optional. So for example, on Legion Control Sensor, if you see a squishy flex support like an Arno or a Baptiste, you can TP straight onto them and at least force a few cooldowns like Nade, Sleep, Legion Burst, or maybe even Lamp, and you're safe whilst doing all this because if you're feeling the heat, you just TP back. I will say that against mobile, slippery backlines like Lucio, Kiriko and Moira, you shouldn't often be doing this, similar to how on Reaper, you wouldn't normally teleport into those kind of backlines. You can also contest enemy DPS, again, optionally with a TP bomb. Referring back to that Lee Jang example, if there's a DPS playing in white, you can pressure and contest that DPS with a TP, then teleporting back if you're feeling the heat. Another use is to force cooldowns. This is already linked into the two previous use cases on Lee Jang, but perhaps you don't even take the TP, because the enemy team just pre-fire a bunch of cooldowns to strong the TP immediately. This obviously forces cooldowns, and can also split attention, so make sure you're timing this with when your team are engaging. You can also use TP to reach high grounds that you couldn't reach beforehand, and your teammates can also use your TP for the same reason. The high grounds on Kings or Third Points are a good example. Speaking of teammates, you can also use your teleport to combo with abilities and ultimates. There's a flurry of them that you can combo with, like Riptire, Death Blossom, Diva Bomb, Shatter, and High Noon, but here's a classic example of comboing it with Terra Surge. Oh! What the fuck? There's also using TP to rotate yourself or your team past dangerous areas of the map, particularly at chokes. For example, on Nepal Village, if the enemy team are holding close, you can double back and TP main or TP straight past them. And lastly, you can use TP as a kiting tool. If you need to run away from Grav or to disengage from a Valkyrie, Coalescence, Rally, or Beats, a defensive TP can greatly help with that, and in a similar vein, TP can also allow you to play more aggressive off angles as it gives you a free escape. And speaking of escape, you can chase down enemies who are trying to escape you. Symmetra's second ability, the AirPods Pro, makes Symmetra launch up to three small turrets, each dealing 40 DPS and a 15% movement reduction. The AirPods are packing 30 HP and they're on a 10 second cooldown per turret. To put it simply, turrets allow you to do what you're already doing to a greater degree. For example, if you're playing to dive the enemy backline, as I've talked about with your TP in the last section, you can then use your turrets in a TP bomb to dive the enemy backline harder. If you're playing to peel your supports, you can put turrets around you to peel them more, and if you're playing to mark flanks, you can put turrets on the flanks to mark them, giving you early information as to where they might be coming from. One is enough, two is fine. 
to help your Reinhardt with the battle, if the battle happens here, etc. Totally fine. Give me something that provides a little more protection on this flank. Give me something that's an early warning system if they take the good push, which is through high ground here. Or give me something that, you know, warns me if they're coming this way, like, etc. Like, your turrets, yes, you want to use them for their damage, for their slow, primarily for their slow. But you also can use them as early warning systems on flanks. I'm not saying, oh, spend all of your turrets covering the flanks, etc. That's not what I'm saying. But put a turret on whichever flank you think is more critical, more important, etc. You can also use them to melt down the enemy tank to distract them from your beam, allowing you to melt them further. Just make sure to put your turrets high up as well as on off angles in order to do this. And like, and like even here, like surely this isn't the best place for turret. Where would you turret? Behind like, like the Messi on the blue thing? Yeah, exactly. I was exactly what I was thinking, right here. There's Genji, you control the space here, right? Just throw a little bit. Now they might break it, yeah? It's helpful, denies the high ground. This, this is too easy to break for them. You want turrets to either complement your beam in a location where it's hard for them to break, or you want turrets to control space that you cannot reach with your beam. In other words, I can't reach this far with my beam, so I'm gonna throw a turret here to make sure that they don't go there, right? Then if they walk to, away from the beam of the turret, they walk into my beam, right? Same reason why you could throw a turret over here, right? Up above the wall. Would Ryan break it? Probably, but it would provide an area of pressure that you cannot reach with your beam. So on Li Jiang, just covering those three uses, you can put your turrets in the entrance of the point, which is the usage that Spalo just talked about, or you can put a turret close side to mark any flankers, or you can put a turret or two by your supports if they need some peel. Turrets can also be used to distract the enemy, and by setting up a trap, drawing more attention away from the front line. For example, on Kings of First Point Defense, you can place three of your turrets in the corner of the choke, making it really annoying for a flex support to deal with. If you happen to be dueling in a 1v1, you can also use turrets on the ground while fighting them to give you a slight edge, forcing their attention away from you. And lastly, one overlooked detail of turrets is that they can actually block things thanks to their hitbox. Use them in dire situations to block incoming one-shots like a Widow or a Hanzo shot, a High Noon shot, or even Sigma's Rock. Symmetra's ultimate, Trump's Wall V2, <coughs> makes Symmetra deploy a 4000 HP barrier that can last 12 seconds. There's two fundamental uses of Sim's Wall, an aggressive and defensive use. For aggressive uses, place the wall straight or vertically, and for defensive uses, place the wall flat or horizontally. If your team are running Lucio speed, or you're engaging head first into the enemy team, doing an aggressive wall will likely be the play. However, if you need to react to something like a high noon or a bap window, then walling defensively to cut that off might be preferred. If you're unsure of what to do, just walk straight towards the enemy team, and you'll guaranteed get some value. Try and also wall on corners to cut the map into as many playable sections as possible, as MC explains here. I'm not going to draw diagrams over that one. All I'll say here is that Meta's decision to drop the wall right on the angle here is just god tier. Here's a wall that's flat, and then here's a wall that's flat. It forms a T. The T gives his team like three or four spaces to play in without them dying. They can literally walk in and apply pressure right here and go in. When the enemy team jumps over the wall, they can come out. There's just like four or five spaces your team can play in with this wall here. Try and also consider where the enemies will run to and retreat to if you end up walling. Try and wall in a way where you can actually chase them. You know as soon as you use wall, especially now that they're down one, they're going to disengage, right? So where are they going to disengage to? To the left. I should have placed more to the left. Right. So if you just simply angled it here, you guys can not only chase to here, you could chase literally to the spawn. Yo, Meta1 here. I've been told you're in need of some advanced Symmetra tips, okay? I know how to TP bomb. I know I know how to use my turret to block high noon, but, but how do I actually play the damn game? How do I play Symmetra? What's like the gameplay loop? Okay, look, I'm here to help you. Okay, I, I I can't I can't keep this up, you know. I was trying to fit in with the with the cage of video pacing and everything. What you're missing is uh is is playstyles. If you want to get good at Symmetra and and you want to one trick her, you need to learn how to play her in every situation. And in order to do that, you need to learn how to play her in brawl playstyle and in spam playstyle. Let me explain. Brawl playstyle is basically you're playing for your beam, okay? So you want to charge up your beam of their tank. Normally you play with your team as well. And you just play behind your shield. You charge up your beam of their tank. You spread out your turrets. Uh, you know, where you put your turrets and your TP aren't so important in brawl playstyle. It's more about your mechanics and uh, knowing how to min-max your aggression. Spam playstyle, on the other hand, is, uh, is uh, completely different. Uh, <laughs> normally you play away from your team and... You can do a bunch of different things, but the general goal is either to get picks or just to like distract the enemy, put them out of their comfort zone, put them in a situation uh, which they have 
no idea how to deal with. So y you won't see people doing this in Overwatch League, but this is very effective in ranked uh, for a start. And second of all, you need to know how to play this way if you want to play Symmetra in situations where she's not good. Okay, if they go Monkey and Farah, and your team's playing Bull, Sombra, let's say, like, y you're not going to be able to frontline and charge off their Monkey, you're just going to die. Okay, in that situation, you have to play Spam Style Symmetra, so it it's very important you learn this. When you play Spam Style Symmetra, there's a bunch of different things you can do, as I said. Um, you can set up turret traps and beat people with them. you can play in little rooms uh, with your turrets to protect you and uh, force them to come chase you. Uh, you can straight up flank, you can spawn camp people, you know, there's a bunch of things you can do, but, but they all have some things in common. Okay, the main rule of your turrets is uh, you want to keep your turrets stacked. Okay, you want to have all your three turrets together, shooting the same target at the same time, uh, because you, you want to get picks with them. Turrets mean you can do what you're already doing better, okay? And if you're not stacking your turrets together, it's not going to help you with your goals of uh, getting picks or distracting the enemy much, really. It's, it's very minor if you're just like spreading them out around the place because uh, people are just going to go past your turrets and go kill you. So uh, put them together and it makes all your flanks, all your off angles, everything way more dangerous. Pushing you, if you play against a good spam style symmetra, it, it's terrifying. Every corner, every time you can push them, you could get melted by three turrets, okay? Three turrets plus an orb and you are insta dead. The other thing is that it, it it's entirely map dependent, okay? Some maps are really good for flanking. If, if I'm playing Dorado point A, I'm always going to flank you. It, it's just really, really good. Um, other maps, they're good for playing in little annoying side rooms where uh, the enemies have to push you out because you, you're just on a god angle, okay? But when they push you out, they're playing into your strength, okay? The whole point is they're playing a comp where you can't get in range of, you can't beam them. But if you play in a really aggressive angle in like a side room, which is going to be, which the healers have to walk past, they, they have to push you out, otherwise you're going to kill the healers, right? And when they push you out, they're pushing into you, into your turrets, into close range, and all of a sudden, Symmetra is a good character, okay? You've had Symmetra in an awful situation and you've made her a good character, which is exactly what you need to do. Other maps they have great spots for little turret traps. King's Row Point A comes to mind. I literally always get kills with this turret trap. It's elite, okay? Use this one. And uh, that does bring me to another point. If, if you want to play a good spam style Symmetra, you need to know a lot of Symmetra theory. Basically, you need to know what spots are good, what you should use on each point. And uh, I would just recommend watching a lot of good Symmetra players and you'll, you'll pick up the, the setups they're using and, and just test them out for yourself, see which ones you like. So there's two approaches to this, right? Approach number one, you can, you can just learn Brawl style Symmetra and then learn Spam style Symmetra and be like, well, which style is better in this situation? I'll use that, okay? And then, and then just keep switching between them. And honestly, that's pretty good. I used that for a long time. I got top seven EU literally using that mentality. So, I mean, it, it works, it works. Or, or the other thing you can use, which is what I've been leaning more into now, is uh, you can think of it like a scale and you want to move between Spam and Brawl Star and be like in the optimal position on that scale at all times. So uh, maybe, maybe you incorporate some more TP bombs, play a bit more hybridy, you know, you'll be a lean slightly more towards spam. All of a sudden they pick Farah, you're leaning hard towards spam. Oh no, they've gone Ryan, you go straight towards bro. You know what I mean? Like you, you, you keep it like a scale, you switch around on that scale instead of having two distinct play styles. And really I think in theory that's the ideal way to play. But I would say learning two separate play styles is a very good shortcut. Okay, it's a very good, it helped me a lot. And uh, I don't know, it's up to you. That's up to you. Okay, hopefully this helped you a little bit. I feel like it's been pretty vague, but uh, Symmetra's a kind of complicated character, unlike a lot of characters where, you know, you, you might change how they play a bit depending on different things. Symmetra, you, you change completely. There's so many, so many things like different maps, different comps, you change completely how you play. You do completely different things. And, uh, you know, that's that's why I love Symmetra. Symmetra is a fun and interesting character. But it, it is quite hard to make a guide for Symmetra. I would say it's quite hard to make a guide. Um, but if you do want me to go into more detail on this, especially what playstyles to use and how to adjust your playstyle to be optimal to your rank to get maximum value, uh, alongside giving concrete examples, uh, make sure you check out my educational Unranked to GM. Link will be in the description and pin comment. Yeah. Thank you very much, Kaja, for having me on. Shout out Kaja. If you're not already subbed to him, make sure you subscribe because he makes the best guys on YouTube. And uh, back to you.
So that's pretty much it for the guide, and again, thanks to Meta for his input, his links are down below and in the top right. As for positional stuff, the main thing, aside from good corner discipline, is to look for rotations and opportunities to get value out of your TP. Whether that be a well-timed TP bomb in the backline, teleporting to control or spam from a flank, or teleporting to aid your teammates, if you're not getting any good value from your TP, you might as well be playing a different hero. And that's it for the guides. This is the best way to play Torb in Overwatch 2. Torb is picked for its added sustain and chunkiness in comparison to its hitscan counterpart Cassidy. If you can nail down the easier parts of his kit, then the biggest skill curve comes with landing his Cheeto shots consistently in order to keep up with the damage that heroes like Cassidy or Soldier will be constantly outputting. Put your turret on flanks or on off angles, overload when dove, alt to zone space, and land those shots. Torb's weapon, the Flaming Hot Cheetos, Makes Torbjorn fire rivets every 0.55 seconds, dealing 70 damage per shot and travelling at 70 meters per second. Torb can also eject the molten metal in a short range, dealing up to 125 damage per blast, taking up 2 ammo per shot. Now, it doesn't take a rocket scientist to understand that shotguns are good at close range and not so good at other ranges. So the only time you'll be using your alternate fire will be in close quarters of combat to consistently land a good chunk of damage, especially against tanks where you can guarantee every pellet will land. You could be ballsy and try to one-shot heroes up close with your standard Cheeto shot, but to me, that's the equivalent of trying to one-shot someone as Widow in close range. Sure, it looks and feels good when you do it, but it's not practical, it's less consistent, and it's just taking unnecessary risk. Unless you're up against small hitboxes like Genji or Tracer, meaning the spread of your shotgun is less forgiving, or you're up against slow-moving targets in close range, like a Widow scoped in, there's no real reason to not use a shotgun in these kind of scenarios. As for other occasions, due to the inconsistency of your primary fire, you'll also be spending your time spamming down main. This certainly doesn't mean that you can't or shouldn't contest angles, because you still definitely should, but just note that you may struggle a little bit more, because your Cheetos are harder to land than playing point and click simulator on hitscan. With that out of the way, the range and sightlines you want to be playing on Torb can vary wildly depending upon the enemy composition, just like with most mid-range heroes, as Bardo explains here. His range variety, in other words, there is no one range to play with Torb, it's completely dependent on the map, completely dependent on the enemy composition and really your composition as well. For example, if I'm playing Torb into snipers, I'm playing hyper short angles and basically play into 1v1 them at close ranges if I can. If I'm playing Torb against like full dive, you're playing a spam hero. You're playing essentially a spam hero at long, long, long range. So it, he's a very flexible hero when it comes to range, a little bit like McCree. So for example, if you're playing against a long range sniper composition on a map like Hollywoods, I'd recommend taking the high ground in order to get a closer sight line on that Widowmaker. With smart cover usage, one Cheeto headshot, and that Widow is forced to start peeking. However, up against a more flanker based composition, who have more lethality at shorter ranges, you're gonna need to be playing longer sightlines with cover. In a case like Hollywood Attack, utilizing your turret and overload defensively, or pushing higher ground as a team unit, are likely the cause to make it. Aside from that, practicing your accuracy with Torp's primary fire is going to drastically increase the amount of value you get from him. I'm once again recommending IO Stock's Zane Trainer, JPYHG, of which I have a nice cameo in. Torp's first ability, Beta Aimbot, makes Torp deploy a self-building turret with 225 HP, dealing 56 DPS in a 40 meter attack range with a 3 second cast time paired alongside a 10 second cooldown. He also has his infamous hammer that deals 55 damage per hit and heals his turret for 50 HP. There's two main uses to Torp's turret. The first is to use it as a burglar alarm and a warning system similar to Symmetra's turrets, as Barlo explains here. The turret is literally like a burglar alarm that alerts you that something on an angle is wrong. And not only is it a burglar alarm, it's a burglar alarm that takes a little, little hammer and whacks them in the shins. You, you see what this Hanzo has to do? There's Stormbow and he's half HP. You know, that's what turret's for. And you know he's there now. You have to decide what angle is most relevant. Building off that bit at the end about choosing which flank to mark, just turret the flank that you think is going to be more commonly used, and try to place the turret with cover so it doesn't get easily destroyed. The second type of turret is to use it as an extra angle of damage, so going back to Blizzard World, this could be on the high ground, right behind where the enemy team are pushing. The reason why off-angle turrets are so useful is that the enemy team need to turn away from the front line in order to destroy it, meaning that damage from you and your team is more likely to land onto them. Not to mention, when your turret's at an angle, it's more likely to shoot HP rather than shields, meaning you actually gain ult charge from it. However, in terms of understanding why you should place your turret on these unorthodox off angles, and why angles are just good in general, here's top 500 Torb main Come Goblin explaining and applying the thought process behind turret angles. So if you notice the way these turrets are positioned, 
they are positioned in on really off angles that you wouldn't expect people to hold or take you know just generally odd positions the reason for this is because when the enemy team pushes in you don't want the first thing they focus to be your turret you want them to focus on your team and while your team is being focused your turret is helping with suppressing fire if your turret stays alive for most of the fight and is shooting for most of the fight, that's how you get the most value out of your turret. Rather than it being destroyed initially and you have to wait a 10 second cooldown because in 10 seconds your entire team can be wiped. Another reason for these turrets positions is the simple fact that it draws the enemy team's focus fire. If you're able to pull someone's attention from the team fight for 4 or 5 seconds and make that team fight a 6v5 or a 5v4, for just four or five seconds. That can be the difference between winning and losing a team fight. Adding some nuance to this, you wanna try and make sure that your turret isn't the first thing the enemy see as they can more easily brick the turret as a result. For instance, on Nambani's second point defense, by placing your turret on top of the green boss, you technically have an additional angle, but as soon as the enemy team turn the corner, your turret is gonna be the first thing the enemy team sees and it's gonna get destroyed pretty easily. Instead, if your team are holding by the green boss initially, tossing your turret by the co-side mega is much better. The turret has cover and can only be seen when the enemy team pushes forwards. It's also a 2-in-1 in, in that it also acts as a burglar alarm for any flankers coming through the left side whilst also providing off-angle pressure. Now, in terms of choosing which one of the two turret playstyles to use, if the enemy team are running flankers like Traitor, Sombra or Wrecking Ball, you should favour the burglar alarm type turrets. However, if the enemy team are running a more poker based composition or one that doesn't really hard flank much, like Widow, Farah or Hanzo, you should favour the off-angle type of turrets. But regardless of which turret you go for, your turret should almost never be frontlining. You should also be adjusting the position of your turret in accordance to what the enemy team are playing and where they're pathing. For example, if your turret isn't getting use at all, then reposition it in a different area. Before I end off this section, there's an unusual third use of turret, which is to throw it and use it aggressively when taking a duel, using the turret as makeshift cover. For instance, if you're dueling a Cassidy on Route 66 third point, throwing a turret before you peek will provide you with two advantages. The first is that it acts as a distraction and splits attention away from you onto the turret. And the second advantage is that it can provide you some temporary cover. Not to get too much into the micro as well, but this can also block Cassidy's magnade if he chooses to throw it early. Torb's second ability, Angie Dwarf, makes Torb gain 100 additional overhealth and 30-40% to buffs all around to his movement speed, fire rates and reload times, all of which has a 5 second duration paired with a 10 second cooldown. Just like your turret, there's two main uses to your overloads, one of which is to use it defensively when getting dove, and the second is to use it aggressively when punishing rotations. So overload is, is either two uses, it's either used as a defensive cooldown that you can utilize when you're being pressured, dove, or dueling, or it could be used as extra pressure. So if the enemy team is making an aggressive rotate or pushing into your team and you know that you're not going to need it as a defensive cooldown anytime in the next five, 10 seconds, press the E so you... Right, so you can smack them in the mouth because you do a lot more damage when you're overloaded. A visual example of both of these uses could be a Numbani first point defense, where if the enemy team decides to rotate through high grounds and push out onto you, especially if they're on a comp that lacks mobility, you can activate overload to punish people walking out in the open. However, if they're running a standard dive comp, a defensive use of overload would be to peel off a dive. This allows you to punish the enemy Winston, or whatever the dive tank may be, while simultaneously giving you more survivability. Another use of overload, linking onto the last use of Torb's turret, is to use it to gain an advantage in duels. Referring back to that root example, you could pop overload against this Cassidy, who now needs 6 shots to kill you, whilst you have a slightly increased fire rate and movement speed over Cassidy. Do note that you do need to be able to aim your primary fire, which can still be difficult. Torb's ultimate, funny demonetized innuendo, makes Torb create pools of molten slag that deal 160 DPS to normal enemies, or 250 against enemies with armor. You have 5.5 seconds to deploy your Molten Core, and the ultimate has a 10 second duration. In terms of usage, one overlooked use is to zone and take space. This can commonly take the form in shooting your Molten Core behind the enemy team, so when your team pushes in, the enemy team are forced to back up into your Molten Core. For example, on Rialto first point attack, you could push past this corner by shooting your Molten Core behind the enemy frontline, so they have to back up quickly, allowing your team to push past the corner. Alternatively, and what I think is an incredibly potent use of Torb's ultimate, is to not only zone the space that happens on the frontline, but to also zone the very important areas of the map around the frontline. This will most commonly take the form of high ground or flanks. For instance, on King's third point attack, 
you could zone all sets of high grounds. By zoning these spaces, heroes like Genji or Echo, or anyone with vertical mobility, can more easily take the high grounds. There's also using walls and core defensively, to zone the space around you, so heroes like Winston, Genji and Tracer, can't get on top of you as easily. Combine this with your overload and your turrets, and you can see why Torb has a great set of anti-dive tools at his disposal. Lastly, you ideally want to tie Molten Core in mid-fights, as Barlow explains here. Ultimate usage is 100% mid-fight, 100% mid-fight. It doesn't have to be like, okay, we've already lost somebody, but like, the fight commits, 3, 2, 1, horrible. Because it is very easy to kite out, very easy to play around, and it takes a little bit of setup, so you don't want to wait too long. Moving on to the positional, playstyle, and compositional section of the guides. As talked about prior, Torp's overall playstyle hinges on what the enemy team will be running. If they're running short to medium range heroes, or heroes that you outrange, they're going to be playing like a sniper almost, still taking angles, but the ones you do take will have longer sightlines. A perfect example of this could be against a dive comp, where you outrange heroes like Sombra, Echo, Genji, Tracer, Doomfist and Winston, meaning you play your range as much as you can before they dive, and once they do dive, you pop your overload and should hopefully have a defensive turret set up. Make sure to be taking soft off angles instead of hard flanking against dive, a concept I talk about a lot in my Ash and Cassidy guides. If however, you're playing against comps that do outrange you, mostly being the sniper stuff, then you're forced to play short sightlines, being creative with your turrets, and likely using most of your cooldowns aggressively to shorten the gap. And if you're playing somewhere in between, like in a Pokeball hybrid comp, with heroes like Mei, Casti, Ramatra, Rhinot, Soldier, and Sojourn, then those aggressive windows still apply. For example, on Kings with First Points, if you're playing Torb in a Brawl Mirror, flanking through Hotel, fishing for a pick, and using your overload accordingly would likely be the best play. You could even toss your turret inside of the Hotel, marking anyone who dares come through it. And that's it for the guides. <laughs> this is the best way to play Tracer in Overwatch 2. Tracer is best at controlling flanks thanks to her incredible mobility and high damage as a flanker. Depending on composition, you may want to duel the enemy backline or discourage enemy squishies from taking angles, almost like a shepherd herding sheep back to its herds. Have good trigger discipline, use terrain during your blinks, try and pulse bomb squishies, and time your engage as well. Tracer's weapon, the one clip machine, Mixed Tracer Shooter Pulse Pistols, dealing 5.5 damage per shot at 1200 RPM with 40 ammo. The biggest, most important tip with your weapon is good trigger discipline. Most Tracers in the majority of ranks will suffer from mashing down M1 without taking the time to readjust their own aim, when in fact, this is one of the biggest fundamentals on the hero that can make or break your ability to duel in 1v1s. You make the recognition that, geez, my tracking isn't that good right now, so I'm gonna stop shooting. Stop shooting right now, stop and now start shooting. You're too close, yes, but you're also just mashing down primary fire. Right there, do you see those slight pauses? That right there is probably the best one in terms of demonstrating. Moreover, when you're unspotted, attempting to one-clip a squishy from an off angle, don't start shooting the instant you see them. Take time to walk to a nearby piece of cover and all start to slowly close the distance. The last bit of Tracer Micro I wanna to touch on is cover usage and reloads. This does link in with your blink management, but using covers and corners allow you to get a reload off, as well as avoiding any shots from the enemy, alongside buying some time to get your blinks back. Only when you have a full clip or close to it, should you then be aggressive with your blink, looking to dodge and juke the enemy's damage. Speaking of your blink, Tracer's first ability, blink, makes Tracer move 7.5 meters immediately, with three charges, each having a three second cooldown. Blink is primarily used to dodge and juke shots from the enemy, which is most useful in 1v1s. Knowing this, there's a few implications. Firstly, you should be dodging and juking when you actually have the ammo to shoot the enemy. If you don't have any ammo, then play corners and cover to buy time to reload. Utilizing cover is actually really, really important on Tracer during your engage, because if you blink out on the open, you're gonna run out of blinks really quickly. His ex-contenders Coach Sword, giving a good example of terrain usage to conserve blinks, also coming up with the 1.5 blink rule, meaning you should always have 1.5 blinks available at all times. Look how he's looking to play around the space. He plays around the corner. Now he's blinking towards cart. Now he's blinking to the corner again. Remember how I talked about one and a half, one and a half, one and a half? He's at one and a half. A lot of tracers I know instantly would have double blinked out. They would have blinked from that corner all the way to the choke and been like, all right, like I need to get out of here. Like I'm going to die if, I, if I'm if i still here. He plays it very calmly. He sees that they're starting to push past. He has another blank back up. He goes to this corner. Now again, he has a blank and a half already. I just went through an entire fight and that fight was not a short fight. That was like a 30 second fight. That's a long fight. And this guy 
for 30 seconds, 35 seconds, was able to hold on to his blinks incredibly, incredibly well. And again, insult to injury. Why is that? Why is he able to have so many blinks? Why does it feel like he's always in the fights? It's the terrain. And this Tracer player ends up waiting a ton of blinks when they didn't need to. For instance, when dueling this McCree, they didn't have to use two blinks just to reach him and could have played by the stairs, table, or by the left side door using the Wrecking Ball's cover. Also note the mediocre trigger discipline, which ends up in the use of three clips just to kill the McCree whilst having the assistance of his ball player. Here's another example where our Tracer player, instead of playing by the left side cover, he swings wide and ends up taking damage, forcing out blinks and decreasing his pressure, all because he couldn't play terrain. Linking onto that, you should avoid blinking when the enemy is reloading. Loading. Most reloads are 1.5 seconds in the game, which, while it doesn't sound like a lot, when you're trying to conserve your blinks, every bit matters. On a broader level, most of the time, you don't want to use blinks to reach your target, but rather, to use it when engaging a target. This is really important in solo queue, since if you're in a team environment, and you want to get into position quicker, you can communicate to say that you need more downtime in order to get your blinks back before you engage. See how expensive this engage was? You had to use a blink just to get to her, not even to actually engage. If you have to use your blinks to get to a target, 90% of the time that's going to be a mistake. Not every time, but 90%. And so now you have one blink where you should have been to begin with. You also want to ideally finish off a target with a blink remaining to have an almost guaranteed route of retreat. For example, on Rialto first point attack, say you're drawing the enemy backline and things are good. You're utilising terrain well to conserve your blinks and get reloads off, your trigger discipline is on point, and you send their zen to spawn. What do you do now? Well, hopefully, you should still have at least a blink available, meaning you should blink out to the nearest piece of cover. If you're in a really tight situation, then recalling here is also another option. Regardless, if you're blinking behind the enemy team, grab a health pack and re-engage from behind once again. Or, you could blink in the position closer to your team, where you can receive some support. Trace a second ability, I am about to head out. Makes Tracer rewind the last few seconds of what happened, taking 1.25 seconds to complete, granting Tracer all of her ammo back, paired with a 12 second cooldown. In terms of tech, the main one is to melee just before you recall, cancelling the animation. Aside from that, in terms of border usage, recall is your last resort. It's your get out of jail free card, using it to primarily escape jewels that aren't in your favour, allowing you to gather back HP, giving you some breathing room. The duration of recall also gives you a bit more time to charge up a blink, allowing you to make your escape easier. It's not uncommon to see Tracer's recall and blink out. And perhaps something you could do that I haven't seen talked about, is that during the recall animation, you could use that time to think about where to blink out to, instead of blinking out in the open. Because of the lengthy cooldown, and the fact that you want to maximise your uptime on Tracer, only recall when you need to. And, as I've talked about prior, doing the basic fundamentals of trigger discipline, reload management, blinking the duke, and utilising terrain or cover should all help you put less reliance on your recall. One last thing I want to touch with your recall is linked onto unnecessarily using it. For example, the amount of traces that triple blink and recall after they pulse bomb amazes me. Sure, it does look flashy, but it's kind of impractical from an uptime perspective. Blink out from danger if you can, instead of always resorting to recall. Tracer's ultimate, tick tick boom, makes Tracer throw a pulse bomb, dealing up to 355 damage, taking up to 1 second to detonate. The main piece of tech is to use pulse bomb a frame before you blink. This can allow for unexpected pulse bombs and quick 180s. I recommend the workshop code BGBXD, where you have a set timer to land a pulse bomb, meaning every frame counts. Now comes in target priority. Do you pulse bomb tanks or squishies? Now, despite tanks being easier targets to hit, thanks to their bigger hitboxes, I still think pulsing squishies, since it's a guaranteed kill, is the right move to make. I believe at the pro level, pulse bomb attach rates are above 60%, and considering that sticking a pulse bomb on a squishy is a pretty much guaranteed fight win, there's no real reason to stick tanks unless you can confirm the kill. In essence, pulse bomb should be something to aid your engagement, and not something to fully rely on in terms of winning teamfights, especially when trying to stick squishies. If you're looking to get multiple kills with Pulse Bomb without a combo, pulsing rotations from the enemy backline, or in other words, when they're in open space, can catch them off guard. Now onto the most important section of the guides. Positioning, playstyle, and compositions. Before I get onto that a bit though, I quickly want to cover timing. In short, the more aggressive and lethal your engagers are on Tracer, the later you want to be timing them into the fights. This is because as the fight goes on, your frontline's going to be drawing more and more attention away, allowing you to be more aggressive in the backline. This is really important if you have Pulse Bomb, but if you just want to split some attention and create some space for your team, then going a bit earlier isn't a bad idea. So that's like a good idea for you. Like if you're playing into a comp like a Bap Zen or something like that, where you're like, bro, I can absolutely murder these guys, or I've got Pulse Bomb or something like that, you need to probably be pushing your timing, remember that was a big point for you, a little bit later. But if there's a comp where you're like, the 
you know, I don't have pulse, there's not a lot of hole I can kill, I could just be a distraction, then you can kind of go a little bit early to bait attention for your team. Why is this Lucio looking at you? There's just nothing to look at right now, right? Like, you, now you go, but you're already out now. You're already in mid pulse animation. Now, it ends up being good enough, but we're not, we don't want good enough, do we? We want better. With the pulse there, especially in a comp where sticky is like really easy, you, you needed to go second there. Now onto the playstyle stuff. Tracer is one of the most versatile heroes in the game and can fit into pretty much any team composition. This is why I'm going to use a similar example to the one I used on my Sombra guide to help explain Tracer's different playstyles and the benefits and drawbacks of running Tracer over Sombra. So don't place too much attention on the map right now, just focus more so on the team composition of Ryan, Lucio, Moira, Ash and Tracer and the different play styles and options that you have. The first thing you can do in Tracer, and as a classic, traditional playstyle, is to flank behind and go for backline. Now I actually advised against doing this in my Sombra guide, because Sombra lacks the damage and mobility that a Tracer has. As Tracer, you could pretty easily duel a Moira or an Ash, but to avoid that Lucio, make sure you time your engage later into the fight, as Spilo talked about in that Icon Ward clip. Another option you have is mirroring or clearing flankers. Mirroring just means matching or facing a hero, so here, if their Tracer decides to flank onto your backline, you could clear her out, using all those tips I talked about earlier in the video. So why would you want to do this? Well, if your backline is very squishy, like Ana Zen, you can upkeep them alive. Your Zen can also give you orbs, which make you have the advantage in the duel, and generally speaking, Ana Zen is going to get more value than a Lucio Moira due to their damage and utility. Your third option, linked onto that, is to control flanks. Now by dueling and mirroring the Tracer, you kind of are doing that, but this is more broadly referring to their Ash. If their Ash decides to hard flank or take an angle, and this is what Tracer is really good at, almost acting like a shepherd, shepherding the Ash back to the herd of her teammates. When you try and set up your flanks, the Tracer doesn't flank, she's on top of you, and she punishes you for taking a flank. She can be anywhere that she wants at any time. They're all clumped up like scared rabbits on top of each other. Why? Tracer. How much spam damage do you think Izayaki's putting? Is Gesture under a lot of pressure from Discord right now? No. Is Lee Jae Gong and the Echo and the Zen, the Tracer, are they smashing the crap out of Gesture's shield and, and killing tanks and winning the spam war right now? No. And that's pretty much it for Tracer. Unfortunately, you don't really have the range of Sombra to farm their tank consistently, although if you have cover, a good angle, and their low HP, you could still do that I suppose. In short, Tracer's amazing ability to duel pretty much anyone in the game and her ability to be pretty much anywhere on the map allows her to easily control anyone who dares to flank as well as giving her the flexibility to dive the enemy backline. And depending on how much of a glass cannon your backline is, you may want to mirror or clear flanks before heading straight onto the enemy backline. And that's it for the guys. This is the best way to play Widowmaker in Overwatch 2. You obviously should be playing long ranges, that's a given, and your mechanics are important, that's an even more obvious given. But the difficulty in Widowmaker comes with timing, and especially in sniper duels, the angles you take. Don't peak angles too early, especially if they're aggressive, and try and stack as many advantages in your favour when taking a duel. Actually use your SMG up close, vendor mine flanks, and don't waste your infosites. Widow's Rifle, Chips' as Demon, Mix with a maker fire scoped range shots, dealing 120 damage per shot. She recently had some fall off changes, where her fall off begins at 40 meters and ends at 60. The scaling is 50%, basically meaning at 60 meters and beyond, she will do 150 damage on headshots instead of 300s. Despite these range changes, I don't think that this drastically changes how Widowmaker is played. At most, it just means that on maps like Ilios Ruins and Junkertown, you'll need to rotate to closer angles to just not experience the fall off. But everything else in this video still applies, so I'll play it from now on. Widow can also switch to an SMG, dealing up to 130 DPS, dealing 13 damage per bullet. For reference, that's 10 more DPS than Zenyatta shooting his orbs normally. I'll begin with your SMG because it's actually quite a simple yet overlooked aspect of your kit. Simply put, your SMG is going to be the thing that you'll be using up close. I know people like to try and get all MLG and getting that headshot up close, but it's simply too risky. Unless you know that you're going to die, so you might as well try and get a trade, SMGing does more DPS and preserves your mobility. So that's why in like close quarters, it's not that GM and Pro Widowmakers can't hit those shots, it's that the risk of them getting shot and bursted through heals, through supports, and whatnot is too big of a risk to take. So in close quarters, store your ego and just SMG them to death, and then teabag them. A fundamental concept to Widow's Rifle is to maintain longer sightlines. A visual example of this would be on Junkertown first point defense, when you keep out a range where flankers have a tough time reaching you, or where hitscan damage starts to enter in heavy falloff ranges. I will talk about this example again in the positional section of the guide with regards to vision and lines of sight. 
Building off this further, you almost always want to be constantly repositioning yourself and almost never peeking the same angle twice in sniper duels. The enemy sniper is gonna know where you are and you'll have lost your advantage. What I would actually do is instead of playing here, because she can easily shoot you from, you know, here or here or here or here, right? This is no good. What I want you to do is I want you to actually move this way and you could actually take an angle going this direction, some positioning over here. The problem with staying here is she doesn't, she can shoot you from a million different spots. Some key exceptions to mention that would allow you to re-peak the same angle could be a simple infosite or a friendly teammate occupies and distracts their sniper. Next, linked onto that spiral clip, I want to talk about corner usage. I explain all of this in my Ash Guide, and whilst I don't like reusing certain clips or concepts from my other guides, I think this is really important and useful for Widowmaker, especially when taking into account different positions you can be in, so I'll play the clip here. Eventually, you're probably gonna have to take a duel with the Widowmaker at some point, and some of it will come down to mechanics, but there are some advantages you can have to swing the duel in your favour. The biggest thing is to understand corner matchups. In short, the person who is closest to the corner has the advantage of choosing when to duel the enemy, but the person furthest away from the corner has the advantage in the actual duel. Take this example on Havana first point attack, and you as Ash are playing the corner. Look at how many different positions you have to face check into the enemy Widowmaker, and how many different positions the enemy Widow could be playing. But all the enemy Widow has to do is place a crosshair in the exact same corner and wait for you to peek. However, your advantage playing close to the corner is that you could completely ignore the Widowmaker and not attack the duel. You don't have to fight here. Instead, you could flank left or use your team and then flank to the right. The same concept also applies to FPS shooters like Rainbow Six Siege. It's why, as a defender, you don't hold angles right next to windows or doorways, but rather, you play from afar and play the myriad of different angles you could take on that window or doorway. It means that, as an attacker, you have to face all kinds of different angles that the defenders could be playing, whereas the defender just has to place his crosshair in one spot. This isn't to say that playing around corners aren't important, in fact, they very much are. But in one-shot sniper duels, playing right next to a corner and not repositioning, as I'll just get onto, can lead to easy crosshair placement for the enemy sniper. Now, going even further, I've already talked about a few advantages you can have on Widow, being to reposition yourself and to acknowledge the different advantages you have with regards to corners. His IO stocks detailing a bunch more advantages that you should keep in mind. You always want to have an advantage when you go for 1v1. For example, you get the jump on someone, right? You get the first shot without them noticing you. The advantage could be positional. So for example, if you have high ground, that's a positional advantage. You can you have your ultimate, that's an advantage. You can have someone pocketing you, that's an advantage, right? There's also peeker's advantage, because obviously you know when you peek, but the enemy doesn't know when you peek, which means that you're gonna have an advantage in terms of reaction time. So if we look at this 1v1, there's two outcomes. Either you use your ultimate here, and the enemy Widowmaker doesn't hide, in which case you can peek her and kill her because you have a very, very big advantage. You have peeker's advantage, you have high ground advantage, and you have wall hack advantage. Or she doesn't peek you, which means that for the entire duration of your ultimate, the enemy Widowmaker and the enemy Ash are going to be completely useless. Now onto the timing of your peaks and your pressure on Widowmaker. Generally speaking, the more aggressive or greedy your angle, the later you have to time it. Make sure to not time your pressure when you're scoping in too early, otherwise you might get picked off early, since the entire enemy team have time to focus on you. Lastly, in terms of improving your aim and mechanics, I've already recommended this a few times, but use Iostox's aim trainer, JPYHG, which progressively overloads how difficult the aiming is. Widow's first ability, Batman's grappling hook, Mix Widow launch grappling hook with a maximum range of 20 meters away, with a cooldown of 12 seconds. A small thing to mention at the start, especially if you're new to playing Widowmaker, make sure that your grapple sensitivity is low to prevent you from accidentally grappling things that are miles away off your crosshair. Now there's three main uses of Widow's grapple, the first of which is to use it defensively to escape danger. There's really not much to this, just grapple as far as you can when you're getting dove to create as much distance as possible from whoever's diving you. The second use of Widow's grapple is to obviously take high grounds and angles where possible. For instance, on Havana first point attack, as soon as your team turn the corner, you can grapple up to high ground and you have a nice angle over the enemy team. I might also refer to this in the positional section. The third and last use of grapple is for the grapple hook shots. I talked about certain advantages in taking sniper jewels in the last section, and this is actually quite a big one for Widow. Especially on maps like Soccer Royale that don't have many different angles you can take, grappling up 
and dynamically changing your position midair makes you harder to hit, whilst your crosshair remains relatively still. This is what this widow sees. Come on, peek me again, I dare you. Wait, what the heck? Like right there. And you see that time of where she has to react and move her crosshair up to here. That's the advantage that I get. Meanwhile, we're I'm, what I'm doing, as I'm grappling, I already have my crosshair lined up where she is, right? I mean, that wasn't even very good, but you can have it pre-aimed as you're grappling up, and so, and you know exactly where she is. Widow's second ability, completely useless, makes Widowmaker shoot a Venom Mine onto nearly any surface, dealing 15 DPS for a total of 75 damage, paired with a 15 second cooldown. As for the target who gets hit by the Venom Mine, you can see them through walls for the 5 second duration. The main use of Venom Mine is to use it defensively, almost like an alarm bell to alert yourself for potential flankers. That's basically it. For example, on Rialto first point defense, you could place your Venom Mine by the stairs, or you could place your Venom Mine close to you, so if a Genji dashes onto you for example, they automatically get hit by the mine. The biggest thing with Venom Mine is that even though it's extremely simple to use, so many Widowmaker players forget to use it, or they just toss it straight into the enemy team. Sure, if the enemy team aren't running any flankers, then Venom Mine is kinda useless, but the last thing you want is to lose a fight because a flanker was left on 1 HP, who could have been killed with your Venom Mine. You also might not want to use Venom Mine, as it can give away your unscouted position, as Bolo explains here. Why would you not pop your Venom Mine here? I've been always been a proponent of Venom Mine. Use it, use it, don't waste it, it's an ability, it gives you information, it's scouting, there's no reason not to. But there are very specific circumstances when you do not want to, and I think this is one of those very specific circumstances. They know you're close, right? It's the audio cue. When you Venomine close to the enemy team, this Genji is going to hear this Venomine, and all that does is gives him opportunity to react. Now what you should do is you should peek this here, take a shot or two, and then Venomine. The last, and admittedly niche use of Venomine, is to utilize its hitbox to cover your head in Widow Jewels. Back in Overwatch 1, there was an infamous use case on Hanamura first point defense, but for Overwatch 2 maps, I can't really tell you of any other specific examples. Maybe the comments can give some examples down below. Widow's no Ultimates, Wall Hacks, <laughs> makes Widowmaker gain Wall Hacks for 15 seconds. The predominant use of Inversight is to gain additional scouting information to allow yourself to force more aggressive duels. In short, by seeing the enemy team's position, you can take certain flanks that are often more aggressive, knowing that you're going to be safe. In order to pull this off successfully, timing your Inversight for when you're about to peek is key to gaining more effective use of Inversight, as I myself explained here from about two years ago. Now is when you want the, the, the Inversight. You've already used half of it when you're peeking. What value out of Inversight did you get from going here? To here and like right now this would be a great uh, use of infosite perhaps you know hands takes a really hard flank and then goes down main that extra infosite time is going to buy you a lot of information and scouting for where the enemy is going to be pushing and that's really the main thing with infosites pop it as the team fight begins and adjust your positioning to where you can be more confident taking angles don't be like kefri and pop your infosite just to get your wooden montage onto the positional playstyle and compositional section of the guides in terms of general positioning, there's four key principles which I'll showcase on Blizzard World First Point Defense. The first rule is to have some kind of cover in order to stop taking damage at any moment. The second rule, and this is really key, is to have a good wide LOS. In this example, your LOS is mediocre, but that's mainly down to map geometry. Here's Sparlow giving an example of why having a level of vision over the map is good for controlling and zoning space. But you see the problem with this position, right? What is your vision like? This is why I respect, with well, all due respect, Kefri angles don't work very often. Because you could find this crazy little sight line, but if nobody walks through it, then what does it matter? You want to cover as much space as you possibly can, especially if you're not playing versus a Widow Duel. So this position covers much more, right? Almost double the amount of space. This is actually why maps like Junkertown and Havana are so powerful for Widowmaker. You can literally see the majority of the map due to the lack of flanks, cover, and long sight lines. Blizzard World second point is also a good example of this. Anyways, when you're not on those maps, which are clear cut cases, do try and keep this in mind, and back to the four rules. The third rule is distance from angles. This is where you have plenty of distance from a flank in order to react in case a tracer or a flanker sneaks up on you. And the last rule is rotations. This is where that infosite information can come in handy, since you can take these more aggressive rotations knowing a flank may be clear. Now onto your playstyle against different comps. There's two key factors that dictate your positioning, which is the range and mobility of the enemy composition. Against comps with high range but low mobility, so your typical poke brawl hybrids or straight up poke comp, because there's low mobility, the key thing is knowing that you can go for more aggressive and greedy flanks because nobody's going to be marking you. 
On Rialto first point attack for example, you could legitimately flank all the way around the coast side and take the back high ground if you're not playing against any mobile heroes, or in other words, any flankers. Again, you've got cover, a nice wide LOS and distance as talked about prior. Now the less risky play is to just play on the other piece of high ground and that can still provide plenty of kill potential, but if you're struggling, then going for the more aggressive play can be an option. Now what about playing against comps with low to moderate range but high mobility? In other words, playing against some variation of dive or playing against flankers. Well the key thing is to stay within range and LOS of your supports, taking soft off angle pressure to anyone who peeks, including their tank. Once you get dove, grapple away and you should hopefully receive some form of peel. And that's it for the guides. If you enjoyed, don't forget to like, comment and subscribe, and if this video helps to raise your IQ, be sure to share it with your friends to also raise theirs. Until next time.